Hey everyone, I just wanted to make this video to, you know, talk about the channel plan and my schedule. So a lot of people asked why I don't upload anymore and I have a full-time job and I'm also doing a graduate degree on the side. So I don't have that much time to spend on YouTube, you know, without burning out like crazy. Um, but I do spend as much free time as I can on to creating a course for YouTube and I expect to complete that full course in summer of 2023. So now these chapters are subject to change. I do want to make some changes to them in, before releasing them for the final course. For example, the aesthetics, definitely the aesthetics and uh, some of the explanations. However, when I did some pilot testing with some friends or people that are close to me, they do suggest that I should still release it. I'd say it's valuable, even though I want to make it even better later so i am deciding to release it now and my purpose of this course is not just to have one gigantic complete project but i also want to teach you learn how to learn and how i learned my way as well so i'll provide additional resources that i've used and everything as well so i have read the feedback on the comments the new course will be split up into separate videos just this video is one giant one again because because it will be deleted once the new course comes out in 2023 so i only have to delete one video instead of like 20. there will be in each chapter you know roughly 40 to 80 minutes for each video i expect 20 hours of course content i think right now i have like eight hours so i want to start off in the early chapters only covering like the bare essentials for the people that want like a more fast track. And in the later chapters, I'll get into some more advanced topics for people that still want to watch. However, I do recommend at the end of each chapter, each video, you try and learn more on your own. So my preliminary course so far only has eight chapters and the eighth chapter is not completed yet. But let me show you what we get at the end of chapter eight. If you go to this URL, you can click to activate the pointer lock API to move your mouse around the scene. You can also use WASD to move around while your mouse is moving. You have to hit ESC to get your mouse back if you're not familiar with the pointer lock API. You can also hit shift, which makes you go a little bit faster and you can hit spacebar to jump. Now, of course, this jump is super high and unrealistic, but I do show you how to change that. I was just playing around with it for debugging purposes. You'll also notice that we are walking around this terrain, which is really bumpy. You can see when I go up, go down and go up and go down. And you can see when I come here, I stop and I have that collision detection. So we'll learn how to implement that as well. Now, the colliders aren't perfect so far, so you know, you can go through here, you know, you can see I'm really far here, but really close here. So they're not perfect, but I do show you how to make them perfect if you wanted to. And of course, if you go out of bounds, you spawn right back here. And in chapter eight, it's not complete yet. This is where we start the interactions. Now I just have currently red boxes here, just the hit boxes basically. So you can see when I point here, I get sign. And when I point here, I get door and so on and so forth. And yeah, that's pretty much it so far for the eight chapters. If you want more details about what we will actually be doing in the eight chapters, you can go to this link right here. I'll tell you what in each chapter, what we'll be doing in that chapter. So you can determine if you actually need it or not. So for example, chapter one is building a house. So we're going to learn a little bit about HDRI lighting and some texturing to make a house you see here on the right. At the end of each chapter, I do list the resources that I like to use and some more stuff that you can learn on your own. Other YouTubers that make great courses or great tutorials that you can watch as well. And if I scroll down here to chapter eight, I do say unfinished and chapter eight interactions skybox we convert an hdri into a skybox slash cube map so i do hope you learned something new from this preliminary course of course since i'm still in development you know feel free to leave your feedback i do read each and every comment however although this is preliminary you will be able to do everything that you see on this site currently 
So if you're watching this video now, I mean, you might not even need the course by the time it comes out next summer because you'll probably learn on your own and already get, you know, really advanced. So you probably won't even need my course by then. So it's just a huge, so it's just a huge risk for me personally because I think I could do frequent uploads and get more subscribers, you know, of course, and more money as well. But I really want to make something that I wanted when I first started to take me from that intermediate kind of, you know, stage to something where I could actually be creating something that was really awesome. And that's what I want this course to be. Again, if you're watching it now, you probably won't even need it. Yeah, so sorry for going on a little rant there. Oh, so here's another site I made in like an hour um, for a presentation on virtual reality for one of my grad classes. It's not designed that well, but it's just another example of something you can create with the knowledge after you um, after you watch the preliminary course. You know, it's got the same thing. I don't use anything new. We have the collision. You can see I can jump on boxes and so forth. And I have the shift to run and so on and so forth. So it's fairly basic. Which I just want to talk about some other things you can expect in the new lessons or things that I have planned. So the first one is going to be making it mobile responsive as well, which isn't that difficult at all. It's just not in this part. The second thing I want to talk about is optimization. I do cover some optimization in this video, but I want to talk about a lot more optimization techniques, which is really important. The third thing I want to tackle is shaders and to do things like clouds or, you know, move leaves on a tree. And the other thing I want to finish is interacting with objects. You know, when you look at an object, you can click on it or something like that and it'll trigger a reload, trigger an animation or something like that. So that's what I have planned for the future lessons. I might add more stuff on the way, but yeah, you know, and as always, you know, thanks so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. Hello, welcome to chapter one. In this chapter, we're going to be modeling a small medieval house that you can see on the right here. We're going to set up some HDRI lighting that we will probably change later down the road, but just for some realistic lighting, we're going to be setting that up. We're going to texture the house with some image textures slash PBR materials, and we're going to cover some UV unwrapping concepts. I don't know which HDRI are, or don't worry, because in this chapter, I will explain it to you like you've never used this stuff before. So if you're a more intermediate Blender user, you probably don't need to watch anything in this chapter. So on the right here, I have some reference images. And on the left here, I have an empty Blender file. I'm going to hit Control Spacebar to maximize this window. You can always hit Control Spacebar to go back or just hit go back to previous here. So I'm going to add a plane just so the origin point, we don't have to touch it because I want it at the bottom. And I'm just going to arbitrarily scale this up about here until I get like a shape that I like. Let's also scale it out a little bit on the back so we get something nice. And so let's extrude up. So I'm gonna go into the front view here, or in this case, I guess the right view. And I'm just gonna go into wireframe so I can get the back two vertices or the edges or whatever you wanna use. And I'm just gonna bring that arbitrarily up. Okay, so with those still selected, let's extrude up to make the roof. And it looks like, or the second floor, it looks like it's about the same height, if not longer than the other one. So I feel like it's a little too tall now. So I'm going to hit Alt to select this loop and G, whoops, and GZ to move it down a little bit. And let's also move this up here as well. So it's, yeah, okay. Then let's select these two edges here and SY to scale them Y. And I don't want to merge them because it looks like it looks like you can see here there is a actual gap there. So I'm just going to just scale it down until I get something that's kind of small there. Okay, so this is the front and it looks pretty long. So that's pretty good. Now we want this back. So I'm going to shift D to duplicate this RZ 90 to move it on the 90 direction. And I just want to move it outside a little bit here like so. 
and it looks like from the right side this is only sticking out a little bit but from the left side it looks like it's sticking out a lot so so what we can do is just move it out so this side is only a little bit out and this one's much more out and instead of scaling both sides let's just select the face here and gy to move that out just a little bit so it's kind of more so i scaled up and got a shape that i like so now let's hit Control spacebar to bring back our panels i'm going to select either one of them is fine and give them a boolean modifier select union and just select the other object with the eyedropper tool but before i do that and confirm the modifiers i'm just going to shift d to duplicate these and just move them somewhere else add them to a new collection and i'll call it house base house base and i'll just turn that off just in case i want to change those later then let's select the one with the boolean and apply the modifier and we can just delete this extra house here which is by itself so let's just delete that and now we have a unionized house here but looking at some other model by charlie southwood i noticed that it doesn't actually go through so what we can do instead is go into edit mode here and just clean up some of the topology so i'm going to select these faces here and i'll delete these faces so x to delete faces then i'll select these edges right here whoops Let's select these edges and hit F to fill. And then I'm going to hit these, just these, not this one, and dissolve these edges. And I don't think we need this one either, so I'm going to dissolve those edges as well. Okay, so let's clean up this bottom topology here. So I'm going to just hide this face instead and look from the top. Okay, so. Let's just make sure we don't have any extra faces or vertices and let's delete these faces. And I'm in vertice mode and it looks like we got an extra one here. So X and dissolve vertices. And then I'll just select these four edges here and just fill that. And I don't think we actually need these. So I'm gonna select these three as well and dissolve those edges. Okay, and I'm going to Alt H to unhide that roof that I hid. This should come out a little more, so I'm just going to GY and bring that out. Cool, so there is the start of our house. Now let's start working on this inner triangle here. So I'm going to go into top view, circle select with C, and just select the entire top. And right click to get out of the circle tool, shift D to duplicate the faces right click to cancel the movement and I'll do P separate by selection with those still selected so it's a separate mesh. Then let's go into edit mode on that new mesh, hit A to select everything and I think we also need to apply our scale so I'm going to go back into object mode and apply scale real quick. Then I will Alt E to extrude along the normals and I'll hit S so it's evenly scaled and kind of just get a thickness that I like. And now I just want to, let's just select these faces and bring them out a little more. So all of these, and, and I'm gonna hit Alt S and S to scale them on their normals. Looks fine. And with those cell selected, I'm gonna hit S, Z, and then zero to flatten these faces. So now they're all flat, but now they're kind of like inside like this side is a little smaller so i'm going to select these edges and just refine them a little bit so these and sx just kind of bring them back in also bring them out so they come out a little bit so i'm going to go to here and select these faces here and hit control to get the shortest path from left to right and let's just GX and bring that out a little bit so we get some opening there. And same with these as well. So let's do the same thing and GY. So let's start working on these inner panel bars here. So what you could do is add a loop cut here and SX0 to make it straight. And another one here as well and flatten that and then extrude this thing right here. So um, if you wanted to, you could do that. But I think... It would just be easier if we just shift right clicked our cursor and added a new mesh called a cube. So, and just kind of adjust it there. 
and it looks like it's on the inside of the two diagonals there. So I'm just going to adjust that and get it how I want it there inside of there. I know we will never see these faces, so I'm going to enter edit mode and delete these faces as well. And I also want to turn on snapping so I can snap these edges here. You can also just manually move them if you wanted to, like, you know, GY and just kind of eyeball it. Or you can turn on snapping here. So you can toggle it or just hold control to activate it. And I want to select a face here. And these should be fine if we just leave it there. And now I'm going to hit G on this edge, Y to lock it on the Y axis. And I'm going to hit control and I'll hover over that face and I'll snap to that face like that. And I want to do the same thing for this one as well, GY, and snap it to that face as well. Pretty cool. And maybe we could have added a mirror modifier, but let's just do it for this way as well, GY, hover over there. And here as well, GY, and snap it over there to this face with control. And here we can do, um, let's do vertex this time, and let's change it to vertex. And let's select both of them, go into edit mode, Let's go into vertex select. I'm gonna select these two edges. GX, hold control, and just select that vertice from that other one. And let's do the same thing here as well. So select these two and GX, and just hover over this with control selected, and it'll snap perfectly like that. Yeah, and let's just adjust these as well. So I'm going to uh, select both of these and G, and control and snap those. And same here as well. So I'm going to select these. Let's select this. Whoops. This one. Let's get the back one. I don't think the back one actually matters, but let's just select it anyway. Yeah. And then G and just snap it like so. I'm not locking it on any axis. I'm just snapping it to that vertex. So yeah, now we have the bar. And I like that we have a little gap because you can actually see the little gap here as well. So it's a little more realistic that way. Okay, so let's do the same thing for this one right here. So let's do it again, Shift D, G, Z, move it up. Let's select these two vertices. Let's switch to face this time and G, Y, lock it on the Y and select that face right there. And same thing here, let's select these two edges. G, Y, hold control and just select that face right there. G, Y, control. And there, now we have our two planes right here. Actually also make sure they're not like going inside the wall. So let's go into local view and I want to select this one. And let's go back out and let's GX and snap it here. So it's not inside the wall, but snapped to the wall. And yeah, this one also matters. So I should have done both of them at the same time, but let's just select that face. I uh, local view. GX, GX, and snap it to that face there. So now it's not inside. Let's start working on these edge beams here or whatever they're called. So it looks like my roof is a little crooked. So I want to fix that first. And it also looks like this is wider than here. Now, if you're going for like a stylistic choice, this is probably completely fine to just leave it as is, but I'm going to make them strain. So SY and then zero to straighten that out. And here as well, S, Y, zero to straighten that out. So now they're more straight there. And I don't think we need these. So I'm going to select these and dissolve these edges as well. And it also looks like it's a little crooked on the top. So I'm gonna select these and S, Z, zero, just to flatten those out as well. So let's add a loop cut for this edge beam here. So I'm going to enter edit mode, let's add a loop cut, some arbitrary size, SX0 to flatten it, and let's just move it until I get a size that I like, pretty cool. And let's select these with control to get the shortest path between your selection. And let's actually select everything in here as well. So I'm going to select everything in, in our loop cut. So yeah, that should be all of these stuff, right? And I accidentally selected this interface. So I'm going to control, control and box select it to deselect it. So I think that's everything. So yeah, and I'm going to hit P and separate this by selection. Okay, so now they're their separate mesh. Let's select these faces and Alt S and S to scale it up. 
Uh, whoops, let me just make sure I applied my scale. And now let's do the same thing. Alt S and then S to scale evenly and just give it some thickness there. Now let's add this, this beam up here. So I'm going to select the faces here. And I think what I'm going to do for this is Shift D to duplicate those and then P and separate by selection this time. And, and let's try to select that. So uh, let's bring back up my panel. So I'm going to control space bar and try and find it. Yeah, right here. Scale it down. So I'm going to select these two edges and let's do SX to make it a little thinner there. And let's select these two edges and SY to make it a little thinner than the roof there as well. And then I'm going to do tab A to select everything, E and just extrude up. So we get our beam there. And let's just move it up a little bit so it's not directly on there. So yeah, so this is our beam. And let's just make this pass through for now. If it messes up with our UVs, we'll have to adjust it, like create one here and one here or use like a union. But for now, I'm just going to leave it through. Okay, let's make it go um, the same height. So I'm going to select this and let's select these two edges and I'll do G and Z. Oh, let's turn on edge snapping here. So select edge G Z to lock it and then just hover over this with control and now be the same. And let's actually make this a little bit over. It looks like it's a little bit over there. And mm, yeah, let's do SY to make it like, like follows. Okay, so let's add a mirror modifier to this. So I'm gonna enter edit mode. Let's add a loop cut straight down the center here. And let's go into a side view. Let's go into wireframe, vertice select, and just select this half, not that loop cut that we just added and delete the vertices. Then what we can do is select this one. Let's go into Let's go back and get our panels. So control space bar, add a mirror modifier. Okay, and let's select Y instead of X. And since our origin point is already here, we don't actually have to touch anything and it'll work automatically. Let's just make sure we turn on clipping so the vertices are auto merged. Then let's go into a side view and I'm going to select one of these edges and I'm just gonna bring them down like so. And same with this one, just a little bit. I'm going to bring these down as well. And I just realized that this looks a little crooked. So I'm going to go into wireframe and I'm just going to select these right here. And then S, Y and zero. So they're straight. See, now they're straight there. Okay, cool. Looks like there's a little hook on this end here. So let's add a bevel. So I'm going to select this edge right here. And I'm going to hit control B to bevel and you can adjust the segments with your mouse wheel. And you can also see this menu here. So I'm going to turn off my screencast keys just to show you the menu real quick. Now you can play around with these settings, but the main one that we want to change is the shape and we want to bring that down. So it's inverted instead. And it looks like 0 0.39 is pretty good. And I want to adjust the width. So it's still below this a little bit. So yeah, that looks, so yeah, that looks about right. And I'm just going to click to confirm that. Now, of course you can play with these just depending on your scene and what you're looking for. And I'm gonna select this edge and it looks like it comes back a little bit. So I'm just gonna GY and move it back a little bit. And there, now we have our small little hook on the edge of this thing here. To do the barriers on this side, you could just repeat the process that we did, add a loop cut and duplicate it. But I'm going to be lazy and just resist. So I'm going to shift D, duplicate it, RZ and 90 to rotate it 90 degrees and just kind of place it somewhere that I like, like so. And I also want to bring these back a little bit. So I'm going to go into local view real quick so I can select these faces. Because remember last time we separated them, this time I'm just going to pull them back since we're reusing. And I don't want it to intersect with with uh, with this thing. So I'm just going to, until it's slightly there. And this one is fine. We can just pull this one as well through the, for the time being. 
We might need to adjust it later, but just for now, I'll just pull it through the thing there. Yeah, so I just did the same thing for this third side as well. Now let's start adding this plank here on the roof. So you can add another mesh if you wanted to, shift right click and you know, adjust it. But I'm gonna use a little cheat and I'm gonna select the edge of the roof and shift D duplicate, right click to cancel the movement and P and separate by selection. So let's also select it here and let's go into edit mode A to select the entire thing. And I'm gonna E and extrude it a little bit on the X axis. And I'm gonna select that corner again and E and extrude it on the Y as well just a little bit as well, try and get it even. Then I'm gonna select that original edge one more time and control B to bevel it. And that looks about right. Now, remember you can adjust your shape to get the look that you want. And of course, all the other stuff as well. And by beveling it, we actually have an extra vertice here. So you can see it's overlapping. So I'm gonna hit A to select everything. Then I'm gonna hit M to merge and then by distance. And down here you can see removed four vertices. So there is our little wood plank that comes down on the wall here. I don't think we have to care about this top here. So I'm just gonna leave it as so. And let's add a mirror modifier. So I'm gonna add a mirror modifier and let's do Y and instead of X. And now it's on this side as well. And we don't have to do anything because the origin point is right there. So that's all good. Let's add some of these wood things. So I'm just gonna shift right click where I want it to be. I'm gonna shift A and add a circle. So the origin point is at the bottom and 16 vertices is fine. I think we can get around with it. The lower the amount of geometry, the better. So yeah, let's go into edit mode, vertices select. Let's make sure I selected everything. Yeah, and let's go into solid and just extrude it up until I get somewhere that I like, like so. And let's make sure I get these back ones and just put it here as well. And yeah, and then let's do S, Shift Z, and just scale it down until we get somewhere that we like. Then let's right click and shade smooth. And then let's also turn on auto smooth. And we actually don't need auto smooth. I don't think so, but I'm gonna leave it on in case we do in the future. Then what we can do is give this a mirror modifier. So I'm gonna add a mirror modifier and I wanted to go on the Y axis instead. And let's select one with an object point in the center. So this one does here. Let's just make sure that's at the center. So object set origin, origin to geometry. Yeah, now it's in the center. And since this is in the center of this thing, we can just use that as the mirror object. So I'm gonna click this eyedropper tool and select that. And now it's perfectly mirrored on that side as well. Okay, and it looks like it goes a little thinner at the top and a little thicker at the bottom. So I'm going to add a loop cut here and just kind of scale it up. And select these and just scale it down a little bit. Um, if you want to get it more accurate, you can add more loop cuts to kind of scale it how you want it. But I'm going to just keep it as basic as possible. As low poly as possible to get the same effect. So I think that looks it looks good enough. Let's go in the front view and duplicate this and get rid of the mirror modifier. And let's just bring this up here. Let's scale it down. That looks good, but I just realized that I accidentally messed up. I got rid of this inner wood barrier that we were working on. So I do apologize for that mistake. And for these ones, it's gonna be simple, but this one will be a little more complicated to fix, but at least it will be a good exercise. So there are a few ways to fix this. What you can do is just select this inner one, select these two faces, Shift D, separate, P, and separate by selection. So then you can select this thing and just hit A to select everything, Alt E along normals, and then you get your inner thing, right? Or since we already made it, I'm just gonna scale it up and back to the size that we had originally for that gap that we separated with the loop cut and I'm going to select the wall and I'm going to go into local view and I'm just going to refill these. So let's refill that and let's refill this here. Let's make sure I'm not selecting anything else. Yeah. And whoops. Yeah. And then let's do these and fill that. And now let's just select these faces. Let's exit local view and let's just drag them out back where they used to be. So uh, yeah, 
and it's a little bit inside of the barrier so i'm just going to gx and put it out and let's just adjust this in side view so it's not overlapping this and gz And let's go into wireframe and just move this at an angle a little more. Okay, yeah, pretty cool. And for these ones, I didn't actually delete the faces. So they're still there. So what we can do is select these. Let's go into local view again and just select these faces and pull them out. And a G, G, Y, and just pull those out in there. And of course we need to change the scale of this as well. And just that same thing. Okay, so now let's also move the plank a little bit up. So I'm gonna do GZ and just move it up. So right now we have an issue between the plank and the roof. Now we could, you know, select these and bring them up like so. But then we would have to redo some things like here and this might start clipping inside. So, you know, if you're fine with that, you know, go for it. I mean, you could probably make this entire thing in like 10 minutes now, but I'm just going to be lazy and add more geometry. So I'm going to shift D and duplicate this and P and separate by selection. And then I'm going to go into edit mode. Let's go into wireframe and whoops, I don't want to, I only want to select this thing and let's go into vertice and I just want to bring it back to the face here. So, like so. And same with this one as well. And let's just turn on snapping so we can do it faster. G, Y, and snap it to this face. Let's do the same thing here. G, Y, and snap it to this face right here. Oh, G, X, and snap it to this face. And then I'm just going to hit A and extrude it up. You know, I might just redo it later, but... I think for now, I'm just going to leave it there. Anyway, let's just finish adding our trunks. And it looks like on the side, there's one more trunk here. So I'm going to shift D duplicate G, uh, GX and just kind of move it here. Now, once we start going into the deleting phase, I'll do it then. But for now, I'm just going to leave it. And let's just bring this down so it's not clipping inside there. Sometimes when you're modeling, it kind of looks like, you know, kind of stale in solid view or any other view, you know, even if you turn on like matcap or one of these to suit your modeling and cavity as well, you know, whatever. So I actually at this point want to add some realistic lighting that we can always change later just so I can kind of get a feel for the shadows that I'm looking at. The way we can get realistic lighting is with an HDRI or a high dynamic range image. If you want, you can go in depth on this, but it's just an image that has lighting data basically. So I'm going to go to HDRI and Polyhaven, which is actually the first result, and go into HDRI. Now you can browse these, you can go for the mood that fits your theme. So you know, maybe you want something more romantic or like in the evening, then you can go for something that's like a sunset, you know, something like this or something or you know like this be using this one so you can just download it right here and this one doesn't really matter too much but I'm gonna do 4k and I'm just gonna download it but I already have it downloaded so I'm just gonna navigate there okay once you have that downloaded let's go back into blender let's go into shading tab and let's switch this here to world and also make sure you have the node wrangler add-on add this will just make dealing with nodes a lot easier so just make sure that's check marked. Then you can see this thing here. Oh, if you don't see this, just make sure you click use nodes. You can also hit the home key on your keyboard to go to the nodes. And I'm going to select my background and hit control T. Just easily set up so we can just plug in our HDRI. Okay, so now that, that my HDRI is in there, let's go into rendered view. By the way, I'm also in cycles, so I get this realistic lighting. And honestly, it looks pretty good. Now, if your HDRI is a little different, you can play around with these mapping. Yeah, so I actually want the light to come from this direction. So I'm gonna set it to like 180 on the Z rotation. 
Yeah, so now it's coming from this direction. You can also change the strength if you want. Of course, I'm going to go into the lighting a little bit later, but I just want to get a feel for how the model looks in a more realistic setting with some basic lighting here. Okay, let's go back to the layout tab and continue modeling. All right, let's start adding some wood planks. Now, if you wanted a shortcut, what you could do is select the body and just add loop cuts to it. So like here, and then I'll uh, select this loop with Alt. Whoops, let me try and get that. And then Alt E along normals. And now you can see you have the plank there, but I want to reuse my planks and I don't want to deal with the clipping problem later. So what I'm gonna do instead is just select like a flat face of this, so like right here. And I'm gonna shift D duplicate, right click cancel, P separate selection. And I'm gonna select this object set origin, origin to geometry. And I'm just gonna scale this one so it, it kind of fits between the, the things. Now, of course you can use snapping if it makes your life a little bit easier. So let me just see, I'm on face. Let's do GX and snap it there. Yeah, that's fine, GX and snap it there. This is a little curved surface, so there might be a little gap, but I honestly think that's okay. And let's go into Edge, GZ, bring this down a little bit. And let's just uh, enter Edit Mode. And hit E to extrude that out. And now we have our plank there. So I think it should be safe just to delete this face now. Of course, you can always do it later if you're unsure, but I'm going to do it now. And yeah, I'm just gonna duplicate this and move it around. And yeah, so I finished placing a bunch of cubes around my wall. You can see there are just some mirror modifiers and one array modifier here. So I didn't have to do too much work there. But yeah, they're all just cubes or rectangles with one of their faces deleted. So I just want to finish my door up with this triangular, I mean, diamond pattern. So, so there are a few ways to do this. You know, you could, uh, duplicate this like 45 and duplicate another one negative 45 and then just use the intersection modifier but I think a really easy way is just to select this face here shift D duplicate separate by selection like we've been doing and I'm gonna go into my view here and just kind of adjust it to the door size okay let's enter local view and I'm going to subdivide it. So I'm going to right click on it with the entire thing selected, subdivide and subdivide it again. Alternatively, you could also just subdivide it once and then change up the number of cuts here. So I'm going to go two and I'm going to go one more to go for three and just hit enter there. Then I'm going to hit A to select everything. And you need to be in face select, right click and poke faces. Then I'm going to right click again and do tries to quads. And nothing changed because we need to update this max shape angle thing here. Now, depending on your your width and height, your dimensions of this, it might have already worked for you. But in my case, it hasn't. So I'm just going to increase this until I see diamonds. And yeah, so 53 degrees. Now all of these have became diamonds. And I'm going to just uh, scale it up so they actually kind of look like diamonds. Okay, so now what I want to do is create the thickness for these diagonals. So what I'm going to do is go into edge mode and just select a bunch of random edges here with control and shift just to get a bunch of edges. Then I can come up to here, select, select similar, and I'll choose direction in this case. So now we selected all the edges except the ones on the border here. Now you could just hit A to select all the edges and then just control and get rid of the edges up there and on the side as well like hold it by holding control so you could have also done that as well like let me get rid of those yeah so that looks good and now what i'm going to do is just control b to bevel and if it looks a little weird we probably need to apply our scale but um for me it looks pretty good so now we want to extrude these diagonals so i'm going to do the same thing i'm just going to select some of these random ones so like kind of anywhere it doesn't really matter you can always just adjust it later. And I'm going to go into select, select similar. So you can also do shift G. And this time I'm going to select area. And this time now you can see all of our diagonals are selected. Then I can just hit E and extrude that out. And if you want to save this selection later, you can use a face map 
So if I go into object data properties, so you know the data for the current object, you can come into face maps and um, add a few face map here. You can call it whatever you want. I'll just call it, you know, like border, I don't know, frame. You can call it whatever you want. And with these still selected, you can assign them. And now you can see when I deselect them and select them, they select those faces. So I don't have to do that tedious process again. So let's go into wireframe. And it looks like there's only like three of them. So I'm going to delete some of these ones that we don't need, like here, S, and delete those vertices. And similar with this one. So I'm going to come here and delete. Uh, I'm going to delete these vertices as well. Okay, let's go back into solid view. And oh, it looks like I'm actually on the other side. Whoops. And anyway, I don't think we actually need all of these actually, but let me just see. So I'm going to select some of these faces here. And let's do shift G, select area, and I'm going to add these as well. And I'm just going to delete those faces. Oh, yeah, I don't think we actually need all of this. So I think what we can do instead is just keep one of them. So let's just delete. Let's keep this middle one here and delete the rest. So I'm going to highlight like gray right here and let's delete those vertices. And I'm going to highlight right here and delete those vertices. So yeah, so now we have this pattern that we can add a mirror modifier to. So let's go back into solid. I'm on the other side again. Uh, so yeah, and now we can just go here, add an array modifier, and let's just change this. Yeah, so let's go out of local view and kind of just adjust it to the this place. I'm going to scale it down. Uh, let's do object set origin to geometry so it's easier to handle. Yeah, and that looks pretty good. Um, it looks like we could fill up some of this stuff. So let's just fill this. Yeah, let's select these. Let's fill that. And let's fill these. And yeah, let's fill these as well. So I'm going to select these and fill those. And these and fill those. These and fill those. Cool, so I think we fixed everything. Oh uh, no, down here. And I've been manually selecting them, but I think I can just hold this one and then control here to get the shortest path and then just hit fill to fill that as well. And it looks like there's a problem here. And fill that, yeah. So now everything is looking good. Oh, uh, we should have just deleted it and added a mirror modifier to these as well. So maybe we could have added a mirror modifier so we didn't have to do double the work, but you know, we're almost done already. So I'm just going to select these and fill them out. Yeah. So now we have, now we have our thing there. What we could also do is dissolve these edges. So like select these with shift alt to get the loop and X dissolve edges. And then let's select these faces and SZ zero to flatten them and SY and kind of just scale them up. Honestly, this might be too much work for no reason and just bring it up. GZ. Now, honestly, it's just too much work. So I'm just going to leave it how it was. I don't think anyone's going to tell unless they look really close. So I guess it probably would have been easier just to model one bar and then add a mirror modifier to get the second bar here and then add a second mirror modifier to get the flipped one here. And then then we could just give that an array modifier. But I originally wanted the faces in between the barriers, but then I kind of just decided that maybe we didn't need them so but yeah that probably would have been easier and shorter now let's add this chimney here so i'm going to come back here and i think i'm just going to add a new cube this time so shift amc for a cube and let's go into edit modes and just drag it up it doesn't have to be too accurate and i'm going to select this face and just bring it up and yeah and i think it's a little wider on the side so i'm going to give it one loop cut here and just do sy and oh yeah, I should also scale this one down so it's not weird. And up here, let's bring this down a little bit and E extrude that and S scale E to extrude that and let's scale that up a little bit as well. So there is our chimney. Okay, let's go back and give it a difference modifier and subtract the house from it. So I'm gonna go into the Boolean, sorry, Boolean modifier 
and difference and then eyedropper and select my house and I'm just going to apply that and I also want to do the same thing for this roof object here so I'm going to select this and give it a boolean modifier and difference as well and cut that out and apply that as well and let's just clean this up so I'm going to go into local view and let's delete let's delete these faces and let's delete these edges delete edges and faces and uh, edges oh, hmm. let's see let me fill this face and let's fill uh, let's fill these this one right here and let's fill this and this as well cool let's go back out and see how it looks yeah not bad so this looks kind of weird because it's here so what we can do is um, let's just move this out so it's not inside and then we can add another loop cut right here and we can select this edge and GX and just move it here and let's select this edge so let's go into wireframe so we can see it solid and I'm gonna GX to move that out yeah so yeah so now we have a chimney that kinda looks like this and I don't think we need these interfaces so I'm just gonna hit control to select these faces and delete them so that's a nice chimney and let's just make this a little bit thinner so I'm gonna hit control to take the shortest path and G and X and make that a little thinner alright let's add these small window cutouts so I'm gonna go into my side view I'm gonna shift right click to move my cursor and let's just add a new cube this time and I'm just gonna adjust it to get to like a shape that I want and yeah let's add a loop cut in the center right click to cancel the movement let's go into wireframe and delete these vertices so now we can add a mirror modifier and I think yeah Z direction so now we have it there let's turn on clipping Okay, let's go back into the side view. Actually, let's select, whoops, let's select this top face first. And let's go back into side view. And I want to extrude that out and then SX to scale it out a little bit because it looks a little slanted there. And then one more extrusion. And yeah, and then just SX to bring those together. And let's go into vertices and let's just make those a little bit closer. Let's do merge by distance, and it says remove two vertices. You might need to change your merge distance if they're a little bit farther. Okay, so there is our cutout, and you can adjust the thickness to determine how deep it should cut there. Okay, let's apply this mirror modifier, and I'm going to give another mirror modifier, and it'll be for this one right here. And I think we need to do the y-axis. Yeah, so it's on that side as well. And we could array modify it, but I'm just going to shift D and move it to duplicate it and move it over here as well. All right, let's add the second pair of windows here. So I'm going to go into my side view. Let's shift right click where you want it to be. And I'm going to shift A, M, and add a cube. So M, C. And let's just scale it up how you want it a little bit. Yeah, and now let's add a loop cut here. Let's select this edge. Let's bring it up somewhere like here. And let's just do control B and increase it like so. so. There is our that. And I also want to shade smooth here. And let's turn on auto smooth. And I'm just going to do SY and scale that in. Right. And I'm going to shift D, duplicate this one, and GX and move it over here. All right, so I think all. Pretty much most of our house is completed at this point. So I'm going to hit A to select everything, Shift D, Duplicate, G, X, and then with everything still selected here, whoops, I accidentally selected the camera. I'm going to delete the second camera. I'm going to go into wireframe. Let's select that again. And I'm just going to hit M and move it to a new collection and call it modifiers. So this is just in case you ever want to change something while you still have your modifiers active. And this is the problem with destructive modeling because once you cut out the walls, there it's always going to be there and you need to do a lot of work to fix that. So always save a copy. 
um, somewhere. But a lot of people, they like to file and save copy of the Blender file entirely instead of just duplicating stuff and moving it to collections. So whatever floats. So whatever works for you. All right, so let's just focus this with period key on your numpad and let's go up to modifiers and let's just hit this check mark here. So it's completely disabled and let's also disable renders just in case. I think by clicking this, it's already disabled, but uh, it might not be, but let's also uncheck this for renders. And if you don't see this, you can come up here and select uh, this one right here for renders, disable renders as well as exclude from view layer. All right, let's hit A to select everything. And I keep selecting the camera when I hit A, so I'm gonna go into period key to focus on the camera. And I'm gonna come here and disable selectable right here. Enable that, and then you can click on it, and now you can't select it. So if you wanna select it, you can activate it again. But Okay, so I'm gonna hit A to select everything, except that non-selectable thing there. All right, so let's hit A to select everything. You can see we have a bunch of modifiers here. And we could go one by one to apply them all, or you can do a shortcut. You can do F3 and search up convert to mesh and then select that. And now you can see all our wrenches are gone here. And that means it applied all our modifiers. So if I go click this and go to the wrench, you can see there's no modifiers here anymore. Then I want to join out the things that we didn't cut out. So these windows, I'm going to join these together with control J. And if you go to edit preferences, and if you have this Boolean tool, add-on installed, you can use a convenient hotkey. You can select the object that's doing the cutting and then changing your active object to the object that you want to cut out from. And then you can hit control and the minus key on your numpad to quickly activate this Boolean modifier. And then you can just apply it and I'm going to select our joined thing and delete it. All right. And if your shading is a little messed up, you probably have to go into here and turn on auto smooth. You can see the shading is messed up here. So I'm going to turn on auto smooth and you may even need to adjust this thing here as well. Yeah, so our house is completed. You could definitely use this as a realistic render. You know, for example, you'll see a lot of people and realistic renders for these sharp edges, give it a bevel because nothing in real life is really that sharp, except like a really sharp knife, you know, like 0 0.004 here and turn up the segments to like four or something. And you can see it now there's like a slight bevel and it's not 100% sharp. But if I apply that, you can see it adds a bunch of geometry there. Of course, it's more realistic, but that comes at the cost of performance. So I'm going to undo this. And if you actually take a look at the image here of Skyrim, it looks like they also didn't even decide to do that. They kind of just decide to leave it the hard edge there with one edge instead of all those beveled ones. I guess what you could do to make it a little more stylized is like add loop cuts to kind of adjust it. So yeah, for example, here's one you can, um, so you can add like a loop cut here and like kind of bring it up or something and kind of make it like twisty or something and dent it like that, you know, same with some of these here. So I can select this, add a loop cut and just kind of G Y and make it a little crooked or something. So if you wanted to make it a little more stylized, you can do that. Yeah, so I think even this house is a little slanted, so I'm gonna like take this edge and just move it out. So it's kind of like a little diagonal instead of straight up and down. So yeah, but yeah, I think I'm happy with what we have right now. All right, I wanna move this entire house into its new collection. So I'm gonna hit A to select everything, M and new collection, and I'm gonna call it house. Of course, you can organize your file however you want, it doesn't really matter. All right, so before we texture our house, Let's delete any extra things that we'll never see, like faces, vertices, extra meshes, or any stuff like that. And let's also make sure there are no major intersections or like buggy areas like this here. So if my camera is here, you can see I can just look through that pole. So this is the one that I'm going to fix real quick. I'm just going to go into edit mode and I'm going to go into local mode with numpad slash. Let's go to this side here, and I think it ended at this vertice. So I'm going to go into wireframe, and I'm just going to highlight these and delete these vertices. And go out of local view. And oh, I selected this one. So I probably should have done this with the modifier one, because right now I already applied the mirror modifier. So this is its own separate thing, unfortunately. So. And 
And if it looks like there's a noticeable gap, you can select the edges and snap it to the wall if necessary. But I don't think there's one. And this is why I used a rendered so I can see the gaps a little bit better. And yeah, there's definitely a noticeable gap here. So I maybe don't need snapping. I can just do GY and just kind of move it. And I forgot to select this bottom one as well. Yeah. Cool. And yeah, let's close this top. So I'm going to go into vertices select and just move this in. And let's just go here and let's just adjust this G uh, GX hold down control for face snapping. And I think I turned on align rotation to target, but I don't think anyone can notice anyway. So that's what that, and I think that's fine back there. Yeah. All right, so definitely this bottom face, we definitely don't need this. So I'm gonna delete those faces. And uh, I think I already deleted all of these. Yeah, I already deleted the faces here. So yeah, that's all I'm gonna be doing. I'm just gonna add some final touches and so on and so forth. Yep, so I just deleted a bunch of faces and now let's add some textures here. So I'm going to go to shading tab. I think we were here earlier, but I don't remember. And we're still on world here, so I want to change it to object. So I'm going to come over here and change that to object. Now your shading tab might look a little different because I might have had a different default. So over here I have the UV editor open. Here is just the generic 3D viewport and here is the shader editor. So to texture this house, actually let me just give it a material real quick. I'm going to give it a new material. You can see that by default we have this thing here called base color and when I change it, it changes on the house right so instead of using a color i'll be using an image as the quote unquote color as well as for some of these other properties as well like the normal and the roughness and we will let an image with that data determine everything for our texture slash material they're specifically called pbr materials and there are a lot of great websites that have free ones for us textures.com is a pretty popular one if you sign up you get 15 free credits a day and some of the higher quality ones are only for paid users so that is a downside with this website but if you're working with low resolution assets then it's completely fine just to use some low resolution images. And ambientcg.com is another great one. Now there are lots of them and I will post it on the resources links so you can just find ones that you like. So I'll show you the ones that I'm using, but obviously experiment on your own and find what works best for you. And I might even change some of these a little bit later or make adjustments since I'm very indecisive about my materials. So as we discussed earlier with the Node Wrangler add-on, you can just simply select your principal BSDF, hit Control Shift T and open and navigate to where you extracted those files. And I just want the diffuse, AKA color, the normal, as well as the roughness. And then I'm going to click principal texture setup. By the way, I'm selecting these with control. Now you can see it did all the work for us. We don't have to you know, go shift A and add an image texture and then navigate to that image texture and hook it up to the color. It did all of that work for us. And you can see instead of our option to change that base color uniformly, it's gonna be using this image texture here instead. You can see all these other images also contain the data for the roughness and the normal as well. So I'm in material preview mode and you can see the texture looks a little bit weird. And the reason it's weird is because Blender does not know how to map a 2D plane onto a 3D object. So what we need to do is UV unwrap. So essentially UV mapping is just the process of projecting a 2D image to a 3D model's surface for texture mapping. So they have some good images here that you can kind of tell. This one is probably one of the most common ones you'll see. It's like wrapping a gift box. So, you know, you have to 
have that 2D image and you're gonna put it on a 3D object. So like you have a gift wrapping paper and you wanna wrap a present. Let me go back into Blender and just open a texture. So I'm gonna go back and let's go back to wood planks dirt and I'm just gonna open the image so we can see it in here. You can imagine this is our 2D texture here and we have like a U axis and a V axis and you can see it's like starts at zero zero and one one. And basically we can just pick any point. I'm just going to pick the center. So it's either easy 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And we're just picking this point and mapping it into a point on the 3D object that has a 3D space coordinates. So that's just like a general high level overview of what UV. All right, so let's also just take a look at what else we got here. So we have the roughness one. So let me open that real quick. And you can see it's a grayscale image. So without this image, if you change the roughness in the principal BSDF, what's happening here is you're changing the roughness for the entire area that material's on. And it's gonna be the same across that entire area. But if you have this grayscale image here as the roughness operator here, you have this grayscale image here, the roughness will be varying across the image texture. So the darker the area, the less rough it's gonna be, and the wider the area, the higher the roughness is gonna be. So this completely white line thing here is gonna be like a roughness of 1.0, and this slightly grayer one, I don't know, it's not gonna be zero, but maybe something like 0 0.35 or something like that. Now, if it was completely black, then it would be completely zero roughness at this point in that image texture. Now, this is extremely useful for realism because not especially wood planks actually in some areas wood planks are really smooth and in other areas they are really rough and down here is the normal map is it adjust lighting so how do you get the rgb image well it's a bunch of math now the last one that we didn't use but i might as well show it anyway and displacement will actually add geometry to your mesh and of course when you're adding geometry and vertices to your mesh it's gonna take a hit on performances so that's why i'm not going to be using this one and the normal should be more than enough and for some objects like this wood plank i might not even use a normal map because it's kind of too subtle and it might not even make a difference all right so let's unwrap our house base here i did delete those interfaces in the time lapse i'm going to go into edit mode so tab and with everything selected with A, you can see our UVs show up here, but it's really messed up. So there are a few ways to unwrap this. You can use an add-on or you can manually mark seams and hit U and click unwrap. But you can see because we didn't mark any seams or basically areas to cut our texture, it doesn't know how to unwrap, right? But luckily for simple geometries like this, Blender actually has a built-in unwrapper for us and we can just do u smart uv project and leave the default settings here so i'm going to hit ok and you can see our uv updated and if i go back you can see it actually kind of looks decent now now you can actually kind of see how it's being unwrapped so if you can imagine folding having all these flat 2d things and trying to build this house here with it or trying to wrap this house with this uv map with all these assets here that contain that portion of the texture so let me use my middle mouse button to click and drag over here and switch back to the diffuse or the color aka and you can see a portion of this image is on this 3d object now so if you want to click uvs in real time and sync them if i do it right now it's not working but you can come over here and turn on this called UV sync selection. And I'm going to go into face select and select this face. And you can see in real time where it is. So you can see this contains this portion of the texture and it's right here on this area. And if you notice when we hit, let me actually just open it again. You can see we have this island margin. So an island is pretty much just what it sounds like. It's like a set of UVs that are connected to each other, but are by themselves. So here you can see we have that 0.1 margin between the islands. 
lastly over here we just have some mapping nodes so they just kind of help with the you know mapping i guess and this one is just telling these image textures to use the uvs that we created and this one is just a mapping node that has something so you can play with it and see its results so if i play with the rotation you can see what happens to the mesh in real time and let's change the scale i, I mean just for a demo you can change it up i'll just uh, I'm clicking and dragging by the way, so I can select all of them at one time and then just typing 15 and you can see the texture is starting to repeat itself and the reason for it is because there is no other data. So the only other data if you want to keep scaling it is just to repeat the texture over and over and you'll actually see a lot of games have repeated textures. So here is a real life example from Skyrim. You can see they probably created their own image texture in like Photoshop or something, and they just repeated it a bunch of times. Here you can see the same exact thing over and over. Now, especially in a lot of older games or non-realistic games, you're going to be seeing repeated textures. Now, there are ways to fix this, of course, especially if you're going for like a realistic game, you definitely want to fix this kind of stuff. But if the game is good enough, no one is going to be noticing, especially when you're on the ground. It's not as evident when you're looking from really far away and noticing all the repeated textures. OK, so let's actually change the scale back to one. All right, so the first thing I want to do is try and find a scale that I like. So I'm going to enter edit mode again, hit A to select everything. And I'm going to hit S on my keyboard and the UV editor to scale the UVs up. And I just want like a nice size that is a little more realistic. And if it's kind of hard to tell in material preview, you can go into your rendered settings because we set up that lighting and you can just take a look if it looks realistic enough to you or not. And if it does, then you got a nice scale. And I think that is good for now. And just for a refresher, if I didn't talk about it earlier, I am in cycles. If your computer is frying itself with cycles, you can change down the max samples for the viewport. So, you know, like 64 or something, and it will render less samples. So it'll be easier. And if that still breaks, you can go to EV, which is a real time rendering engine. However, it's not as realistic, but this should work a lot faster. But I'm just gonna stick with cycles because my computer can handle it. Just note that when we start baking our textures, which if you don't know, I'll talk about it later, we're gonna be baking in cycles anyway. Yeah, so UV unwrapping is a lot like 3D modeling, except you're moving it in 2D space instead of 3D space. A lot of the hotkeys are similar like S, R, and G, but a lot of them are also different. So if you notice here, this is going vertically, but everything else is going horizontally. And I actually think that looks better, but just for the sake of this video, I'm gonna rotate these with R. So I'm gonna select these faces that are vertical. And oh yeah, I have this side as well. So let me just make sure and go in the negative Y. And I want to select all of these faces. So I just hold shift and box selected all of them. And I also want to get the ring in here as well. So whoops and shift alt whoops shift alt and get the loop there and i actually want to assign this to a face mask so i don't have to keep selecting it if i ever want to change it so let's go to object data properties like we did earlier where is it yeah this one right here and we want to go into face maps and click plus and with everything still selected we want to assign it there and I'll just call it fronts, but you can call it whatever you want. So now when I select it, you can see I can just select it and deselect it and I don't have to worry about it. So all I want to do is just R and then hit 90 on my keyboard to rotate it 90 degrees. And you can just adjust it if you want these to line up, but it's not really going to matter because I think I'll hide up this corner with a beam later that I forgot to add there. I just want to talk about some customizations that you can do with your downloaded image texture. If you are a Photoshop person or a photo editing person, you can definitely just take the image and put it into Photoshop and edit in that way and then just reuse it. But I'm just going to be showing some basic Blender ones real quick. So I'm going to box select with click and drag and just move these out to the side. I'm going to hit control space bar to maximize this and go in. 
and I just want to create some space here and I'm going to hit shift a search with S and I'm going to add a hue and saturation node. And if you just drag it in between, it should automatically hook up for us perfectly fine. And you've probably seen this before if you edited photos and like your camera stuff and it's exactly what it sounds like. It adjusts the hue and the saturation and you can just play around with this. So you can see when I slowly change it, it's changing the hue and I can also change the saturation as well. Like so. And now it's a lot grayer. And I think I just want to tone down the saturation a little bit. So 0.6 or something like that. So it's a lot more gray scaly. But of course, you know, up to your scene and how you want to do it. And if you want to mute this real quick, all you have to do is just hit M on it. And you can see it's changing between what it would look like without. So right now it's muted with M. And this is its original state. And if I hit M again over it, you can see it's switching between with the node and without the node. And the other really simple one is a RGB curves. So if you've used any photo editing software, so Photoshop, you'll see this one as well. And here you can just plug it in like we did there and you can just adjust it how you want. So maybe I want to explode the greens and now you can see it's really green, but I'm not going to be using this here. So if we go back to our reference image, this back part actually uses stones. So I'm going to search for stones or rocks, whichever I like. And this actually looks pretty good, but I think this one looks a little bit closer. So download this one at 4K as well. All right, let's go back in Blender. And with this selected, let's go into object data. Let's go to our front face map that we created. And whoops, I have to go into edit mode. And I'm just going to select that so we can select the front real quick. And I'm also going to hold shift and select this one. And I want to deselect this front. So I'm going to hold shift and whoops, control and box drag, uh, click and drag to box select and deselect that. So this is the back. Oh, I also want to select this one as well. And everything that I'm selecting here, oh, and this one as well, will be have the stone material. So I also want to give a face mask here. I'm going to plus and add another one and I'll call this a stone face and just hit assign with those selected. So if I want to change it later, I can easily just click on it. Okay, let's go back to material properties and add another material and I'll hit new and I'll call it rock base. And the same process. Let's zoom in on this control shift T I'm not going to use displacement. By the way, 3GS does support displacement maps, but I'm not going to be using those. So let's highlight it and all your faces highlighted. You can just click assign. And now this base has this material and this one has this material. All right. So this chimney also has the same exact stone texture. So I'm just going to select it, come into its materials and select our rock base that we created. Now, of course, it's also messed up. So I'm going to hit tab. A to select everything, U, Smart UV Progen 0.01, and it looks a little bit better. And now you can see we get that nice unwrap here, and I'm just going to scale it up until it kind of matches the size that we had over there. And maybe S, Y, uh, S, X, just to give it a little bit of stretching to kind of match it up. All right, let's do these one beams here. So let's give this a new material. And I'll call it beams. And for this one, I want to use this one from Ambient CG called Bark 012 and just download that 4K as well. They gave us a lot here. I'm going to use a normal GL and roughness with control and a color as well. And principal texture setup. So let's also select these in object mode and select these last. And let's hit control L to link materials so we don't have to manually add them. Let's also enter edit mode with all of them selected and hit use smart UV project and on project it just to make sure that it's looking good. And let's take a look at the unwrap. And yeah, that's a pretty decent unwrap. So I just want to scale it up until it looks a little rugged. Let's add a hue saturation shift a hue saturation and maybe turn up the saturation. Now let's change the hue a little bit. 
and I kind of want to make it like white. So um, let's add a hue saturation and just turn down the saturation. So I guess zero is good for now. All right, for all right, let's start on the wood planks. And for that one, I'm going to be using Bog Brown 01 from Polyhaven. So let's select a plank, give it a new material, and call it plank. And same thing, brown, normal roughness, principle texture setup. And let's actually select all of these beams. And after you select all the beams, I am going to select this one last and control L to link materials. And I also actually just want to join them. So I'm going to hit control J to join them. And then let's go into edit mode, hit A to select everything. And then U smart UV project. Let's turn up that island margin a little bit and unwrap it. So now we have unwrapped stuff there. And let's just scale it up until it starts looking a little bit woody on the planks and compared to the rest of the house that's pretty saturated and it looks kind of weird so let's do the same thing human saturation let's put it in here let's just tone down the saturation a little bit i also think this barrier uh here uses the same material these things here so i'm going to select these barriers here and i'm going to select one of these beams and just hit control L link materials. And with, I'll hit shift again to deselect that one. And with these beams selected, enter edit mode, tab, tab, a select everything, use my UV project 0.0166. And okay, not bad. And let's just scale this up until we get something that looks really woody. And I don't want this one to go horizontal. I kind of want it to go like that as well. And then I'm just going to s rotate them. So let me go into material preview and I just want to select these and let's just rotate them like so. And whoops, I actually shouldn't have selected this one because this one has to go the other way instead. And I just hit R on my keyboard over the UV editor and I'm rotating it. So that's what I just did there. Okay, not bad. And oh yeah, we should have fixed this one at the same time as well, but we could just manually do it. Oops, I can't actually see it. All right, not bad. And here as well. And instead of having to do it on every single one, we can just select this one, select this one with shift, select this one, make this the active object, control L and copy UV maps. And now you can see they use the same UV map as each other. So they're exactly mapped the same exact way. So if I select this and go into edit mode, you can see the UV here. And if I select this one, you can see it's identical. And I actually feel like this material looks better than this bark. So what I'm going to do for these is I'm going to select them, make this to act of object, control L and link materials. So now these are using this material instead of the previous ones. Yeah, this gate, I think this gate can use the same material as well. So I'm just going to control L and link materials there. And yeah, we also need to unwrap it because it looks kind of weird. Now let's just scale it up until it looks kind of woody. So these two beams up here will also use the same material. So I'm just gonna control shift L, link materials those, and let's select these, whoops. Tab, A to select everything, U smart UV project 0.01. And let's just scale it up until we get something that has a similar frequency to, or grain size or whatever you wanna call it to the other one. These inner ones will also use the same material as plank. So I'm just going to control shift L and link materials there as well. And let's make sure to unwrap those as well. So they work properly. And let's just scale it up until we get a similar grain size. And for the roof, I think I want to go with roof slates zero two. Same deal here, new material, roof, principal BSDF, control shift T. 
grab diffuse, normal, and roughness. Let's plug it in. Tap A, U, smart UV project, undo, and let's just scale it up to get a decent size. And let's rotate them. So I'm going to select these. And this one's actually correctly oriented. And I'm just going to do R90. Whoops. I want to be over my UV editor when I do it. So these are pointing down. And this one should be as well. R90. All right. Oh, and these inner ones as well. So R90. And these beams here should also use plank. So I'm going to select this and just do plank. All right, so now I want to get organized and I'm going to hit A to select everything. I'm going to hit Shift D to duplicate. Right click to cancel movement, M, new collection, and I'll call it textured and hit OK. And I want to make sure I want to click and drag and put it into this collection here. And then I'm going to uncheck this mark. And then I'm going to hold, click this one, shift to click this one to select all of them. I could have hit A as well. Oh, yeah, I should also disable those in renders for the texture collection. And for this one, I'll hit M, new collection, and I'll call this one joined. For the ones in joined, let's also make sure it's in house optimized. I'm going to hit A to select everything in joined. Or you can right click and select objects. And I want to select my house base here as the active object in orange and then hit control J just to join them. So now I can just click anywhere on the model and just join it and sorry, just move it as a single object. All right, congratulations. You've modeled a medieval house. We learned a little bit about PBR materials, image textures, HDR lighting, modeling a house and UV unwrapping with a smart UV project. In the future, I think we're going to have to do some manual unwrapping later. So here, just a list of a few resources that I use frequently for texturing and HDRIs. Obviously, there are tons of other ones as well. If you want to go even further, you can check out some of these things that go in depth. So the first one is this guy, and he makes some absolutely insane scenes all in Blender. Now, some of the add-ons he uses are paid. So that is a problem. And all of these are time lapse. So if you don't know all the Blender hotkeys and where to go, it's not going to be very helpful. But if you're an intermediate user, you can definitely watch the time lapse and learn a lot of techniques from, and especially with the texturing and just his overall workflow processes is really helpful. You know, you can see what kind of brushes he are using when he's sculpting and so on and so forth. Uh, Derek Elliott, he goes really in depth in materials here. Now, it, he is texturing a shoe, but a lot of these concepts apply to other textures as well. You know, you can look up PBR materials and just kind of see what you can do with your materials and other things. And you can also learn some, you know, more tips and tricks and different workflows to see what you like best. There are the Blender community is absolutely amazing. They, there are tons and tons of tutorials. And if you really want to go further, you can look into software, texturing software specifically made just to create textures like Substance Painter and Designer. These are really popular ones. So if I go to ArtStation and type in Substance Painter here, you can see some of the absolutely incredible things made with Substance Painter. Now, if you're a student, you can actually get Substance Painter for free. Everything you can do in Substance Painter, you can also do in Blender. It just might be a little more difficult to do in Blender. And this guy is just a great example of that. He is, I think, one of the core developers of Blender, but he is also an artist himself. And this work is absolutely stunning. He does everything straight in Blender, I believe. Yeah, only Blender, and he can make all these other great things. So don't think you need paid software. It might speed up your process. It might not. So it's really a matter of preference. So for most users, it's not really going to be the technology that's limiting to you. It's more of just your preference and how you want to work. 
Welcome to chapter two. In this chapter, we're going to cover some sculpting basics so you can create a landscape like this you see in the image here. We're going to cover some texture painting basics so you can paint a gravel path here. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about texturing. All right, so I'm going to do Shift S, cursor to world origin, Shift A, M, P to add a plane. And you can just scale it up with S and move your mouse until you get a size you like. But I'm going to do S and I'm going to type 10 and then click to confirm that. And then I'm going to do S and type 10 again to scale it up another 10 times and then S and then 1.2 to multiply that by 1.2. By the way, if you're starting to see some clipping, like if I go really far, you can see my stuff is starting to clip. You need to adjust your camera. So I'm going to hit N and go to view and you can change your ends here. So you can see if I change this to like 50, yeah, everything is invisible. So you need to uh, increase your end in here so you can see really far. So I think I was at a thousand, so I'm gonna keep it at a thousand. Okay, the next step is completely optional and I don't know of anyone who does it except me, but I wanna give my plane an initial material and it kind of just helps me get a feel for my landscape. So I'm gonna come here and hit new and I'll call it landscape. Then I'll go back into the shading tab like we did in chapter one with principled BSDF, control shift T. And for this one, I'm gonna be using grass path two from Polyhaven. So you can see it right here and normal this and this. Then let's just quickly give it an unwrap and I'm just gonna scale it up for now. And you can see it's repeating a lot, but it's actually not a problem once we get later because we'll have a bunch of other things and a bunch of other textures no one's actually going to notice and also by the way if you actually want to test from a walker's point of view you can hit shift back tick on your keyboard the back tick for me is above the tab key and now you can use wasd to move around you can scroll up on your mouse wheel to go faster and down to go slower or you can hold shift and it'll go make you go really fast while holding a key. If you want to walk, you can hit the tab key. And now you can just walk around. And wherever your cursor is pointing, so let's say I want to point right here, I can hit spacebar and it'll teleport me to that location. So if I go really far and I want to navigate to my house, I can just point at my house, hit spacebar, and then I teleport to my house. Now there are a lot of other things you can do with the fly slash walk navigation and you can find them in the blender docs All right and you can just hit right mouse button to cancel that movement likewise i also want to just kind of sort of change the hue saturation briefly and maybe let's tone down the hue to give it a little orangey color so remember hit m to mute it and i just want it a little bit orangey and then we can turn down the saturation a little bit as well. And I think the HDRI is kind of like blowing out the colors. So I'm also going to switch the HDRI quickly. I'm going to go into world. Whoops, I should stay in rendered. And instead of Spracken Hill, I want to use Kiara One Dawn 8K from polyhaven.com. So this is the one from Polyhaven. Of course, experiment with your own scene. All right, let's head back to the layout tab. All right, so now in order to create the landscape, you're gonna need a lot of geometry, right? Because if I want to, you know, like make a mountain or something, I can't just move a corner here and make a mountain. I'm gonna need a lot of more vertices, a lot of more geometry. So I'm gonna go into edit mode and hit A to select everything and I'm gonna subdivide it a bunch of times. You can also come here and increase the number of cuts, but I just find it more fun just to right click and hit subdivide a bunch of times. Now you want to be careful not to add too much. In super hyper realistic scenes, you're gonna have a lot of vertices, but we're gonna be putting this into the browser. We should be careful about how many vertices we are adding. Now there is no set number of vertices that leads to good or lower performances, but one thing that you can be sure of is the more geometry it has, the bigger the file size is going to be. So the initial load will at least be longer regardless. And if you want to see your statistics, go back into object mode, come up here and check statistics. 
And now you can see the statistics of your entire scene. So we have this many vertices, this many edges, this many faces, and this many triangles. Now, if you don't like it sh showing up here, you can also see it down here in the bottom right. And if you don't see it in the bottom right, you can just right click and check mark scene statistics. And if you select your object and you go into edit mode, you can see how many vertices, edges, and faces that particular thing is contributing. So, you know, if I select my house, go into tab, you can see it's 1,380 vertices. And if I go to my plane, it's 2,401. And if we go back into object mode, you combine those, you're going to get whatever number that added up to. And it will also show you how many you select. So here I selected 65 vertices. All right, so I think I want to subdivide my plane one more time. So let's go into object mode and subdivide it. And I have 9,409 vertices or 18,432 triangles. You can see that in the... All right, let's actually start editing our landscape. So I'm gonna select my stuff, go into edit mode, and there's really no right or wrong way to approach this manually landscaping. So I'm going to show you some of the tools that I'll be using, and then you can work on your own landscape. Now, I don't really have a reference image, so I'm just going to try things until I get something that I like. A lot of this is just trial and error. So the first one is probably the most obvious. You can just select some vertices and then hit GZ and move them up. Uh, I also like to use proportional editing when I'm moving vertices manually. So you can come up here and select that, or you can just hit O on your keyboard. And the most common one I'm going to be using is smooth. And you can just see it says smooth fall off, but in real time, you can actually see what it does. So this gray circle is the sphere of influence, and you can change it with your middle mouse button. And you can see in real time what it's affecting and what it's not and so on and so forth. So, you know, maybe I just want a little, a little incline here, like so. And, you know, if you select something smaller, it's going to be smaller, like so. And yeah, you can get some nice variations with that, like so. And you might want to experiment with some of these other falloffs, like random. So if I randomly do it, it's gonna randomly select vertices around in the sphere of influence and just adjust them. And another really thing, fun thing to do is using the circle tool. So I, I go into top view, hit C on your keyboard, and you can just click and drag to use the circle tool and it'll just select everything. And if, and if you wanna deselect things, you can just hold shift and, and left mouse button and you can just undo everything. You can also click down on your middle mouse button to deselect as well. And you can also use it to change what you wanna select. Like so, you can see if I move in and out, we do that. And if you wanna get out of the circle tool, you can just right click and get out of it. Or you can come here and change it to select box. You can also do select lasso. You pretty much like draw a lasso. If you're familiar with Photoshop, it's kind of the same thing here. And I'm gonna click and hold and change it back to select box. So let's just select some vertices and I'll just move them up. And you can see an issue here, right? So this is very blocky. And, and this is one reason why I like to add a basic texture in advance. So I can see how it looked like in rendered mode before I actually start applying actual textures. And you can see it looks kind of weird and that's because we don't have enough geometry. So, you know, just to prove this, if I add a subdivision surface modifier, which just subdivides your mesh a bunch and crank it up, you can see if I go back into rendered mode, that blockiness is completely vanished and it actually looks like some decent terrain. Now it's all about a trial and error. so. If it works good in the browser, definitely go for it. I'm gonna temporarily get rid of that. The other thing I also wanna do is right click and change it to shade smooth instead of shade flat. And that also helps a lot. So remember it's a shift back tick and then tab to go into gravity mode. And you can kind of just walk around and see how it looks. Now, remember how that texture was completely repeating? Well, we only moved a few vertices and you can already tell it's almost it's getting very difficult to tell that the textures are repeating. Now let's talk a little bit about some sculpting tools. Now we don't have enough geometry to do high detailed sculpting 
but we do have enough where sculpting tools will actually help us a lot. So I'm going to go with this selected. I'm going to go into sculpting tab. So by default, you're going to be in the draw tool and you can just click and drag your mouse around and draw whatever you want to see what it does. And isn't that pretty cool? So you are a sculpting already. You're already sculpting some landscape. Now you can change the strength up here as well as the radius. So, you know, like so. Or if you want to quickly do it, you can use shift F on your keyboard and move your mouse left and right to change the strength. So now I have a strength of one and it's really going there. It's really powerful. And if you want to change the, the radius, hotkey is just F and you can see it's the same thing except it's with F and shift F. So what is this curve here? Well, that's just the fall off. And like we did with proportional editing, you can change the fall off here. Like so. You can also come into the active tool and workspace settings at the top when you're in sculpt mode. And you can see the fall off here as well and a bunch of more settings on the right here. Now, if you want to do the reverse of an option, so right now I'm drawing. If you want to do the reverse of the option, so if you want to undraw pretty much, you can hit control and you can see that is undrawing. It's actually like undrawing the opposites of drawing. So I guess oh, we can try some other tool that's more evident. So here is clay strips. So you can see I'm drawing some clay strips and over here I'll just do control. And now you can see it's digging into my mesh. And the other one, that I'll be using a lot is grab. So it's what it sounds like. You pretty much grab some vertices and you can just kind of pull it. So, you know, this is really helpful if you just want to like grab a huge area and just kind of lift it up without actually sculpting. And another really common thing, let me actually go back to clay strips and add some clay strips is the smooth tool. So right here, so it's one of these, yeah, this one right here. And if you smooth it, you can see when you click and drag, it actually smooths out those vertices and it looks a lot more smooth. Now, this is actually so common that Blender has a default setting for it. If you're on another tool, so if I'm on clay strips and I'm drawing, you can just hold shift and it'll activate the smooth tool for you. So that's pretty helpful, very helpful, very fast and so on and so forth. And of course, you can also change the strength of your smooth tool so it doesn't completely smooth out. If you want to learn more, go to the documents and they actually tell you what the vertices are doing. So you can see draw moving vertices inwards or outward based on average normal. And the other one we did smooth, you can see by averaging positions of the vertices, et cetera, et cetera. So one last word of warning, and it's just be careful not to like over sculpt or overdo the sculpting because we don't actually have that much geometry. So you can see when I keep sculpting here, the geometry is getting worse and worse because all it's doing really is changing these vertices. Now, Blender does have this thing called Dynatopo that actually adds geometry while you're sculpting, but I don't want to use that because I want to keep my landscape pretty low poly. Yeah, so now it's just your time to be creative and experiment with the tools and just try out some new things, you know. And most importantly, make sure you are having fun doing it. And I'll leave you here and I'll see you on the other side. All right, I finished sculpting my landscape here. And you know, you can still edit it. So if I go into edit mode and I want like a flat space here, I can just circle, circle select with C area here so I'm just gonna select some there and I'll do SZ0 just to flatten that area out there all right so sculpting can take a long time it depends on how much time you want to spend on it so I only spent a few minutes on mine but usually if it's gonna be something high quality I spent quite a few quite a few hours all right so the user is going to be on the ground here and if you enter walk mode with shift back tick and tab to enter gravity mode you can see we can never see the landscape on the other side of this wall it would be useless to keep it there so let's go back into the layout tab to do this 
And with this selected, I'm going to enter edit mode. Let's go into top view with numpad seven. And then I'm going to hit C for the circle tool. And I just want to select all the visible faces. So like so. Now you don't have to be too accurate here. All right, I'm going to right click to exit my circle. And then I'm going to hit control I on my keyboard to invert the selection. And it looks like we didn't select this one. So I'm going to hit shift and click and drag. Whoops, sorry, control and click and drag to deselect that. And that looks good. We might have to delete some more there, but now we can just hit X and delete the faces. So this is our new landscape. And now you can see with deleting all those faces, we dropped down from like 9,000 vertices to like 5,000. So you could add, you know, more geometry to this if you wanted to since we got rid of a lot so you know we can add a subdivision surface modifier and you can see everything looks a lot more clear and then you can apply it with Control a if you wanted to and now you can see everything's a lot more dense but i'm going to undo that because if it looks good as a low poly model there i don't think there's that much reason to add more geometry of course if you need more geometry to make complex stuff like a path for example, if I want to make a path here, I probably couldn't because these squares are just so big and it would just look so weird trying to make a path going up this hill. Like I said earlier, there's really no set amount of vertices where performance issues are going to kick in. It really depends on a lot of factors. So definitely export frequently and test frequently. But I do export a lot of times throughout my development cycle. Okay, I think I deleted all the faces and oh, whoops, it looks like when we inverted our selection, we actually didn't select this. So it selected it for us. So I'm just going to select these edges, hit F to fill them. All right, so that's better. Next thing I want to do is texture the landscape. You can see this screenshot from like the super old Skyrim that there is a texture on the landscape for the path. And we're going to be drawing this with a texture paint. So to prepare that, we need to go into the shading tab and add a second material to our landscape. So make sure you have your landscape material selected. And what I'm going to do is select my principal BSDF and shift D to duplicate it. I'm going to do the same thing as we did before control shift T and navigate to a texture. The one I'm going to be using is rocks 006 from ambient CG. All right, so same thing, normal roughness color. And let's set that up. And let's go to rendered mode here. Actually, let's just stick with material preview for now. All right, and I'm going to move this like so, and I will move this one out as well. So we can't see this because it's not connected to the material output. And the way we can mix two materials is with a mix node. So all you have to do is shift a search and do mix. And we want the mix shader node. And now I want to hook this up here. So let me control spacebar to see this a little bit better. We are connecting the principal BSDF to this shader node and this one to this top shader node. And then we can connect this shader thing here back into the surface material output. Let me do control space bar to go back. And now you can see our texture is actually a combination of the rocks 006 and our landscape. This factor slider here determines what we see more of. So if I turn it to completely zero, you can see that it's completely the top texture, which is our rock texture. And if I turn it completely to one, we get this texture right here, which is our original landscape, which I forgot. I think it was like grass something. Okay, but we have a problem because right now it's uniform across the entire landscape. So how do we determine where we want one texture and where we want another? So if you remember from chapter one, I had just have a roughness one here open for the grass path material that is this one here. If you remember from chapter one, this 
roughness image texture tells our image texture where to be more rough and where to be less rough by using different grayscale values. So the darker the area in that image texture, the lower the roughness is going to be. And the wider the area in the roughness texture, it's going to signify more roughness in that area of the texture. So we're going to use this same exact concept. We're going to make a grayscale image texture and everywhere that is going to be dark is going to be one texture and everywhere that's more lighter is going to be more of that other material. All right. So let's move this to the left just for some more space. I'm going to hit control space bar just to maximize it. And I'll do shift a and search and I'll add an image texture here and I'll create a new one by clicking new here. So let me just zoom in new and I will make it 4k. So I'm going to click and drag down to get select both of them and multiply by four. And I'll call this blend, but you can call it whatever you want. And I think the defaults are going to be fine here. So I'll just click OK. Instead of this default slider here that uniformly changes it, we're going to use this image texture here and we're going to plug it into there. So now it's using this image to determine where our textures are going to be. So I'm going to hit control space bar to unmaximize this. And just for a more visual sense, I want to show you the same exact concept except more visually in some other softwares. So this is from Substance Painter and you can see they have these things called layer masks that are grayscale images and you can see everywhere that's white is going to be one thing and everywhere that's black is going to be one thing and the colors in between black and white are going to be a blend of the two things. Same thing with Photoshop here as well. Everywhere that is black is going to be one thing and everywhere that's going to be white is going to be another thing. Blender, it just doesn't actually really seem like that because we have these complicated nodes, but that's essentially all we're doing with these nodes. All right, so make sure you have that blend image that we created and go to texture paint. Now our image that we created, if you don't see it, you can navigate to it. We called it blend. It's completely black and that's why this entire surface here is black. So by default, if you come up to the workspace tools up here and by default, your first color is going to be white and your secondary color is going to be black. If you want to paint the secondary color, you can just hit control and click to drag. All right, so let's start painting. So I'm going to click and drag on my mesh to paint. And look, we actually get a really bad error. And if you remember from chapter one, we scaled these UVs really big. So essentially, when there's no more image texture left, what it does is just repeats itself, right? So we just painted it on our blend image right here, right? So it's going to repeat the texture. It's going to repeat that same exact blob here. It's going to repeat that same exact blob here, here, and so on and so forth. And that's exactly what we see here. So I'm going to hit Control Z to undo that. So instead of scaling the landscape's UV, we're going to scale the texture instead. So I'm going to go back into my shading tab and I'm going to select my landscape. I'm going to hit tab. I'm going to hit A to select everything. I'm going to hit U and unwrap. Okay, so we unwrapped our landscape and you can see we get those big rocks again. So what we can do, I'm going to go to the rock one since that's on the top and that's what we're seeing. We're going to come to that mapping node they gave us and we're going to actually scale up the texture instead. So I'm going to click and drag down here. And I'll change it to a size, a scale that I like. So 25. And sure, that doesn't look too bad. If you can imagine when we paint on our blend texture, let's imagine we're painting right here. It's not going to repeat over here because the image isn't repeating. The entire blend image is not repeating because we're not off the image. But instead, it's just the texture within the image that is repeating itself. So if we go back to texture paint, and I'm on white, and if I start drawing, you can see we don't get that issue anymore. You can also see it shows straight up here in our UV editor as well. So this is also a UV editor that they give us by default. So you can also paint directly on the UV if you want, and you can see it happen here in real time. Now the basic hotkeys are very similar to sculpting, so it's F to change the size and shift F to change the strength. So right now we're currently in solid mode. So you can actually just go straight to material preview 
And now you can see in real time, everywhere that we paint it white is going to be that bottom texture. And everywhere that is black is going to be that gravel texture. So I'm going to undo those paintings real quick. And I'm going to go back into the shading tab. And I actually want to switch these positions. So now everything that I paint white is going to be the gravel. And everything, everything that's black is going to be that default landscape. And I also forgot to change the scale of this thing as well. So let's just choose the same scale to see if it works. And it does. So technically, you could just have one mapping node for both of these. But in the event that you want a different scale for one of them, you can just leave it as so. All right, let's go back into texture painting. All right, so I'm going to turn up my strength back to, I don't know, maybe like 0.93. And I'm just going to start painting my path where I want it. And remember, if you want to paint black, you can just hit control and it'll paint the secondary color that you have here instead, which for me, it's going to be black. And change your stuff, change your strength if you want it a little more subtle. And you can just keep going over it to make it stronger and stronger. And, you know, if you want to and if you want to add some blocking out. So I actually completely skipped this step. But essentially, it's just using primitive objects to kind of get a feel for the composition of your scene. You could also just duplicate the house that we made a bunch of times. But if you want to, you know, just make some random shapes to try and block out your scene so you can get a feel of where you want to place things. Usually this happens at the complete start, but I completely skipped over it because I usually don't do it that often. And the last thing I want to mention is if you go into rendered mode, you might not actually see the painting here. In this case, I actually do. And you can't ask actually either real time paint here either and see it change. And that's because you have to save your image. So you can come up here and save your image or you can just hit Alt S to save it. And in this case, I never saved it initially. So it's going to prompt me to save it somewhere. So I'm just going to save it here. So now whenever I paint, I can't see it in rendered mode, but it's showing up here. I have to hit Alt S to save it and it still doesn't pop up because it needs time to reload. So you can go back into solid mode and then go back into rendered mode. And now you can see my painted texture is showing up there. So I usually just stick to material preview. Okay, but what if you want to paint a third texture instead? Well, can you go back into the shading tab and figure it out? Well, if you can't, don't worry, because I'll show you right now. So I'm going to get a little more organized. I'm going to highlight all of this and hit Control J on my keyboard. So now I can just move this stuff instead. And this what this does, it just creates this as a frame. And if you want to separate something, you can hit Alt P and it'll be outside of the frame. Or you can just click and drag it back and now it's backed into the frame. And I'm going to do the same thing here. So I'm going to box select, shift, box select again, control J. And now I can just move the frame out and make it a little more organized. Okay, so the process is exactly the same. I'm going to shift D, duplicate this. I'm going to hit Alt P to separate it. And I'm going to bring it up here, but you can organize your node tree however you want. And the same thing again, control shift T. Another texture, rocks ground 06 from Polyhaven. And I'm just going to principle texture set up that. And we need to mix this. So shift D to duplicate that mix node. Uh, let me increase this up so we can see it. And let's hook this up to the top. And for this shader one, we're going to put it to the bottom here. And then we're going to put it into this here. So we're missing one more thing. And that's another image texture to put it in here. And I'm going to hit X and I'm going to create a new one. And it's essentially just like adding another layer in Photoshop for Substance Painter. So, you know, we can just call it layer mask, layer mask. And yeah, I'm just going to bring that up again. And it's the same exact process. Hit OK. Cool. All right. So don't forget to change the scale to get something reasonable. So let's see, 25 maybe. The same thing. Make sure this is selected. And you go into texture paint and voila. Now you can see when I paint, it's going to show the bottom one. And if you want the other one, if you want it to work the other way, you can just flip it. And now you can see if I go back 
with this one selected into texture paint you can see everywhere I paint is going to have that rocky texture instead. Now you can also, instead of having to go back to the material every single time, you can just see right here and switch between them right on here. So I want to switch to blend. So now I'm going to be painting rocks and now I want to switch here. So I'm going to be painting these stone like things. And also don't forget to save your image. So make sure to save it with Alt S now I can just hit Alt S whenever I want to save it. So I just uh, drew my basic initial gravel path onto the ground here, like you can see. But now I want to talk about a little more concepts that we can help use to spice up our landscape. But before we continue, let's organize our node tree a little bit better. So what you'll see often are node groups. So you can just highlight the ones that you want to put in a node group and hit Control G. Now, now you can see the directory we're in our landscape material, but now we're in this node group. And if you want to get out of this node group, you can just hit tab and you can see everything that we highlighted is now into in this node group here. So you can hit tab to enter it and a tab to exit it. So like so. And if you want to get rid of this node group here, you can just right click and do ungroup or you can see the hotkey right there. Control Alt G. Control Alt G and now you can see they are out of group. So I'm going to leave those grouped, hit tab and I'm going to group these as well. So Control G, tab, get out of there. So our things are looking a lot more organized. Now I want to talk about one of the most important concepts and probably the most common one as well when it comes to texturing. So here's just a random picture. And if someone asked you what color is that grass, you would say green. But if you take a look at it, it's all the same grass, right? But throughout the entire thing, there are many, many different shades of green. Of course, this is affected by things by lighting and so on and so forth. But it's also common just to straight up add those color variations into your textures. If we go back to Blender, let's go to the one that has our landscape material. And I think it's this one. So you can also name your node groups, which I haven't been doing because I was being lazy. So I'm going to call this one landscape so I know what that one's for. And then remember, it's a tab to enter there. So this is the output color in our principal BSDF for the landscape material. So we want to mix this base color with another color. So for so to create a color, I'm going to shift a S to search and I'm going to search for a color ramp node. This node has a lot of uses, but for us, we're just going to use it to create some colors and we can't see it because it's not being put into the material output. So what you can do is hit control shift T and click on it. And if we exit out of our group, you can see it puts it into a viewer node. It looks a little bit weird because our all our stuff is in a node group. So I'm going to temporarily get rid of it with control Alt G. And you can see what happens here. The one that I control shift T, its color output is going into this thing called a viewer node. And it's putting it into the material output. So now we are just seeing this color ramp. So like we already know, the factor thing here, if I change it to one, it's going to be completely white in this case. And if I change it to zero, it's going to be completely black because those are the colors there. And if you want to go back to the entire thing, you can just hit control shift and click on your mix shader, your final mix shader to hook it quickly, hook it up back again. Okay. So I'm going to regroup these. So luckily we put them in a frame so we don't have to worry about clicking. Oh, this is not in the frame. So I'm just going to, whoops, it's going to auto hook up there. So yeah. All right. Let's group these back to that together with control G. And if we want to mix this color with our other color, we can use a mix RGB node. So shift a search and mix RGB this time. And likewise, let's put the color in color two and the color to this base color and the color here. And likewise, we also have that factory slider. I'm at zero. We see this entire gray color because it's at the center here. And if we are at one, 
we're going to see the entire landscape here. Right. So to add some color variation, I'm just going to click on this thing here to select this ticker. And I'm going to select this color and just change it to a similar color. So I like to just use the eyedropper tool and find a color that I like. So you can just click anywhere, but I'm just going to click directly on my landscape. And now you can see it's that color. And then I can just tweak it to get something that I like. Same thing for this one as well. So I'm just going to tweak it and I'm going to pick a lighter point here this time. Whoops, I didn't select that one. So I'm going to select this one and same thing. And I'm just going to eyedropper some cool. So currently it's not that cool because all we're doing is uniformly blending between a solid color, which in this case is somewhere here with our image texture. So this is pretty much no difference than if you just add the RGB curves that we covered earlier and just tweaked the RGB values there, you'd get the same exact result. So question for you, how do you think we can determine where we want one color and where we want another color? It was a little bit of a trick question because let me exit this group. And if you remember, it's because right here we had that factor slider and to determine where we wanted one color slash texture and where we wanted another one, we used an image texture to paint those, those grayscale images. But if you're not familiar with Blender, Blender actually has built in textures that we can use that generate these grayscale images to determine where each texture goes. But let me go back into my node group. I'm going to hit tab to enter there. Okay, so let's add a noise texture. So shift a search and I'm going to search for noise texture. I'm going to put it up here. And I think I want it in the group. Whoops. And with this factor, I'm going to put it in this factor. And if I go into material preview and you can see when I change some of the options on this noise texture, we're getting those color variations throughout our scene, right? So if you remember to preview this noise texture, you can hit control shift and click on it. And now you can see that grayscale image across our entire landscape. And you can play with these sliders just to, you know, just have some fun. So you might be asking, what is noise? So on Wikipedia here, I have the most famous kind of noise called Perlin noise. I highly recommend if you're interested in web graphics to read about Perlin noise because it's one of the most popular no types of noise. And how does it work? Well, it's just a bunch of math. So instead of painting the black and white areas, we are using math to generate those black and white areas. All right, let me go back out into the tab and I'm going to control shift T to see this back. And then let's enter our node group back again. Now there is a problem because right now we do have some color variations in the landscape, but what we're blending is still a solid color with our image texture. So what we can do, I'm going to select my noise texture, shift D to duplicate this, and I'm going to plug the factor for the noise texture into the factor for the color ramp. So if we use the same exact concept as usual, so our noise texture is generating black and white areas. And the more black it is, the more of this color is going to be. And the more white it is, it's going to be this color. We are generating it with math. So if you change this, you can see our color variations are changing. And if you want a little more brightness, you can click and drag this up here. And if you want a little more dark stuff, you can click and drag this up here. Of course, if you think the color variation is too much, you can just adjust it. All right, so remember, if you want to see one of them, you can just click this and hit mute without it. And that's what our color looks like before, but I want to switch this so by default it's going to preview the top one and now i can hit mute again and you can see this is what our landscape is before we mixed with this and i'm going to hit m and now you can see what it looks like before and after and you can really see just a simple setup like that already makes our landscape look a lot better and a lot more natural all right so what if we want a little more control on how this noise texture is blending well, we can do that with a color ramp. So I'm going to shift a search for a color ramp and I'm just going to hook it up right here. And you can see what happens here when I increase the white. 
you can see we're going to see more of this this here and if i increase the black i'm going to see more of this stuff here which is just our plain image texture but now look what happens when we bring up the black and the white as well so we are now controlling kind of like the transition the smoothness between the two things that we're mixing so how does this even make sense well, the noise texture by default is generating values between completely black and completely white. So when we added this initial color ramp, nothing actually changed on our texture. So our noise texture is pretty much, you can think, just a sampling from a bunch of these areas, right? And then it's just putting it into our mix node. Once we move the black one here, everything below that becomes black. So all these original samples are going to be 100% black. So hopefully that clears up why when we drag the black and white sliders closer to each other, the things are a lot more noticeable because the cause of the gradual transition between one of the colors and the other color, or in this case, it's going to be an image, is because of the varying grayscale values that we can sample from. But since they are so close to each other, we're pretty much only selecting either black or either white. So that's why you get this extremely hard fall off here. All right. And before we end this chapter, I just want to add one more image texture in my landscape material. So I'm going to shift a search for an image texture and just place it here. And of course, we're going to need another mixed node. So I'm going to put that there as well. And it's all purple right now, and that's what happens when you don't have anything here or the file is missing. In this case, we just don't have anything, so I'm going to navigate to texture. And you can see when we use the factor slider, it's going to be going to this one or this one. And if you want to control this, you can just hit Control T. Remember for the mapping nodes and adjusting the scale here, like so. Or since we already have the same exact one, we can undo that. And we can just reuse the other one that we have for the grass path to image texture and just plug it up there. And you can see that does the same exact thing. And we can do the same exact thing for the factor here instead. We can just reuse what we already have if you wanted to. Or you can just duplicate these or and adjust it as well. So we can just plug it in here and just change some things up. Congratulations, you've created your first landscape. So we learned a little bit about texture painting, some sculpting, and a little more on the texturing techniques. And if you want more technical explanations of the nodes, you can check out this second link here, which he actually talks about the math behind the mix node specifically, but there are a lot of other videos explaining the math behind other nodes. And the first one, I mean, you can watch it if you want, but it's just to highlight that you can use many other different techniques to have the same exact outcome that we did. And you might like one technique versus the technique that I showed you. So that is also your option. Of course, these are just two areas to guide you. There are lots of other great tutorials on more texturing techniques that you can use and more advanced concepts. Hey, welcome to chapter three. In this chapter, we're gonna create a second scene, a basic interior for a house. We're going to cover some more UV concepts and then we're going to bake some image textures, the colors with the lightings and the normals. So let's start making an interior for our home. So if you remember, we created a non-joined collection before we joined the house. So just navigate to that collection and make it show up again. So mine's right here. It's called Breeze Home Textured and I can just open it, click on one of the things here and just hit period key on my numpad to focus there and to make the interior it's actually really simple i just want this roof object here and this base so i'm going to select both of them i'm going to hit shift d duplicate and gx and just move it out then with both of them selected i'm going to move them to a new collection and you can just put it wherever you want i'm going to put it into my breeze home collection then i can hide back up my unjoined one all right and since we're going to be inside of this house we won't actually see this outer edge of this thing, right? So it would be kind of useless just to leave it there. So, you know, it's really low poly, so we don't actually have to remove it. But, you know, it's good optimization when you need it. So I'm going to hit Control 7 on my numpad. 
actually, I want to hit slash on my numpad to go into local view, and then control seven to go to the bottom view. Remember seven is top view. So control seven is going to be the bottom view, I'm going to enter edit mode. And I'm just going to select these faces. So I'm just going to go with C to get select tool. And I'm just going to select those interfaces, right click to cancel. And I think I got all of them that will be visible from inside P and separate by selection. So it's its own stuff. And then I'll just click the outer ones and delete them. And here you can see that we have our roof that we'll see and that's only one. Then we can exit local view with our numpad slash. And yeah, looking good. So just to make sure we can't really tell, I'm going to go into fly mode with a shift back tick, hit shift and just go inside and take a look at it. And, and yeah, there are no noticeable issues with this. Uh, I guess you can see there's kind of like clipping here, so we can adjust this a little bit, a little bit better if we wanted to, to just bring it outside of the house there. So we just don't see that issue inside. But again, it doesn't really matter too much because no one's going to be paying that close attention. And we also need a floor. So I'm going to select this one right here. And I'm just going to select these edges. So two to edge select, fill that up. And same thing with here. I'm going to select these two. I'm going to hit F and that will be our floor. So of course, our textures are going to be a little bit scuffed for these ones. So let's go into our shading tab. Let's hit period key to focus at. Let's go into material preview and let's fix up our textures real quick. So I'm going to hit a tab on this roof, hit A to select everything. U smart UV project, maybe give it some island margin. doesn't really matter. And I'm just going to scale it up. And of course, we also have this bottom issue here as well, because we created those services. Now that might look fine for you if you want it, but we can also change it. So I'm going to hit control seven to view it from the bottom. And with these selected, we can just do U and unwrap it. And now you can see it's fixed. And then we can just scale it up to get that resolution that we want there. And of course, you know, just like how we did the other ones, if I select this, I can rotate it, let's say 90. And there we have our floor. And now since we're going to be inside, what I want to do is add a bunch of lights. So I'm just going to temporarily hide this with H. And now I can just shift right click and add lights how you like. So you know, there's really no right or wrong way to do this. Just have fun experimenting. So shift A and you can add a light. Maybe I'll add an area light just for some ambience. Um, sure, why not? S Y. Just kind of fill it in where I want some focus. And just to see our lighting, let's go into rendered mode actually. So I'm gonna go into rendered mode. And our HDRI is affecting this because, you know, our roof doesn't exist. So, you know, we could put it like this and go inside to take a look, or we can just temporarily, you know, mute our world lighting. So I'm gonna go into the shading tab. Let's go to world. And remember, you need to check use nodes if you don't see them. And then we can just select the background and we can turn this to zero, but, or we can just hit M to mute it. So let's go back to layout. Now you can see we only see our area lights. So I really like this effect. And I think that ambient light is enough. So what I'm going to do is just add some orange point lights to act like a you know, like a lamp. So if we wanted to model a lamp, we could just put it next there and then we can just add some nice little orange there. And I'm just going to move it around with a shifty and duplicating them. Now, of course you can light your scene however you want. You know, there is really no right or wrong way to do it. Yeah. So once you're done lighting your interior, you can rehide your roof and you can also go back into shading and unmute this with hitting M. Let's go back into layout. Let's hit shift back tick to walk, shift to speed up and just go inside and make sure we're not seeing anything. Now you do notice that some light of the HDRI is kind of leaking in into the house. And that's obviously because our walls aren't close enough, right? So, you can fix it, you know, obviously just by closing 
that stuff. But actually, I think it's really realistic because old time homes, you know, they have a lot of issues with their stuff. So, you know, I think it's actually realistic to have some of that lighting in the gaps there. We're going to start baking our textures to export them into and use them in 3GS. So if you don't know what baking is, you can read more about it here. But baking is essentially the process of saving a bunch of data into a texture itself. So one of the most common ones is lighting data. For example, if I add a light here, you'll see that this light is influencing my landscape, obviously. And if I move it, it changes in real time. So this is real time lighting. And essentially light and lighting behind the scenes is just a bunch of mathematical calculations. So if you have a low performing computer, of course, lighting is going to make your computer lag. It's going to take more effort to do all those mathematical calculations. So the idea behind baking is to save that data straight into the image without actually needing that real time calculation. And this is a really common technique, especially when you have static scenes. So things that aren't moving, you know, if your lighting isn't going to be changing, if it's not going to be dynamic, if it's not going to be moving, then you might as well just bake that lighting texture. So you don't need to do those real time calculations. So I have a bunch of site of the months here. So I have this one from Getty. I have this one here and I also have this one here and these three one side of the month. And if I go into their network tab, usually image textures with baked in lighting are going to be WebP. And the reason it's going to be WebP format instead of something like JPEG or PNG is because WebP usually has the smallest file size while still retaining a decent amount of quality. So here, if I type a WebP and just take a look here, you can actually kind of see it already. So here, let me go into light map right here. Now, light maps are a little bit different, but some people use baked textures and light map interchangeably when they're two different things. But here it looks like just a baked texture. But anyway, here you can just imagine this is a baked texture. Here you can see the shadows and you know, the lighting never changes in this entire scene. So, you know, you can just bake the shadows. So somewhere on here is probably this shadow that you see right here. It's probably somewhere on here. Uh, obviously, we're not going to be looking through all of them, but you know, you can see all the textures that they have here. Let's go to the unconventional gallery and you can also see here. It's the same thing. Their lighting never changes. You know, this beam of sunlight is, you know, probably in blender or something and they just bake that in right into the texture. So if we also search here for WebP, oops, WebP, and we can just kind of find something. Here you can see some of their other image textures. And, you know, generally it's probably going to be one of the bigger ones. Oh, never mind, we found them anyway. And here you can just see, imagine this is just a bunch of boxes. They unwrapped it, it's on a UV plane, and then they baked all that lighting. So you can see all the lighting right here. And yeah, actually right here, you can see that beam of ray there. So, you know, it's one of these rays, but we don't know which one. Of course, uh, another one, same thing here. If we search up WebP, we can actually kind of find what they did. You can see they have their normal WebPs as well. And yeah, you can see all of them look pretty much the same. So since we're in the topic of a network tab, I might as well talk about some of the tips and tricks I use when analyzing awards winning websites. So I might have mentioned this earlier, but the most common format is going to be GLB and GLTF for their 3D models. So if you search up GLB or GLTF, you'll probably find some of them. So here in this case, we actually do have a GLB. So Let's download this and take a look at how it looks. So I'm going to right click on here and I'm just going to hit open in new tab. And I'm just going to save it and let's go back into Blender. I'm just going to create a new file. And sure, I'll just save that old one. So I'll go into file import. 
gltf slash glb navigate to that download that I just have right here and click it and take a look. Now we can see their glb file. So they have this gigantic atmosphere sphere here. So, you know, those that background is probably just one sphere texture there. So let's just delete that. But let's take a look at their glb file. So here we have that text, we have those arches, and you can go into edit mode and just, you know, just take a look at things, you know, and you can really learn a lot about, you know, what they're doing and how they do it and so on and so forth. So, you know, so, you know, let's just do it for another site. Let's see here. Let's look up GLB. And yeah, we got some GLBs here. So I'm just going to open a new tab, do the same exact thing and import that. And you can take a look here. And yeah, you can see we have exactly what they created here. We have our snake of section one and so on. So you can imagine if we go into rendered mode, shift A, and let's just add a sunlight. And you can see when I rotate the sun, take a look at that. We got that little beam there that they do. So, you know, you really can learn a lot just by looking at what other people do and how they do it. So, and if you watched my previous tutorial, you can, you know, make a curve that goes around here and just moves the camera along the curve. And if you want to adjust the rotation, you can create another curve over here with a dummy vector that follows along this curve. And you can just make the camera look at that on each curve. So, you know, it's really, really easy to kind of see how to create awards winning websites. And if you want to look hard enough, which I don't really recommend, you can try and find the texture for this GLB file and attach it. So maybe one of these, maybe this one and attach it into the one in Blender. So, you know, give it that image texture just to see how it looks. Yeah, but one thing I do want to point out before we get to it, and you'll understand why in a little bit, if I go to the UV editing tab and I select this, hit tab to enter edit mode, A to select everything. And you can see that looks exactly like ours. We just scaled our UVs on our texture how we wanted them. Now there is one issue. If you remember when we looked at the textures in the browser, all of them are only square, right? This issue here, we can't bake all this data when it looks like this. So the idea here, if you go into their object data properties and go into UV maps, you can actually see a second UV map here. And if I click on this, you'll see what their UVs have changed into. It's changed into this, which all fits into one texture. So if we bake all the data into this texture, then we can use it into 3GS. So you can imagine the first UV map is like if you were chaotically wrapping Christmas gifts, you know, like a bunch of cubes, a bunch of gift presents under the Christmas tree. If you're wrapping a bunch of gifts and, you know, it's kind of chaotic. You got wrapping paper everywhere. You know, some look like some things, some things look like other things. But by the end of it, everything is neatly wrapped up and everything is cleared up. You know, and there's no extra stuff. Right. So you only have your textured boxes or, you know, you wrap presents. And that's kind of the point of the second map. So you can actually use it. Now that's just an analogy. So hopefully it helps, or maybe it just made some things more confusing, but yeah, we will be doing the same exact thing. Now it would be kind of tedious to have to open Blender and import the GLB file every single time that you want to inspect something. So luckily for us, a lot of great people created some really convenient tools. So here is gltf.report if you want to go to that one. Now there are a lot of other ones you can try, so definitely explore, but this one is really convenient. So here I have a set of the day one, I download their GLB file. All I can do is just click and drag this in here and it'll load in the GLB file. And here you can see we have the track that my car is currently on and we have all that other stuff and we can just you know quickly take a look. Yeah, so I kind of got sidetracked talking about the network tab, but yeah, I just wanted to, my entire point was that baking is a really common thing to do, especially in static scenes where nothing is moving, the light isn't moving, there aren't moving objects and so on and so forth. All right, so we actually already have a joined house here, but just for the sake of completeness, I'm gonna delete this one and I'm gonna go into my other one and show it again. 
and let's go into wireframe and duplicate it shift D GX and let's move it into that new collection so again you can put it wherever you want it doesn't really matter and let's just hide the old one so now we want to join all of these now the reason why you want to join all of them is an optimization technique to reduce GPU draw call. So they're kind of technical. So I'll give you a very, very high level analogy that might not even be technically correct. But imagine for each of these objects, every time you downloaded one of these or created one of these, you had to restart your computer. So I made this, I have to restart my computer, and then I have to read this, and then I have to restart my computer, and so on and so forth. So you can imagine each of these are like a GPU draw call for each of these objects. So the idea when joining objects, all of it acts as one object. So, you know, you don't have to keep restarting your PC every time you make one, you just draw it once and it's over. Again, that is a very, very high level, non-technical explanation of why we want to join our objects. But before we join objects, we want to make sure nothing is going to affect things when we join them. So the first one is going to be scale. So if I go into wireframe, select all of them, let's hit control A and apply our scale. And nothing breaks because I think we already did it beforehand. So that's good. And the next thing we want to fix, you can also fix this after we rejoin them, but it's easier just to do it when the objects are separate. So I'm gonna come up here and click face orientation. And what face orientation does, it shows you the direction of the normals. Everything that you want to work properly when you like viewing it, you want it to be blue. So here you can see these are red. So we can select them, all of them. Whoops. Select all the red stuff. And oh, that is joined with those, which is why we have to select it like that. Okay, so let's just select these ones first. Let's hit a tab to enter edit mode, A to select everything, then hit F3, and then hit flip, and flip normals. And now everything is blue, which is what we want. Now the hotkey for that is Alt N, so if I hit Alt N, you can see I flip. Now there are also these other things like recalculate outside and inside, which can also be handy sometimes. So let me do, let me undo those changes, and I'm just going to chaotically select everything that I can see. Yeah, I think that's everything that I want to flip. And I can hit Alt N. Whoops, edit mode, hit A to select everything. Alt N and recalculate outside. And you can see it does all of that for us. We don't have to manually flip our faces. Now it won't always work, but for us it does. And Blender does a nice job of determining outside. Yeah, so everything that we see on the outside is blue. So that's good. And now we can join them. So let's turn this off. Let's go into wireframe, select everything. Make sure you don't select anything back there by accident. And it doesn't really matter which one is the active object, but I'm gonna make it the base. I'm gonna hit Control J to join it. So now it's one of its own objects. All right, so let's, with this selected, let's go into the UV editing tab. And you can see when I select it, and you know, our messed up UVs that are kind of everywhere, rotated and so on and so forth, just like theirs. So let's create a second UV map. So if you go into object data properties and come here to UV maps, and you can hit this plus icon here. Then with this one highlighted here, make sure to hit A to select everything here. Then you can hit U, smart UV project, maybe give it an island margin and just hit okay. Now you can see all our UVs fit into that square. So we can bake all that lighting information onto this here, and then we can use it in 3GS or you know other game engines as well. Now like everything, UV unwrapping isn't gonna be so easy. So this is actually a really bad unwrap. And the reason it's bad is because we aren't using all this empty space. So let's imagine this square is 2048 pixels by 2048 pixels. So I'm loading all of these pixels into, you know, this image texture, but my model isn't even using a bunch of it. So, you know, if I draw a box here, let's just say that's like 50 pixels. So I'm loading all of this 
empty space, but I'm not using it in my model at all. And this is why this is a bad unwrap. And the other reason why this is a bad unwrap is because of a concept called pixel density. So, you know, this is 2048 pixels by 2048 pixels. And the smaller the UV, the lower amounts of pixels are going to be assigned to that face in that 3D model, right? So if you have a UV that is really small, like this one, you can imagine it'll just be like 15 pixels or something. And it'll be very, very low resolution. So instead of looking like how it should, it'll just be like a splotch of gray or really blurry and look nothing like this at all. And that idea is the reason why we didn't just join all of these other stuff and unwrapped it and used it with one image texture. However, you know, you could do that by just increasing the resolution. So, you know, we can just make it like an 8K texture. So if we increase the pixel density of our image texture, well, now instead of instead of 15, it's going to be something higher. So uh, this is just four times, right? So 15 times, there'll be 60 pixels in this here. So then we get it higher resolution and we could probably fit some more stuff. You know, maybe if you have like a barrel, you could unwrap it and fill it here as well. The other problem with using one insanely big image texture is depending on how browsers use it. So Safari has a lot of issues loading big things at a single time. So if you have like a 100 megabyte single image texture, it might just crash the browser and you can never use it. So that's the other reason why you'll see all of the awards winning websites segmenting into several different image textures because you have more flexibility that way. But, you know, depending on your engine, depending on your use case. So how can we fix our UV so it's a little bit better? If we go back to, you know, one of the other ones, you can see that they're you know, their faces, their walls are really, really close to each other. Ours, we have all this empty space here. Now, their empty space is denoted by these black areas, probably. And, you know, you can see that they are covering up most of their texture. So this is a good UV. So how do we fix this? Well, Blender has this thing called packing. So if you come up to UV here, so Blender actually has this tool built in. And it's not very good, but if you go up to UVs and click Pack Islands, it'll try and rearrange things to be a little bit more optimal. And it also has this thing called Average Island Scale. And essentially what this tries to do is tries to make the pixel density proportional to the size of that face. You know, it would be kind of weird if some parts of the house were much lower resolution than other parts of the house. However, there are some cases where you would want a specific area to have higher pixel density than other areas or a higher resolution, especially if, you know, people aren't going to be looking at that place very often, then you can give it lower resolution and allocate more of that UV space to that higher resolution place that more people are going to be focusing on. This is a little more advanced UV, so I'm not really going to talk about it, but there are a lot of free Blender tutorials that I'll point to that cover advanced UV. And in addition to those tools, you can also manually move your stuff to, you know, fit, you know, use up more of the texture, get some higher resolution since it's the data is already being loaded into the browser and you can just rotate it around and kind of adjust it until, you know, everything fits a little bit better. Now that is going to be extremely tedious and long, especially for large scenes, even something like as small as this house. So I'm using a plugin. I think it's like $39, but you get it for life and all the future versions. And it's called UV Packmaster. Now you don't need this, but this often does a much better job at packing UVs than the Blender one. So if I hit A and click Pack, you can take a look. It really optimized our pack and everything is really close to each other and really optimized. And we're kind of using a lot of the texture. So this image in the back is kind of distracting. So I'm going to get rid of it. And yeah, so now we can kind of just see here how it looks and we can see our empty space a little bit more clear. But yeah, it really packed in those islands. And now it's starting to look a lot like this. So it is UV Packmaster 3. It is $39. Now you don't need this, but it's very, very helpful. And I totally recommend it. 
Now there are a lot of other UV packing tools, so you know, definitely explore, but this one is really handy and I use it a lot. Yeah, so because this is paid and I don't want things to be paid in this tutorial, I'm just gonna live with the bat and wrap. Now the reason our UVs are so poor as well is because we used the smart UV project and this doesn't always lead to good results. So the solution is to adjust the UVs themselves by manually unwrapping and marking seams. Yeah, so it kind of sounds exactly what it is. You mark a seams to determine where you should kind of cut your mesh if you were, imagine if you were going to rebuild it. And usually the more connected they are, the better, as long as there's no distortion. So just to make this a little more clear, I'm not gonna do it for this house, but I'll add a cube. I'll just move it here and let's go into this one. Now this is a good unwrap because it's all connected and there's no distortion. But what if I do something like this where I just randomly click some stuff and let's do control E and mark seam. So now it's gonna bold or you know cut at these themes. So if I hit A, and you and just do the manual unwrap you can see i have this distortion this face here is like this but it's so small compared to all the other faces so this is also a bad unwrap because it's distorting a lot of stuff now you can actually come up here and see that distortion and you can see really when they're different colors it means some things are getting distorted they're also getting stretched and so on and so forth and I can just hit A to select everything, Control E and clear the seams. So how can you imagine how you would mark the seams such that we actually already get? Now this is the default unwrap, which is a good unwrap, but how would we mark our seams such that we can get this good unwrap? Now, a lot of it for complex modeling is trial and error and experience. But let's just think about this cube for now. Well, let's just take a look at where it folds. So it's gonna be folding here, and it's gonna be folding here, and it's gonna be folding here. But we also need to cut this thing because it's gonna to be touching this one. Same with this side and this side, as well as this side and this side, right? So with that knowledge, we can just select our cube. Now, I think the faces of here aren't going to be the same ones here but it doesn't really matter because it's just a cube so like we did let's just do what we said we were going to do so we can imagine this edge is going to be this one right here and this one here but it's on a 2d surface so there are two edges and then this one is going to be this one right here and this one is going to be well these two but it's going to be one and then this one is going to be this one so we're gonna hold shift and select those as well. And then of course, this is just symmetrical. It's gonna be these two edges here, but it's currently just one. And then we can select this one, which is gonna be this edge here that we're unfolding. And then this one, which is gonna be these two right here. And then we hit control E, mark seam. Let's hit A to select everything and U to unwrap. And you can see we get the same exact unwrap as the regular cube. And just to prove that it's not like a fluke or whatever, if I add some seams here, let's just do control E and mark those seams. Let's hit A to select everything, hit unwrap. You can see we're gonna get a different unwrap again. Now, because this is just a cube, this doesn't really matter too much because you know it can really fill up that texture neatly no matter how you kind of unwrap it. Now, back to this house. I know I called this unwrap poor a lot of times, but it's actually not that bad and it could be a lot worse. It's just poor compared to like industry standard stuff, but you know, you can always improve on this stuff. But you know, when you spend time unwrapping, it's definitely something to consider because you can save a lot of loading time for your assets. You know, remember about pixel density, you know, if your things are packed better and they're bigger scaled like we did with the UV Packmaster, you can actually, you know, use lower resolution textures because, you know, if this was packed better, this could be bigger, for example, you know, take up more of the pixels. So you can imagine you could just use a 1K texture and this will be like 100 pixels 
but you have to use a 4K texture instead, and this would be 100 pixels, but it's a lot smaller. And speaking of Packmaster, I just want to mention this is from Python scripting. So all these add-ons are made with Python. So if you are into Python, you can definitely make your own add-ons and, you know, even sell them and make money. But I do recommend Packmaster if you aren't into Python. The other thing I want to mention is when you're UV unwrapping, you don't actually have to join them and then unwrap it. You can just unwrap them separately and then join them after if that's easier. And the reason you might want to do it separately is so you can go into local view and select edges a lot easier than if the object was joined because it would just be one, you know, one giant object in local view. Just to make sure when you join them, your second UV map is going to be the same. So let me just uh, show a demonstration for the second UV map. I'm going to unwrap here. I'm just going to unwrap it and I'll unwrap the base. And it also has a second UV map here. I'm going to U and unwrap that. Oops, I want to do smart UV project. And there we have our house base. And yeah, so I'm just going to temporarily move this because there would be overlapping and be kind of confusing. And now I'm just going to join them. And when I hit tab and go into the second UV map, you can see we see both of them because they're the same name. And of course, the first one was also the same name. So they're kind of together. But yeah, so now you can, you know, select your UVs and adjust them how you want them. like so and it looks like i'm selecting some other stuff yeah and you can just kind of adjust it like that like so you know however you want to do it yeah so you can either unwrap before or after i'm going to undo all of that stuff and get back to our old original house all right let's start a baking all right, let's start baking. So I'm going to go into rendered view here so I can see the lighting of where I want to put my house and make sure it's good before I start baking. So I'm going to shift right click where I want it, shift S selection to cursor and just put it into place. Now, if you don't like moving into rendered mode because you see all these, you know, glitchy things, you can go back into your render properties. And of course you can do EV, which is a real time, but you won't get the lighting that you'll be baking anyway. So it's kind of not really helpful, but the other thing you can do is come here and click denoise in your viewport sampling here. You can click denoise and this is really popular. It kind of, you know, gets rid of the noise when you're moving around, but it does make things more blurry. And I think it's going to make your computer um, do some more computations. So it might be a little taxing if you have a lower end computer, but yeah, you're going to see this and a lot of blender files that you download. Okay. Before we bake, there's some things you should know that can adjust your baking that actually took me that I actually made a mistake several times. So one of them is having an object like a cube, for example, and I have it hidden, but you can see the effect of it doesn't show when it's hidden. However, it's still activated in the render. So when you start baking it, it's going to still that influence that this cube has on the shadow is going to show up on the bake texture, but it's not going to show up in the viewport. So you can see that slight shadow there. So make sure when you hide something that's influencing, you also disable it in renders. And if you don't see that render icon, you can come up here and select that camera little thing. So you can deselect it. The other issue when you get a texture and it's completely black is like duplicate faces somehow. For some reason, you know, sometimes you just get duplicate faces. And if you want to check, you can just hit X and delete the face to see if there's any extra faces. But in this case, there's not. And actually, when I was quickly modeling here, you can actually see I have some black faces here. And that's because I have duplicate faces. So if I delete this face, you can see it's the real face underneath that one. So that's the second common mistake. All right, so now we're ready for baking. I'm gonna go into the shading tab. So here I have the UV editor open, but you can also use like the image editor to do the same thing, or you can also do it straight into the material itself. 
But what we need to do is create an image texture like the ones we saw on those award sites. So we can come up here and click new. And it really depends, but you know, the lower the resolution, the better because the smaller file size will be. So if you can get away with a smaller one, you should. But these should be powers of twos. I'm going to change it to a 4K texture, which is going to be 4096. And I'll call it, you know, a breeze home, which is what it is. But you can call it whatever you want. We don't need an alpha channel. That's for like transparency and stuff. And we can check this, which just gives us like better color and stuff. So I'm going to hit OK. And there we have our image. And we can hit Alt S on our keyboard to save it. And you can save it wherever you want. But one thing I do want to mention is we want to change this from PNG to Radiance High Dynamic Range. And the reason we want to change it to this one is because if you use PNG, JPEG, or WebP during the baking process, you're going to get different results than using this file. Because this file, you know, it says High Dynamic Range. It's got more colors. And then we can take that HDRI and then convert it to a WebP after. So if you want to try it, you can bake with WebP first and then make a new image texture and try it with Radiance HDR. And you'll see that you get different results in your color. So this will just give us some nicer colors. So we're going to be starting with Radiance HDR. Then we can just save that image. And now we can use it in Blender. So let's select our Breeze Home. Let's enter Edit Mode just to see our UVs are fitting in there. That's good. And to bake our textures onto this UV, we need to go through each of the materials of this house and give it that image that we just created, that Breeze Home Radiance HDRI. So let's go into the materials for this house and add an image texture. So Shift A S, search image like so. And then you can navigate here and just type in it, Breeze Home, or you can, you know, obviously just open it and navigate to that as well. And you can imagine each of these are like their own container. So we need to copy and paste this into the other materials. So with this selected, make sure this is highlighted in each one, by the way. So Blender knows to bake onto this texture. Make sure you don't have anything else selected. Just this one denoted by the white outline. And then you can paste it with Control-V, Control-C, Control-V. And you don't have to hit Control Z every time. You can just hit Control V again and paste them in. So each of these have a selected, highlighted, focused breeze home texture. Then the next thing we want to check is using the correct UV maps. So go into Object Data Properties and make sure this one is selected, not rendered, but just highlighted, just focused here. The next thing we want to do is go into Output Properties and change your resolution to Mac match your texture. The other settings I want to talk about is in render properties. And here you can see this thing called samples and noise threshold. So noise threshold just means the amount of noise that you're willing to let in. Now you can denoise it during the sampling or after in the compositing mode. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So max samples, it really depends on the quality you're going for. The more samples you have, Obviously, the better quality you'll get, but the larger the file size you'll get. And there comes a point where turning this up past a certain amount won't do any good at all. So you kind of just have to experiment with it. I'm going to do this divided by 2. So divided by 2, you can add, enter mathematical expressions, which is 128. And I'm going to turn off the noise threshold. But of course, it's going to depend on your house and your scene. Also make sure you're in cycles and GPU compute if you have a good GPU because it'll be faster than using your CPU. Then we can come down and scroll down into bake if you see bake here. And you can see the bake type. We can bake all these other stuff like the normals, like the ones that we got from our PBR textures. And you can also bake like roughness maps or ambient inclusion and so on and so forth. But we're just gonna be focusing on combined, which means combining the lighting information and some other factors and onto the image texture. Yeah, so that should be it. And we should just be good to bake. On the bottom here, you can see the texture bake progress and you can hit the X if you want to cancel it. All right, so my finished baking and you can see everything is here. So you can hit Alt S on your keyboard to save it, you know, or you can come up here and just save it, but make sure to save it. Now we want to convert this to a WebP. We can go into the compositing tab up here and this just renders out the camera view, but we don't have a camera, so we can unhinge that and just hit M to mute that. 
then we can search for an image texture and navigate to our radiance HDR right here and we can just hook it up now the compositing tab if you've never used it before is exactly what it sounds like you're it's like an image editor pretty much in blender or like a render editor if you were doing camera views you know you can do like post processing in here and stuff you know just like for example you can see some filters here some mate um, you know you can adjust colors and stuff it's kind of like Photoshop with like a photo editor you know so there's also this option to denoise which is kind of common and that denoises the image but the problem with denoising is you will lose some quality so if you have some really really tiny th things here like these the denoise is going to completely blur it out and you will lose all your detail now some of your bigger ones are going to be look better as a result of denoise but some of your really small ones are going to look worse yeah, so it really depends on your own scene i'm not going to use it and we're just going to render this out we're just going to composite it so i'm going to hit f12 to render this out then i'm going to hit alt s on my keyboard to save this as a webp file and i'm going to keep the quality up to 100 percent now we can start using it so let's go back into the shading tab now I should mention you could have just did image save as webp, but I wanted to point out the compositing tab. Okay, so anyway, let's give this a try. So I'm just gonna duplicate this just to make it easier and bring it up. And let's go into our rendered mode. And we don't need all these materials anymore, right? So let's go to the materials tab and get rid of them. And let's create a new one and we'll just call this um breeze home baked breeze home baked but you can call it whatever you want then we can use this image texture shift a search image let's navigate to it we call it breeze home i think that's the hdri so we want to use the webp so let's get that one and let's hook it up in base color and it still doesn't work because we aren't rendering this second uv map so we can select it with this camera icon here. And now you can see we have our baked texture right here. Pretty cool, right? Now it's a little bit darker than this one or a little more pinkish or reddish. And that's because not only did we bake it with the pink color, we're also getting the light right now, which is also pink from the HDRI, which is why it looks like that, which is why it's a little bit darker. But yeah, you can see it's pretty good. Okay, pretty cool. Now, before we export this to give it a quick look into the browser, there is another issue with having two UV maps. 3GS will by default use this first render, and you have to do some complicated code in order to tell it to use the second set of UVs. So it's easier if you just remove the first one and only keep the second pair of UVs, which actually map to that texture and that's the other reason i duplicated the house again because i wanted to keep one in which i have full control over both of them and one that is just for the final output now there's something else i want to point out here you can see i have this black stuff all around the edges here and why is that well that's because my stuff my house is in the ground right you can see it's in the ground when i baked it so this kind of highlights the importance of why you want to delete faces and stuff because it's going to be taking up segments on here of your UV space and you're not even going to be seeing it. You're not even going to be using it. So we just wasted all this UV space, all of this image data that something else could be there. For example, maybe another beam could fit in there, but this tiny segment is taking up that spot. So, you know, just something to be aware about. Of course, nothing will be perfect. And really to drive that point that nothing is perfect and a lot of people are willing to overlook things. I'm on Active Theory, which is one of the most popular uh, creative digital agencies and they've won a ton of awards. I'm on their most recent one, Iconic Mints. And if you just take a look at the edges of their baked texture in their room, you can see that, you know, it's kind of blurry. It's kind of messy. They got those black spots and those edges as well. It's just not worth the time to fix some of these errors. All right, let's give this a quick export. So with this selected, I'm gonna go into file, export, gltf slash glv. 
and you can call it whatever you want. So I'm just going to call it FDSA. And remember export settings so we don't have to keep changing it every time. I'm going to include only selected objects. I'm going to transform Y up. Geometry, I'll do UVs, normals, and this time I'll export the materials. So it's going to export this image texture automatically for us as part of this GOB file. And I think in the future we're not going to export any of the materials just for flexibility reasons. For now, we're going to export the image texture as part of the GLB file. Then we're going to turn on compression. This will just reduce our file size a little bit. And in animation, there's no animation here, so we can just get rid of all of them. All right, let's export it. Go into GLTF report like we did before and navigate there and open it up. And take a look. Our house is in the browser. And yeah, it looks, you know, it doesn't look too bad. Of course, GLTF report is going to add some lighting of its own, so it's going to look a little bit different. But you can already tell that, you know, it looks it looks not too bad. All right, now let's start baking the landscape. Now, we actually don't need to give this one a second UV map because it only is one material, and that entire material is already fit onto a cube. However, we do have a lot of empty space here, so, you know, if you have some extra stuff, maybe like you know, wooden carts or trees or something, you can use this extra space here. Or you can manually mark seams onto your landscape to cut it up a little bit better and pack it and then pack it a little bit better. But you know, this is good enough. It, you know, for us, this is going to be good enough. So let's do the same thing. I'm going to get rid of this image so we don't see it. And I'm going to create a new one. And I'll also make this one 4k. And I'll call this landscape and no alpha, 32-bit float, hit OK. Alt S to save it. Save it as Radiance HDRI. Sorry, I keep saying HDRI, but it's just HDR. All right, let's also, I almost forgot to check face orientation. Everything should be blue. Looks good. And yeah, I also forgot to disable this one in renders. I don't think it's affecting the shadows too much. So, yeah, but let's just disable it in renders as well. And let's also hide it. All right, now we can just select this, select this. We checked everything already. Let's just bake it. All right, remember Alt S to save this image. And let's just take a look at how it looks. So everywhere that we had a house, of course, it's going to be pitch black because there's no light. You know, it's blocking all the light. So, you know, this looks good. Now, there are some black spots here. And this reason could be because of the face orientation, but we already checked all that. So that's not the issue. The issue is we just have a bad unwrap. And these black spots are actually these other dots here for some reason, because those are, you know, the UVs are just messed up. Yeah, so that's an issue because this is kind of just floating here when it shouldn't be. But, you know, for us, it doesn't really matter. But other than that, yeah, it looks pretty good as a bake. So let's do the same thing, but instead of going to compositing tab this time, we can just do image save as a WebP. Then you can give it uh, um, another material if you want, or I'll just do search for a principled BSDF and I'll put it up here. Color, hook up the color to the base color and then the BSDF to the surface. And you can take a look. Okay, and if you take a look, it definitely does look a lot different than our original one and that's because we not only do we not have our normal attached to it we also have this principal bsdf which is affecting it and that's primarily because of this thing here so if we turn down the specular and we turn up the roughness you're going to see it's going to look a lot more similar to what we had originally and of course it's going to be darker because of the lighting that is doubling on the effect so Let's export this and take a look at it. So same exact process as the other one. And here it is in the browser. And it looks pretty good. Remember, you can just hit Control Shift on your keyboard and select to go over to the image texture and back to our original one. And before we move on to baking normals, yes, indeed. If you have like another model that uses the same exact images, I mean, sorry, the same exact materials, yeah, you're going to have to change each one of these image textures when you bake it to the new one for this separate house. Or you can just duplicate it, so Shift-D, 
and just make it selected so you can just switch back and forth depending on if you won't need to rebake it or not. And you might be saying, yeah, baking in Blender is really tedious, and it is, compared to other software like Substance Painter. In Substance Painter, you just click one button called Bake. You don't have to do all of this stuff. But yeah, that is one downside of Blender. Baking is a little bit tedious. So baking normals are going to be generally the same, but there's going to be some slight differences. So go back into your render properties and instead of combined, let's do normal. And for the image texture in each one of these materials, we're going to have to do a special setting. So I'm going to shift D duplicate this. And oh, yeah, let's uh, also create a new image texture here for house normals. So Alt S, whoops, sorry, new. And I'll call this house normals, house norms and hit OK. And let's hit Alt S here. And this time we can just do straight WebP. We don't need the Radiance HDR. HDR. Save as image. And let's get it. So right here. And instead of sRGB, we have to change this to non-color data. Then we can copy and paste this into each one. So I'm just clicking off to deselect that one and then control V to paste this. Okay, and now we can go back into bake and just bake our normals. And my bake normals are done. So I'm gonna hit Alt S and save that. And I'm gonna go and let me open my other one, my other house that we had the diffuse baked or the lighting baked and open that. And let's go to that material I can't see anything because I'm probably too far, but you can just hit home on your keyboard to find it really quickly. So to hook up the normal, we can just do control shift T and navigate. Oh, it looks like I have it as HDRI. So let's alt S, whoops, let's do image save as, and let's change this to WebP and save that image. And let's do control shift T and navigate to breeze home. And it doesn't find anything because Usually it looks for the uh, for the title normal or norm. So if we rename this, maybe it will find it out. So maybe something like norm.webp. So let's just select that. And yeah, you can see it hooks up our normal here. And we don't need the mapping. So let's get rid of that. But yeah, so let's take a look before the normals. As I increase its strength, it's getting more of those dark crevices and a little bit more of that detail. Pretty cool. Very, very cool. Yeah, how cool is that? And you can just see from far away that it's definitely adding some detail in there. And one last thing I want to mention before this chapter ends, you can just ignore this. I accidentally deleted this one for some reason. I think I accidentally, when I was baking the normals, replaced this one with the same image but you know, whatever. But one thing I want to point out is if you're using an older version of Blender, your texture is gonna look wildly different, your baked texture. So here you can see ours actually looks pretty similar. It's just because of the lighting that it's a little bit darker. But if it's completely different from your original one when you bake it, then it's because of this thing called color management, which is under render properties which is under render properties and color management is called filmic. So in older versions of Blender, it would originally bake with something like raw. Yeah, I think it will look raw. So if you see like really different colors for your bake, it's probably because you are baking with an older version of Blender. So in order to fix those color issues, you can go to compositing tab and, you know, put your baked image here to composite it. And then by automatic, if your color management is set at filmic, it's going to, it's going to put, uh, it's going to apply that filmic to your image. So filmic is just a color management system exclusively to Blender. So you need to put that into the texture as well. But for us, I'm on the latest version of Blender, which is like 3.2 or something like that. So, and it automatically bakes in with filmic for me. So we don't have to do that extra step. And just one last thing, when you bake this, remember face orientation 
it has to be blue where we want it. So in this case, we're going to be inside. So we need to flip all these blue faces to be inside. So only this one has an issue. So we can just enter edit mode A to select everything, Alt N, and we can do recalculate inside. And I'll recalculate it for us. So everything on the outside is red and every on the thing on the inside is going to be blue, which is what we want. Whoops, sorry. Keep doing the tab by habit. And yeah, everything inside is blue and that's exactly what we want. So you can go ahead and join them, bake them, do whatever you want. All right, congratulations. You've baked your textures and now you can use them. So I just want to point some other stuff out that you can check. You know, if you want to deep dive into UV unwrapping, you can, you know, take a look at some of this stuff. Uh, Grant Ebbett, he's a really f famous Blender YouTuber. He does an, a decently nice job here to unwrap a really complicated scene and put it into one final texture you can see here. So um, yeah, definitely worth watching if you want to get advanced in unwrapping. Of course, this is 2.81, so it might be a little bit dated for the hotkeys, but all the other concepts will be applied here. Of course, you can find, you know, one that fits you. Not every teacher is going to fit your learning style. Same thing, you know, if you just forget something, just, you know, put it into YouTube, baking normals, you know, so on and so forth. And if you can't find it on YouTube, you know, try Google. And if that's all you came here for, well, then... I just want to point you into the other direction if you want to use your normal maps. But yeah, and there's actually an example right here on 3GS. That's really nice. You can just go to their code. Yeah, that's all for chapter three. All right, welcome to chapter four, which is the last Blender part. We're going to set up colliders with Blender so we can do easy collision detection in 3GS, you know, so we don't move through the floors, through the walls and stuff like that. We're going to set up some items. We're going to create a few items that we can interact with, like trigger the next scene to load and those assets or, you know, read more about that object or something like that. And then we're going to export everything. We're going to export the models, the textures, and so we can use them in 3GS. We're going to be using the simple octree physics for collision. So if you've seen it, you might have seen it before on 3GS. It's an official example. And yeah, essentially it's just for collision detection so you know we don't go through stuff we don't go through walls and stuff like that and the reason i want to use this method is because it's extremely flexible and it's really easy to implement so even if you don't know what it is you can still use it really easily and let me just show you so coastal world another f really really famous digital agency created this at one site of the month of august 2022 and they also use octree and you can see here they made their colliders here and that's exactly what we're going to be doing. All right, so let's start making a collider for our landscape, just like we saw on Coastal Worlds case study. So the first thing I want to do is Shift D to duplicate my thing, right click to cancel the movement. You can move it if you want to outside, but it's easier if you just leave it directly on top of the other one. So you don't have to, you know, do any code changes later. So I'm going to hide my original landscape. And I'm going to call this new one Collider. And because this is just a collider, we will never actually see it. We can get rid of the material. You can keep it temporarily if it helps you, but I'm going to get rid of it right now. So this is actually pretty high poly for a collider mesh. You can actually get away with a much lower poly, uh, a much lower poly collider mesh. So if you want to, you can come up here, add a modifier and do the decimate modifier and just bring this down a little bit. And you can see the face count right here. It's going down and yeah. And you can actually see what's changing on the mesh as well. And if I hit, and let me apply it with control A and you can see here we have our collider mesh and it's got a lot of less faces. I'm gonna undo that, but it's definitely something you want to consider to simplify your collider mesh. So the octree doesn't take as much work to build. Now don't be, don't get too carried away with it because it might not, match up with your landscape. So if I, you know, unhide my landscape, you can see, you know, how much it's going to be like different. And it might just look weird when you're colliding. So I'm going to get rid of this for now, but definitely something to consider in the future to experiment with. But we can still apply that principle for the other major items. So, you know, it really depends on your scene, but I don't want my player to walk anywhere higher 
than pretty much these these walls here. So if you want to test where your player can walk, you know, you can do that shift back tick and then tab to enter gravity mode. And you can just walk, remember shift to speed up, walk all over your landscape. And you're like, oh, I don't want them to be able to walk here, but they can. So I'm going to add a wall there. Yeah, so I'm going to shift right click here or something. And I'm just going to add a plane. And I'll just do RX90. And I'll just scale it up on SZ. We can go into edit mode. Um, you can do edge, but I'm going to do vertices. So we select both of those like that. And yeah, from here, we can just let's go back into solid and we can just extrude along where we don't want a player to go through. So it looks like I accidentally went through there. So let me go into wireframe real quick and just kind of move it out so I can see what I'm doing. And of course, you also want to, you know, move it up as well. GZ. Yeah, so everywhere you don't want a player to go, just put a wall there. And I think I can actually select through this mesh. Yeah, you don't need to go to wireframe for that. So just some tips, if you want to make it a little more round, uh, you can add a loop cut like here and you can go to the top and just move that out a little bit and let's go into vertice select and then do control B and you can just add you can use your mouse wheel to scroll up and add some vertices and kind of just make it a little more round and then of course you can turn on proportional editing let's select both of these and just kind of move it so it's a little more curved like so let's go back to solid and yeah, just do that for wherever you want your walls. Now we also want to create colliders for all our objects. So here I only have one object, which is the house. So we can just represent it with a cube instead of all this complex geometry, like those insets and those poles instead. Instead, we can just use a basic cube. So I'm just gonna rotate it and take the shape of the base of the house. So one thing you can do to make this process a little bit easier is just to take a look at, um, you can change the viewport display of your cube. So if you come into object properties, you can see viewport display. And in viewport display, instead of textured, you can display it as wire or bounds. And that might be a little bit more helpful uh, to kind of just see the bounds w without a giant cube. But you know, I don't use that that often and yeah you can add the loop cuts to make it a little bit better let's move this out g y y or local y and let's select that face g e and just move it out there for that house as well so there is our bounding box for the house now you don't have to do the roof because no one's going to be there anyway so we just have to do the base of the house yeah so just make a wall collider and colliders for your meshes. I only have a house here, so I only did one. But if you have some other ones, you know, make colliders for them as well. And when you come to the end like I am, you can just hit select these two edges, hit fill with F and fill in that basic. Okay, so everything past our walls or outside of our walls, we don't need anymore. We can remove it from the collider mesh because, you know, we don't want to generate an August tree for all of this for collision detection when we're not even going to be there in the first place. So let's just go into edit mode. Let's go into circle select. And remember, it's a shift to deselect and click. And you can also use your middle mouse button. And I'm just going to start highlighting things and deleting them. So you know, up. so make sure to delete everything. X delete faces. Yeah, so I'm done. Of course, mine isn't, mm, it's not that good. Actually, it's really bad, but you know, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. You know, spend as much time as you need on it. So I'm going to temporarily hide this house. And now you can select everything that you want as a collider. So it's just going to be these three, which is my landscape, my remaining landscape. And um, looks like there's some floating edges that I want to get rid of right now delete those delete those edges and and the wall and your mesh stuff 
And again, it doesn't really matter which one's active or not, but just hit Control J to join them. So this is, so our Oak tree will build from this mesh here. And yeah, like I said, mine is really bad. So I'm going to be dropping through the floor <laughs> here. Yeah, so I'm going to be dropping through the floor here because I accidentally deleted those phases. But you know, yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, so there is our collider. All right, after joining your colliders, make sure to check your face orientation. And everything inside is blue, which is exactly what I want. And if yours is not, remember, you want to select it and enter edit mode, select everything, alt N, recalculate inside. And if that doesn't work, you can manually select the red faces and flip them manually. So, you know, alt N and flip. But everything is blue for me, so, you know. I am good to go. All right, the next thing we want to do is make sure all of our items can be interacted with that we want to be interacted with. So imagine if you have like a barrel or something. I'm actually going to quickly add a monkey here so the user can interact with it. Of course, you know, it can be whatever you want. Maybe it's like a trophy or something, but I'm just going to use their default monkey. So the idea is when you get close enough to this monkey, your area of focus is going to detect this monkey and then you can interact it with it like a hockey like f to pick up or e to pick up or something like that now it is helpful to have a naming convention because you can use a lot more javascript methods to detect objects for example if you have a class only to dedicate to pick up items well then you can do like item one or something and the next item you create, you do item two, item three. And in JavaScript, all you have to do is check if it's an item or not, and you can allocate those tasks appropriately. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it doesn't really matter. You can see once we get to it, but I'm just going to leave it as randomly named for now. So the second type of interactivity that I want is to trigger a load of the next assets. So here you can see we have one item that will interact in one way, and then we have the other item to interact in another way. So if you played RPG games before, and you know you walk up to a door, it will automatically lead into that next scene, that next place, and start the load. Or you know if you point your cursor at the door, you can hit like E to go in. So we have our two types of interactivity, one interacting with an object, and another one triggering a load of assets and teleportion to another scene. So for this one, you can add something like a plane. And when the user, for example, whoops, negative 90, when the user points their cursor here or their area of focus, a thing will pop up and they can hit the hotkey to load and go inside the house. Now, one issue with using a plane for this is if you get a really weird angle for some reason just by pure accident like here and they were pointing their area of focus at the door it's not intersecting with this plane so it's not going to activate until they get like here or something so you can so what you can do to avoid that is use a cube instead of course you can use any shape that you want but the simple the geometry the better because better performance and lower file size so yeah, I'm going to call this gateway, gateway to inside. And of course, if you have many different gateways or whatever, you should have a naming convention, but I don't really care for this tutorial. Oh yeah, I should also mention, of course, you should be deleting faces that you don't need. So I'm going to delete those. All right, so we're ready to export. I'm going to hit A to select everything and control A and apply my scale just to make sure we don't have any issues. I'm going to re unhide my landscape and I'm going to select this and hold shift and select my collider. So I have my landscape and my collider currently selected. Now I'm not joining them. I just have both of them selected. Now I'm going to export it. So file export GLTF. And remember we have our export settings, but I'll show you again, selected objects, transform Y up geometry, UVs, normals. And this time we don't want to export the materials. Last time we exported them, this time we don't. So make sure to do no export. And this is for those flexibility reasons that we'll talk about later. Of course, you also want compression. 
to make the file size smaller. Now you might be able to increase this and reduce your file size while also still having good quality. So definitely play around with this just to tr try it out, but I'm just gonna leave it as default here. And of course in animation, we don't have any animations. So make sure to uncheck all of those and I'll call it and I'll just export it right here. Now we also want to export our interactivity objects. So I'm going to select my monkey as well as my door uh, interactive object here. And I'm also going to export those as well. File, export, GLTF, and I'll call this landscape items. Again, you can name it whatever you want, and I'm just gonna export that. And of course, we also need our house back. So this is why it pays to be organized so I can find it quickly. I think this is the one, just wanna make sure. Yeah, that looks like the one. So I'm gonna select my house. I'm gonna do file. I'm gonna do export, GLTF. Same exact thing, and I'll just call this house. Export that. Now we wanna do the same exact thing for the interior. So I have my inside, and I have my collider, which is really poorly made. So I'm gonna select my collider. Also, I should have mentioned this earlier, but remember, just make sure you are exporting the model that actually has the UV map that works with the texture and not the one with two UV maps. My house, and I'm gonna do file, export, GLTF, and I'll export that and I'll call this interior with collider and export that. And I'm gonna temporarily hide this so I can select this and I'm just gonna export that. File, export, GLTF, and I'll call this house items. And I'll just hit Control Z twice to undo my last selection, just to quickly unhide that. Okay, so just to recap, we have the house itself. So this thing right here, and we have the house diffuse, which is the baked texture that we saved on our local computer. Then we have house items, which are just that one object that I just exported. Actually, let's rename this and call it interior items, just to stay consistent. And then we have the baked interior texture which you can see here. I didn't, I didn't include this in the video because it's the same exact process as the other ones. And then I have the interior with the collider, which is what we just exported here. Then I have those landscape items, which are the interactivity objects, this and that, that little thing there. And then we have the landscape with the collider, obviously, which is these two things that we exported. Now, I also know we baked the normals for the house. So you can also have that in here as part of your assets as well. It's the same exact process as the other ones, just slightly different. So if you need help, just let me know in the comments, but I'm not really gonna cover that here. Just to save some time off the video. Yeah, and I forgot to add this from my other folder, but we also have that baked landscape texture. So here you can see everything that we're gonna be using. All right, welcome to the end of chapter four. Not much to talk about here. Just make sure you have all your assets that you want. And I did just link to the case study if you wanted to read that and that 3JS org example. Hey, welcome to chapter five. In this chapter, we're gonna be setting up our project. I'm going to be using a similar but slightly different structure from my previous video. So I'm gonna go a little bit faster because I don't wanna repeat concepts I've covered in previous videos. But if you need a slower explanation, you can click on this link here. It's gonna take you to the timestamp in my video where I go a lot slower. You can see I start out explaining what a bundler is and the general structure all the way up until here before we get into some customization stuff for that project. All right, I'm gonna go into my command prompt, D drive, CD tutorials. You can go to whatever directory you want and then I'm gonna run npm create beat at latest. And I'm gonna call this immersive world, but you can call it whatever you want. And I'll just hit enter, vanilla JS, JavaScript. And now we can enter immersive world. They created a folder for us, install the dependencies. Then code dot, if you have VS code installed and it'll open in VS code automatically for us. All right, let's start by deleting what they gave us. So counter.js, we don't need that. Index.html, we can, uh, let's see, let's just get rid of, yeah, they only have one thing here. So we can hit control X to cut that out. And uh, let's get this, control X to get that out real quick. The package.json, I'm gonna do beat dash dash host. 
and this will make the local host run on your network as well so you can open it on your mobile device so let me just show you real quick if i do npm run dev if you go to this url on your mobile device you can access it on your mobile device so this is going to be really helpful and now let's set up the public folder which by default handles all our static assets like our image textures and our models so you can customize this however you want but I'm just going to make a models folder to hold all the models and a textures folder to hold all the textures. Now, some people prefer to categorize these things by scenes. Like we have a house interior, but we also have an outside. So maybe you want to do something like outside and inside of outside, you have a models folder and a textures folder. So it's really up to you how you want to organize your files. There's really no right or wrong here and it really depends on the user. All right, so let's navigate to our folder and upload our models and textures. So here I have my textures. I'm gonna hit control to select them and just drag them into textures and the same thing with my models. So put them in my models. So, so I have my GLB files here and I have my textures here. All right, the next thing we should do is reset style.css. So, I think we can just get rid of everything. Let's see here. Yeah, we can get rid of everything. And let's just do the cliche reset. M0 and P0 for padding. And then box sizing, border box, the cliche CSS reset. Let's also keep our co console open just to see if we get any errors. So I'm going to delete this. I don't think we need this one either. All right, and since we want our entire experience to take up the entire page, let's just overflow hidden right now. So I'm going to do HTML body and I'll do overflow hidden. This way we want to have scroll bars on the screen. Let's also target our experience wrapper that we haven't created yet in our HTML, but we want it fixed. So position fixed. And we want its height to take up 100 point of the viewport height and width. We also want this to be 100 of the viewport width. Whoops, I typed right there and I misspelled this. Then let's just put a Z index of negative one so it's behind everything. Then of course inside our div wrapper, we also need the canvas itself to take up the full width of our container. So we wanna do height 100%, width 100%. And we might not need this, but I might as well just put position fixed here as well. All right, let's go into index.html and make this stuff. So we have dot experience wrapper. And inside here we have canvas dot experience. All right, the next step is to install a plugin that allows us to use shaders with Vite. So V can recognize shaders. By default, it doesn't. So we have to use a plugin to handle that. To my root directory, and I'm going to make one called vite.config.js and I'm getting this from the documentation itself. So by default, vite will automatically look for a vite.config.js and you can also split it up. For example, you can do vite.config.dev.js for one for your development and one for your build, vite.config.build.js and so on and so forth but we're just gonna stick with one and it'll be used for everything. So you can just go to the documentation and you can kind of see here, okay, this is gonna be the general structure that you need and there are alternatives. So I'm gonna go into, I'm just gonna copy and paste this here. And you might be saying, okay, where is this? Well, it's from Vite and where's Vite? Well, it's in our node modules folder. So you can probably find it here if you wanted to take a look. And remember, all of this stuff from our packages are just code that someone else wrote, and you can investigate that code if you want to. All right, so the plugin that we need is this one right here. So I'm just going to copy this. It's Vite plugin GLSL. So I'm just going to npm install that. Then if we go back to the documentation and go into shared options and go down to plugins, you can see how we can use a plugin. This is kind of vague, but luckily they have a plugin API for more details. And if you scroll down, you can see, okay, this is how we are going to use a plugin. Luckily for us though, that the creator of this plugin uh, already created one for us. So we don't have to really do anything. We can just copy and paste that and go back into here and paste that there. Now, the next step of what I'm going to do is optional, but I'm going to put all 
my experience stuff pretty much my entire application into another folder and this is just for organization purposes you don't have to follow this step so i'm gonna create a new folder make sure it's not inside of anything and i'll call it app but again you know call it whatever you want maybe source or you know sources whatever you want i'm gonna call it app because it's my app i'm gonna take my index my main and my style.css and i'm gonna drag it and drop it into app we need this app to act as our root directory for our application. So in vconfig, we're gonna come in here and we're gonna set the root to app. And because our root directory is in here, it needs to know how to get to our static assets. Now during development time, you can have your static assets anywhere and it will work while you're developing. But once you start building out for production, your static assets have to be in the public folder so V can build it out with your bundled built out application. So we need the root directory to recognize this folder. So we can, that, that's another thing in, that you can find in the documentation, public directory, and it's gonna be dot dot slash public. You know, just one directory out of this goes back and we can find public. We can also config where the built files are gonna be. So I'm gonna make a one. I want the built files to show up in this folder here instead of this one. So I'm gonna do out dir or just out directory and I'm gonna do dot dot slash. So one directory out of the root directory and I'll just call the folder dist. So once we build, it's gonna create a folder here called dist. All our built files are gonna be in there. And every time we build out our files, we also want to empty it so it doesn't keep adding to that folder. I think this is the default behavior from Vite, but we might as well just set it to true instead. And it just says empty out directory and we set it to true. So now you can see it's a little more organized. You can just close like this main folder if you wanted to, you know, just look at the other stuff. All right, the next thing I wanna do is just change this to main. You don't have to follow this step at all, but I like just keeping them consistent. So I like know this stuff. All right, so let's create some folders in here. Of course, we're gonna need our experience folder. Now, remember not to mess up your folder structure because a lot of people were getting errors before because of their folder structure. So just make sure that it's fine. And then I wanna create one for my styles or my CSS. And I think that's all we need for now. So let's actually organize our main.css right now. And I'm gonna create another one here and I'll call it experience.css. And I'm just gonna move my experience stuff into this folder right here. And I'm gonna shift tab to D backspace this stuff. Whoops, shift tab. And in main.css, I'm just gonna import it. So import. Whoops, sorry, I forget the CSS syntax import and dot slash styles dot experience dot CSS. Now, of course, this is also optional. You can just shove everything in one file, but I just want to be a little more organized. All right, let's do the same thing in main.js. So we're gonna import our experience that we haven't created yet. Experience from dot slash experience in that directory and experience dot JS. Of course, this doesn't exist yet. Then let's just do const experience, experience, equals new experience that we haven't created yet. And then we can do document dot query selector and select our canvas because 3GS needs a canvas to inject to. And I called it experience. Let's call it experience canvas. Now make sure you just copy and paste it directly here so you don't have any typo issues. This was another common issue in a previous video. So just make sure you have it spelled correctly. And I'll just do make sure it's canvas dot experience canvas. And of course you can just select by class if you want to. All right, and yeah, I should have kept this running just to make sure we don't have any errors. Of course we're gonna get an error because experience doesn't exist. I guess it doesn't show unless I open it up. Yeah, okay, now I'm getting that error. Okay, so yeah, let's go. And I'm gonna do experience.js. Let's just enter export default class experience static instance, whoops. Constructor, we want to grab that canvas that we're passing in from main.js. And then if experience.instance, just return the instance of that experience and experience.instance equal th this. If it doesn't exist, just set it to the new one that we're creating right now. Then let's set this.canvas equal to the canvas that we just passed in from main.js. All right, let's go to the browser and take a look. Looks like we have an error here and yeah, it looks like a typo. So this is why I should always copy and paste just to make sure that it's right. 
it seems like everything is working now. Yep, no more console errors. Nice. By the way, if you don't know what I'm doing here, you can watch that little segment that I mentioned at the start of chapter 5. And I explain it as if you've never worked with this singleton design pattern before. So, you know, definitely watch that if you have no idea what I'm doing here. Because I'm doing the same exact thing over in the previous video, where I go much slower and explain line by line. I'm just going to be copying and pasting over some of that stuff. But I will briefly mention what's going on there. So let's go into experience and let's do a utils folder for short for utilities. Let's do time.js and sizes.js. So sizes.js, if you remember, just handles our sizes. So like our canvas is going to be taking the inner width and the inner height. It has an aspect ratio that we'll use, for example, the camera. So when we resize the browser, it's going to adjust the scene appropriately and not get like squished or stretched. We also need to install that event emitter as usual. That's supposed to come by default with node.js, but I also, I always have to install it. So I'm just going to install it. So this is emitting a resize event that we can listen to in experience.js. So experience.js can tell all the other classes when this is listening to the window resize event emitter to call their resize function as well. So we can create that right now, actually resize. Oops, and maybe on resize, on resize. So right here, we're getting that emitted event, emit resize. Every time this resizes, this is going to emit that event. And this experience is going to listen to that resize event and call this function on resize. And everything that we're going to be putting in here is also going to be called its resize function. All right, let's do it. So this dot sizes equals new sizes. And let's import it. So shift enter to add some white space, import sizes dot slash utils slash sizes dot JS. All right, let's go to time dot JS. And here we just have a class that manages time. So our animations have the same speed across all different browsers because some browsers are going to be, I mean, so, sorry, some computers, some monitors are going to be refreshing at higher rates. Now, there are a lot of other uses for the time class. For example, maybe you want a certain animation to occur at a certain point at a certain time in time of the application. For example, 30 seconds after application starts, you want to start an animation. All right, back in experience, I'm going to place a cursor here, here, and just paste out my imports and my creation. Now, at this point, I should also install three. I don't remember if I did or not. Whoops, npm i3 to make 3JS there. Of course, then we also have to import that package, 3JS, and let's create our scene. So I'm gonna enter and I'll do this.setScene. Let's just copy and paste this here. Whoops. And it will just be this.scene equals new three scene. And let me just copy and paste the rest of the setup. So set local storage is new and I'll start slowing down once we get there. So I'm going to just put my cursor here to grab these and just create them as functions below here. So let's do shift alt one, two, three, four, five, and just paste it here and then brackets and then save for some pretty like so. And let's also move it down here, shift enter and add some spacing over here as well. All right, so let's create our camera. So I'm going to enter here, create our camera. Renderer, get our renderer, get our world right here, set world like so. Then we want to set our resources. So this dot res resources dot set our resources and set local storage. We're going to create a new local storage here. All right, let's also make, all right, let's make sure to import all this stuff. And I'm just going to paste it here. Let's just separate it up so it's a little more organized. So we have our utils and then we have our stuff in the experience folder and then we have the world. Okay, let's just go in order. So I'm going to create camera.js. All right, let's go into camera.js and I'll just paste this here. So you can see here what we're using. We have this dot sizes, which is just this. Remember, in our experience class, it returns the same exact instance. So that's good, especially for something like time. Now, remember, the only time that this actually ever executes once is right here. And this is the time we create the new experience. And that's where it bypasses this turn because it doesn't exist yet and it goes through all this 
But every time in a new file, we create a new experience. We're not actually creating a new experience. We're just getting that same exact experience with all that stuff already attached to it. So we can just reference that experience that has all that stuff with it and we can just use it. So we have the, this dot size dot aspect. Remember that's right here. We have this dot aspect. And then everything else is pretty straightforward. We just have a params object for the camera. So we have near and far values, the field of view, the aspect ratio, so on and so forth. And I'm just creating a new three perspective camera and I'm adding it to the scene. I'm giving it some orbit controls, which we will remove later. And actually, let me just set it right now. This dot set orbit controls. By the way, if you are from the future, I think they're changing this to add-ons or something. So just make sure the path is correct. You might not be able to access orbit controls. Of course, we also need to update the camera on resize. Otherwise, it'll start stretching or pulling the view. So that's what this is here. Let's also make sure to put that in here on resize as well. This dot camera dot resize on resize. And let's make sure we spell that correctly. Actually, let me just copy and paste. It's always better to copy and paste. So size.js emits that event, experience listens to it, calls this function, and then it's gonna call the cameras function to resize as well. All right, let's move on to the renderer. So I'm gonna go back into my experience folder, renderer.js, paste that in here. And yeah, let me show you. So we just have a renderer that we're creating a new WebGL renderer. We're setting some things that you can change depending on your scene. We're setting the size of it and the pixel ratio, and then we're handling the resize and we need to render it on each frame. So let's make sure to call this resize function on resize. And let's go into experience and make sure to call that shift all down arrow and the stop renderer dot on resize. Now we haven't actually made this update function yet. So let's do that right now. So I'm going to come down here and I'm just going to do update. And I'm going to go in here and paste this. So on each frame, we're just requesting the animation frame and we're just calling itself over and over again. And if this stuff exists, update it and call its update function. So in this case, it, the renderer exists. So we're going to be calling update here and so on and so forth. So yeah, just one last glance at the renderer. And we also need to call it for the initial creation time. So it starts calling itself and that'll just be right here, this dot update. Okay, so this is a completely new concept exclusive to these kinds of projects. So let me introduce to you why we are even using local storage in the first place. So if you know Coastal World, this one side of the month, it uses local storage to, you know, save the player position. So I'm right here right now. If I refresh the page, I will also be here when I refresh the page. And you can see I'm right here. Now I'm a little bit back, so they probably wait a few frames, so it's not as performance intensive, but they manage this behavior with local storage. So if I open up the console with control shift I and just type in local storage here, you can see we have a player position, the coordinates. In addition to the player coordinates, we also have this thing called Island West. And that's just the location that our player is at, like the set of assets essentially that our player is at. So if you go to another area, for example, this is going to change and it's going to load that set of assets instead. This means every time you load your browser, you don't have to load all the assets. You only have to load the assets specific to this specific location. So for example, if I go to, let me just enter their Easter egg. I'm now at this island here. You notice that there was a loading screen. So I'm only loading these specific assets instead of having to load all the assets for all the islands and all the places at the start, which would take a longer time. So only load things when you actually need them. All right, so we're gonna be using this same exact concept for us because we could have many different scenes like them. I think they have like four or five islands. So let's create local storage right in our experience folder. So I'm gonna do local storage.js. And of course, the same thing, I'm just gonna copy and paste this part. So because we are first person camera controls that are moving around, we only need two things that are important and that's the camera position, 
the camera location to determine what set of assets that we want to load, and the camera rotation itself. So let's init our player state. And we're going to be using the same exact structure that they did. So this dot string state equals, and we want player position. Of course, name this whatever you want. And you can also handle local storage however you want. That is more convenient to you. But I'm just going to do what Coastal World did. So by default, we're going to start outside. And I'll just give it the name White Run, which is from Skyrim. And then we want our coordinates, right? So we have our X, Y, and Z coordinates for our player position. Now, local storage only takes strings, which is why we have to use this convention with just a string like local world. You can see they used one big string for their player position as well. All right, and we also need player rotation. So I'll do call it player rotation. And then here we don't need anything special other than the X, Y, and Z rotation. And I'm misspelling something. Nope, I just forgot the commas. All right, so let's set up our position and rotation. So if local storage dot get item player position, if this exists and 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 local storage dot player rotation exists, then we can set the string state to be that stuff in the local storage. Otherwise, we're going to be setting some defaults and player position player rotation. Let's add some brackets here. So we can grab our this dot thing here, and then we want to set just the player position and the player rotation equal to local storage. So let's add equals, and let's just copy and paste these. Two cursors here, paste. Okay, and if local storage does not have these stuff existed yet, we want to set it in local storage. So let's do else. And then we'll just do local storage dot set item and we need to pass in that string so player position we're going to set it to this dot string state dot player position and scroll down and then we just want to do the same thing here so i'm just going to paste it with player rotation all right now i want to actually set a state object that allows us to use it a lot easier instead of this string format so i'm just going to copy this and create a new one right here here our application can use this object so this dot state equals and our location is going to be this dot string state dot player position dot split and we want to split it and we want to split it by this um i forgot what that's called this line thing here which is this right here so so we're splitting it here so it's a, an array with a string of this a string of this and this and this so we just want the first one there. Then of course, we also want to do it for all the other ones. So I'm just going to speed run through that. And then for the rotation as well. And we also want to convert all of these to numbers. All right, now we actually have to update our objects so we can use them appropriately. So I'm going to create an update function here and I'm going to do this dot set up. Whoops, set state object. And we also want another function, this dot update local storage. Whoops. So let's create this and yeah, we can just put it right here. Actually, let's put it before so it's more organized. Then all we have to do is just set the item. So local storage dot set item. And we want to set player position. And it looks like my tab nine is already doing something. So first we want to give it, remember the same exact format right here. So we're going to need a string literal. And right here, and then we want this dot state dot location, which is right here. And then we want the camera position, which is why we imported the camera right here. So this dot camera dot perspective camera, perspective camera, perspective camera dot position dot X. And I'm not getting the syntax because this thing is over here when it should be over here. 
this closing back tick there. And then we just want to split the other ones as well. So we want to do it for Y and Z. Y and Z. So let's put a Z here. And let's just save for some formatting. Yeah, so set the player position. We want to set its location. The camera's current position X, position Y, and position Z. And we need to do the same exact thing for the rotation. So we're going to do player rotation. And I'm just going to give it an underscore so it's got some di differentiation. So we have player rotation, underscore X, underscore Y, underscore Z, just like that. Now let's just set our string state to equal these local storage values. Now we could just grab the local storage here instead of using our string state object here, but it's just more easier this way for me. Of course, it's just a matter of preference and there's not gonna to be too many major performance issues. So this dot string state dot player position equals local storage, get item, and it will be player position. And we also want the player rotation as well. So let's just copy that and paste it there. All right, one last thing we need is to set this location object. So let's create a new function called set location, location, and let's grab a location here. And all we're doing is setting this this dot state dot location equals the location that we pass in here from wherever. Okay, that should be it. And let's just check for everything looking good. Nope, nope, we have an error here. I we don't want the location in the player rotation. So let's just get rid of that. And let me just slowly scroll through this so you can see one last time. If you want to. Pause the video there. All right, let's go back to experience.js. All right, next up is setting our resources. And remember, this takes our assets file that we haven't created yet or that assets array. So let's go into our utils folder and call this resources.js. All right, next we have set resources. This is going to be a little bit different from last time. So I'm going to try and go slower here. I'm going to do resources.js and I'm going to paste in the template here. So this time, instead of putting the loaders in resources, I'm going to be splitting them up just because the file is going to get really cluttered if we add the loaders here. It doesn't really matter. It's just a matter of preference. But you can see we have our items that we're going to add our stuff to. And then I'm just setting assets equals to the array of assets that we'll pass in here later. And then this dot location will determine what as set of assets that will load, which is why I have this dot location equals null here. So this is new for this project here. So let's create our assets first. So assets.js. And this is going to be that array of objects, right? I'm going to export default, default array. And and we call it outside or our landscape white run. So I'm going to call it white run. And I'm going to make that an object as well. Whoops, I forgot to wrap this in itself. Yeah, like so. And then we want assets in here. And that's going to be an array of objects with name, type, and path. So let's do that. I'm going to do name. So let's do that. I'm going to make an object name. And we want type. And we want path. So if we go into our models and textures here, we have landscape. So I'm going to call this landscape, landscape. And then the type, we can do either one first. I'm going to do the models first. So I'm going to call this GLB model, GLB model. Oops, let me do camel case. So then we just have to write the path to here. So it's going to be slash models slash landscape underscore with collider and then dot glb so because Vite already knows about the public folder we don't have to type public here i think it will also work if you do leave public but we don't have to do that all right let's do the other models for outside which are going to be the landscape items so i'm going to call this landscape underscore items but you know call it whatever you want and i'm just going to copy it right here so landscape underscore items and of course, we also have the house lastly. So we're going to shift alt down arrow one more time. And we're going to call this, mm, let's just call it breeze home. Breeze home. Also from Skyrim. And let's just call it house.glb. House.glb. Actually, let's just, actually, let's just rename this right here. So we have the same name, breeze home. 
I'm just going to copy and paste it right here. All right, so we are loading all our models. All right, now we want to load our house diffuse and landscape diffuse. So these are going to be image textures. So let's just copy and paste this. I'll actually shift alt down arrow twice. And let's control D to select the next instance and change this to image texture. And we're going to change this control, whoops, control D and change that to textures. And we want house diffuse. So I'm going to do house diffuse. And the next one's going to be landscape diffuse. So let's just change that to landscape. And it's going to be WebP here. And we should also keep these a little bit more consistent. So I'm going to rename this to um, Breeze Home Diffuse. By the way, diffuse just means color. I think I mentioned that before, but just in case we haven't, I'll just say that now. And then Breeze Home. So let's also copy Breeze Home here. You don't have to change this if you don't want. I'm just changing it to be a little more organized. And then we can call this landscape texture, landscape texture. And then this is going to be, whoops. This is going to be Breeze Home texture. That's going to be our exterior. Now we want to load all the assets for our interior scene. Now, again, you can have as many as you want, but for us, we're only having two just to save some time. So I'm going to call it, um, you know, call it whatever you want. I'll call it Breeze Home Interior. Here, let's just give it camel case and I'll be its own object and let's actually just um, copy and paste assets so we don't have to do it over and over and let's see what we have here so we just have interior items and interior with collider so I'm going to rename this just to copy and paste it so I'm going to put it here and I'll call it interior oops let's call it breeze home interior in case we have other interiors then we also want the interior items. So I'm going to rename that and uh, grab it here. Let's put it here. Oops, let's get rid of that. And I'll call it breeze home items, breeze home, breeze home items. And we only have one texture to load here. So I'm going to backspace control X to cut those out or delete them really quickly. And I'm just going to call this, uh, I'm just going to call this breeze home diffuse and actually I should have just copy and pasted so I'm going to rename copy and paste that paste it here and that's an image texture yeah and this should also not be breeze home diffuse it should be interior diffuse so let me highlight this control D and let's call it interior diffuse all right so yeah there might be some typos but we can like resolve it once we see and start running our app but yeah that's pretty much it for our assets again you can have as many scenes as you want all right so in resources.js we're just grabbing those assets now from experience we're importing the assets and resources is getting that assets so we're just getting this pretty much all right let's start on the loaders all right let's create the loaders and grab the loaders. So I'm going to create a loaders.js and I'm just going to paste this, but it's very similar to what we already did in the previous video. We're just creating a bunch of loaders and setting them up and we're adding it to this loaders object here. So in resources.js, when we create a new loaders, we're just grabbing all those loaders. Again, if you're from the future, they're changing this to like add ons or something. And I don't think it's going to be this either. So just make sure you have the right path if it's not working for you. You can always go into node modules and try and find it. So here we can see we have three, we have examples, we have JSM, and we have loaders, loaders. And here you can see all the loaders that we can use. Okay, the next thing we're gonna do is create a determine load function. And this will determine if we have to load those assets or if they've already been loaded. So here I have like a side of the day and let me, I'm at the latest waterfall. So if I click on one like sustainability district, you can see we're loading all the assets for sustainability district, right? However, when I go back, you can see it's still loading all that stuff. When I go back to the home stuff and go back to sustainability district, You can see I don't have any new loads for all those assets anymore. 
So this speeds up our load time, obviously, because we don't have to, you know, load it up again. Now, there are some award sites where when you switch between scenes, you actually have to reload all the assets over and over again. And that has special use cases. But for us, we are just going to, if you load it once, you don't actually have to load it again. So let's create that function right now. I'm going to call it determine load, but call it whatever you want. And of course we need location. This is going to determine if we've already loaded that location's assets or not. And I'm going to set this dot location equals location. So we can check this if this dot items dot has own property and we can call it this dot location. And let's put some brackets here for formatting. So what this does, it checks if the items object has this stuff right here, if it has white run in it or breeze home interior. And if it does not, we want to create that inside of our items object. So how do we do that? Well, we just pass in that location name. So this dot items, which is this object right here. Whoops, let's make sure we have it correct. And we're just going to do this dot location and we're going to set it equal to an empty object. So if we interact with something and we want to load the next scene, we're going to grab that location. Does the items object already have that? If it doesn't, then just create this key value pair, which is going to be that location name equal an empty object. If it doesn't exist, it's going to be empty. We can say start loading, start loading our assets for this location. Otherwise else we're going to emit ready. So emit ready like so. Now you can just return here and just get rid of the else, but I prefer the else in this case. So let's create emit ready real quick. It's just going to be emit ready and it's just going to signify, hey, we are ready to go. So this dot emit ready and we can listen to this later. All right, let's also create start loading. So start loading. Then we're going to do this dot loaded equals zero. We want to reset every time we start loading. Then we also need to set the queue length so we can do like a progress bar animation or something, or we know when all our stuff is done. So we're going to set this dot assets and we only have one object here. So again, you can organize this however you want. You could even put each of these into their own object. If that's what you prefer, you know, you can make them, but you know, it's all up to how you want to organize it. So let's go into resource.js and we're going to just going to grab the first index, which is just this gigantic object, right? So that's going to be the first index that we're grabbing right here. Then we want to check the style location. Then we want to pass in the location. So it's going to, it's one of the, you can imagine it's just going to be one of the IDs here that we're passing in. You can check if you want to, if it exists or not, just to avoid errors. But I already know that we're only going to be passing in stuff that exists. So, you know, it doesn't really matter. And then we want to grab that assets and then the length of those assets, the number of those assets. So again, we have this dot assets, which is the giant object starting from here. Then we have this dot location, which we're grabbing either white run and breeze home interior, and they all have their own assets, which is an array of assets. And then we're just getting the length of that. So how many objects are in the assets there? Then we can start going through them and loading them. So for const asset of this dot assets and zero and this dot location it's location dot assets we can console dot log for the time just to see assets actually let's just say loading asset loading single asset and now we can you know remember use our type to determine which loader we can use and of course the loader needs a path so we also have our path right here so at this point it's just review so i'm going to copy and paste it in here if the asset dot type remember whoops i should be calling this asset so asset if the asset dot type equals equals glb model which is just checking right here then use the gltf loader that we got from the loaders object that we got that we set to this class variable right here all right let's create this dot single asset loaded so i'm going to copy this and let's get out and let's make sure we're getting out of here. Let's do that. And whoops, we don't want this when it's a single function like though. And here is the same thing as last time, this dot items, this dot location, and then asset dot name. And we're gonna set it equal to the file that we just loaded from right here. 
So we're calling it, we're putting in the file, we're putting in the file here, and this dot loaded plus plus. So we're just incrementing the counter right here that we've been resetting. And if this dot loaded equals 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 this dot q, which is the length. So if there's five and loaded equals five, it means it's ready. So then we can just call this dot emit ready to emit that event that we can listen to, which is what we called right here as well. All right, that should be it. So I'm just gonna slowly scroll through it. If you want to pause the video and take a look. Again, we might have typos, but we can always resolve those later. All right, let's create our world and see if we can actually even see anything. So I'm gonna go into my experience folder. I'm gonna create that world folder. And then of course we need world.js in here. Now I'm gonna create three other folders that we'll use later. And it's gonna be a folder for each scene. So we have two scenes. And we also want another folder, which is going to hold the player of the world. So I'm going to call it white run, which is our landscape, our outside. And then I also want our interior, you know, maybe breeze home interior. If you have a bunch of interiors, just to be more specific, but I'm just going to call it interior because we only have one. And then we have another one for player. I'll get to these. I'll get to these a little bit later, but for now, I just want to make sure we are actually loading stuff correctly and can see our models properly because so far we've been coding blindly so let's resolve those errors before we move on of course we need this stuff as usual and we also need this stuff so i'm going to add two brackets and save for formatting all right now we need to get the location so what i'm going to do is this dot storage equals this dot experience dot local storage so that's our class that we got whoops sorry no parentheses here and actually let's just call this local storage so it's consistent and then we want to get the state object that we have of here so if we go to here we have this dot state which is this object here so we can just grab it through our experience class and i'll call it this dot state equals this dot storage dot state storage dot state then we can determine if we should load based on our state so let's do this dot resources dot determine load, which is that function that we created. And we want to pass in this dot state dot location, which we're updating on every single frame, which is right here. So we're passing that in into resources. Resources is going to grab it right here. Does the items object already have that location? If it doesn't, then create it and start loading the assets in there. Otherwise, you know, just admit that we are already ready. All right. So this dot resources dot on ready, which is that emit ready. Then let's make an arrow function. It's just console dot log hello world hello world, and let's just whoops hello world and let's just save that. All right, now let's start our local development server and take a look at all the errors that we're probably gonna get, but we can just fix them right now because we've been blending code. Let's just take a look. Of course, it's a white screen. We have a bunch of errors probably. Let's see. Let me zoom in so you can see it. Cannot read properties of undefined reading state. Let's see. So this doesn't exist. Let's see. Um, yep, storage, it should be local storage. Let's save that. Cannot read properties of undefined reading asset. All right, so let's take a look at what this says. Okay, so up to here works. And after here, it doesn't exist. So that obviously means that this dot location is probably messed up. We're not passing in the right location. So just to check that, let's go into world and let's just console.log um, this dot state. So let's do console.log this dot state. Yeah, so mm, I see the issue here. So I was working on a, a a development server on the same URL so I have another local storage here from that so um, that's what this information here is from so what we can do temporarily is go into local storage and right before we check we can just clear out the local storage with the built-in method so I'm gonna do local storage and I'll do dot clear and just clear it out okay see now we got something now we get what white run and then we have five loading single assets from resources.js. Remember, we console.log this, so we can just get rid of that right now. Now we have a bunch of errors that we can fix here. So this.world.update is not a function. And that's right, because we need to go in world.js and create an update function in here. 
update and we can just leave it empty for now let's see what else all right let's just save it to make sure okay that's gone asset is not defined let's see here and yeah we forgot to put parameters in here so let's go into let's see was it resources yeah resources.js and of course we need asset and file so i'm just going to copy and paste that here as well all right so let's see all right, and we got Draco error loaders, and that's because I forgot to put the Draco folder inside of our public folder like we did last time. All right, so let's go into our node modules folder and put it up in there. So we wanna to go to our three package and examples, JS this time, and let's go into libs and then Draco folder, and we wanna copy this entire thing. So I'm gonna copy it. And let's just close up our folders here. And we just want to paste it into our public folder. So I'm going to right click and paste it right in there. So now we have our Draco loader in here. And let's just save. Let's control shift S to save everything. And let's just check for any errors. Yeah, and it looks like we did a pretty good job. There are no errors. We have hello world. So, you know, now it's looking good. All right. And just to make sure we can actually see stuff, I'm just going to copy and paste the. 3GS getting started scene, the default cube. So I'm just going to paste that in here and I'm going to add it to the scene real quick. This.scene.add. And then we're going to do this.scene equals this.experience. This.experience.scene. Let's save that and let's see if we can see a green cube. We can't. That's probably because the camera position is too far. But if we, I guess we. We should be able to zoom in and out and move around. So maybe maybe our orbit controls isn't working. Let's go to camera.js. And yeah, we need to update this on every frame. So this.controls.update. And let's save that. Let's zoom in and out. Well, we can't see anything either. Let's just temporarily set our camera position a little bit back. This.perspective camera dot position dot z equals negative five yeah and there we have it yeah so we do have orbit controls but for some reason yeah so we can see that and that's great so everything is working which is great we did a good job we resolved all those errors awesome stuff all right so i'm going to get rid of this and this stuff as well so i'm just going to control x control x and delete that this chapter is ending. I actually just want to set up Git right now, GitHub, so we can push our changes and you guys can take a look at the code for each one. So I'm going to call this Immersive World, but you know, call it whatever you want. And let's create that repository. Let's open a new terminal with Control Shift backtick. And if you don't have a terminal, you can just hit Control backtick and it'll just bring up the other terminal. All right, let's do Git init. Also add this origin, just copy and paste it. Get commit dash m and i'll say end of chapter five actually yeah end of chapter five of course you can name it whatever you want whoops i forgot to do get add everything all right now we can just go up get commit dash m end of chapter five and then we can do get push dash u for upload origin and main your branch might be master uh, hmm, maybe mine is master as well. Let's see, master. Yeah, so my branch is master. I thought I changed it to main, but I guess it's going to be master. Yeah, this shouldn't be taking so long, so let's see what the issue here is. I'm going to hit control C to cancel it. Yeah, there's no way our object... Yeah, there's no way our object should be that big and taking that long. So I investigated it, and it actually looks like my interior with my collider is uh, 130 megabytes for some reason. So... I'm going to have to re-export that from Blender. I don't know how that's even possible, but yeah. So I'm going to select my collider, my collider and my stuff, and then I'll export it again. File, export, TLTF. And I'm going to go in assets and just call it interior with collider to replace it. And I just want to make sure compression is on. I mean, even with compression, it shouldn't be that big. Oh, I accidentally exported the materials with it. Yeah, so no export. That is why it's so big. It's supposed to save my export settings, but for some reason when I exported this one, I guess it came with the materials. 
So, okay, now it should be fine. I'm going to export that and I'm going to re-import that into my here. So let's go and find it. Yeah, now you can see it's only six kilobytes. So that that export material thing really, you know, really messes stuff up. You need some special configuration in Blender for the node tree to make sure that the material isn't going to make that in, insanely high file size. So I'm just going to click and drag this to replace it. It's the same name, so we don't have to touch anything. All right, let's do it again. So git add, git commit dash m, and let's say end of chapter five. And let's do git push dash u origin master. Still big, let's see. Yeah, definitely shouldn't be this big. What we can do is just delete the git folder and just restart VS code. All right, let's do the same thing. Get in it. Get commit dash M. End of chapter five. Oh, whoops. We need to add the remote origin first because we deleted all of Git. Get commit dash M. End of chapter five. Whoops. Get add. All right, then we can just get push dash U origin master. Yeah, now it's much faster. Yeah, so that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be fast. So let's refresh our page. Yeah, and there we have it. All right, yeah, we finished setting up the project. That's the end here. And if you want, you can just check the commit here to get all the code that I just wrote. Welcome to chapter six. In this chapter, we're gonna set up our assets and also generate the awk tree for our collider. In other words, set up our collider. All right, let's go into our world.js and put in here and create a function called set world set world let's also copy this so we can just use it let's for now just set the um, just one of them so i'm going to set the white run first which is our outside so i just call it this dot white run equals new white run white run and we need to import that obviously so i'm going to import and let's go into our white run folder and call it right now so and I'm just going to paste a common boilerplate that we keep using. And this class is actually technically optional. But what I'm going to do is for all the components for the white run, for example, the breeze home interior, uh, sorry, the breeze home and the landscape items and the landscape colliders, I'm going to put them in their own folder called um, component. So components, uh, components of white run. And then I'm just going to import it in this class and I'll create all of them here. So, so in components, I'm going to create landscape.js, not JS. And this will handle our landscape with collider. So I'm just going to paste in the general boilerplate. All right. And of course we need our experience and this dot scene so we can add our model to the actual scene. So I'm going to do this dot init landscape and this dot set materials. And later I'll get to this later, but we're going to set our landscape collider. Remember we exported it with the, we exported it with the collider. Now you don't have to, you can separate the collider as its own object. If you want to, you know, it's a matter of preference. Like maybe, for example, you wanted the same app, but like a different collider for some reason, then, you know, maybe you would want to keep it separate. You could technically export it with two colliders at once and just change it like that. But, you know, it's it depends on what you want to do. So I'm going to do in it landscape. And let's just go. So I'll call this dot landscape equals this dot resources dot items. Remember, that's that uh, our items thing. Oh, I forgot to grab the resources. So obviously we need resources equals this dot experience dot resources. So we're grabbing the resources that we loaded, the items object that we added to, which is right here. And we need to get the white run assets. The white run assets, remember we gave it this thing here, this key value pair. So it's going to be white run. And then all the loaded assets of white run are going to be in this object that we can use. And then we can get the name. So remember right here, we just add the asset name as the second. So we have a key, key, 
equals that actually loaded file. So let's go to assets.js and find our landscape. Yeah, it's just called landscape. So we should just be able to just do landscape, landscape, and then we want the scene of that. So let's see. Now let's just console.log to make sure we get this landscape. Of course, we're not going to see anything yet because we need to import it in white run. So I'm going to import, import, and I'll call this landscape from dot slash components slash landscape dot js. And let's just create it here. This dot landscape. Whoops. I want that capital landscape equals new landscape. All right, let's start a development server. If yours was closed, npm on dev. And let's control shift I and let's refresh our page. And yes, we do indeed. We got the constant landscape and we do have our landscape here. Of course, this isn't a function yet, but we can still see our uh, our landscape. We also want the landscape texture. So I'm just going to shift all down arrow and I'll call this landscape texture. Let me actually select the next one and texture. Whoops. Landscape texture. And we don't want the scene of this because it's just an image. So I think the name is landscape texture. Let's actually just check. Mm -mm -mm. No, it's landscape underscore texture. Okay, let me actually just put this on the side so I can see it a little bit better and control B to close that. Yeah, it's kind of weird that I'm using camel case and underscores. Usually you only want to do one, um, but you know, whatever. It doesn't really matter, you know, just Keep organized how you want to keep organized. All right, and set materials. I mean, this is kind of optional as well. Like you could just do it in in it initialize landscape, but I'm just gonna separate it. And because there might be a lot of other things that you want to put in in it that we might get to. I don't know yet, depending on the time of the video. So first we want to flip y. So this dot landscape dot texture dot flip y. Now, sometimes when you leave it as true, it actually works instead of setting it to false, but you know, just get rid of it if it doesn't work. And then we went on to set the encoding of the landscape texture so that it matches what we're kind of looking at. So that's gonna be sRGB encoding. I'm actually gonna make our model use this texture. So there are a lot of ways to do it. I think the most common is traversing all the objects you can also get an object by name, which is what we'll use for the collider. But I'm just gonna go through each one and just map the texture to it. So this dot landscape dot children dot find, and we'll do child, and then child dot material equals new, and we want basic material. We don't want any other fancy material because they take more performance. Of course, unless you want this texture to react to light, then you're gonna need something like mesh standard material. But I'm not gonna be using any real-time lighting, so I'm gonna stick with mesh basic material. And then I just wanna map uh, this dot landscape texture on there. All right, I think then now we can just add it to the scene and we should be able to see it. So let's do this dot scene dot add and this dot landscape. So shift pan shift click to move up you can also use right mouse button to move and so on and so forth and yeah there is our landscape and it actually looks pretty good first we see our collider here which we'll remove later and yeah you can see its uvs are messed up and it's trying to map it's trying to map this texture to all the children in the glb file which is the island itself and this collider and you can see it's kind of messed up there but yeah um, so to set up our collider we need to create, we need to generate an octree for that collider. So I'm gonna go into world.js and I'm gonna create an octree here. So let's import it. I'm gonna come up to the top here and I'm just gonna import octree. Let me close this out here. And this is from three examples slash JSM slash math slash octree. Again, if you're from the future, it might be add ons or some other path. Then we can create the octree here. This dot octree equals new octree and this is what i showed when in the blender section where i talked about what coastal world did they're creating an octree for their collider so let's go back into let's see landscape and let's create this function here i'm gonna just copy and paste it 
And I'm going to set the const collider. So I'm going to do const collider equals this dot landscape, which is that GLB file with the two children. And then we can just use get object by name, get object by name. And if you don't remember when you named your collider, when you exported it, you can just go back into Blender. And click on your collider and then period key over here. And I call it landscape underscore collider. So I'm just going to put that in here as a string landscape underscore collider. And then we want to generate the octree, tree, but first we actually need to grab it. So I'm going to call this this dot octree tree equals this dot experience dot world dot octree. And now we can use it. So we need to generate those collider things. So I'm going to do this dot octree dot from graph node. And let's remove it from our parent. So collider dot remove from parent. And let's also dispose of the geometry and material because we don't want to see it. Geometry. And we also want the same for the material as well. We don't want it to have a material. So just to help visualize the collider, let's actually import a octree helper from this path here. And we are just going to set it up right here because why not? So I'll just call it const helper equals new octree helper, octree helper. And we just want this dot octree. And I think we have to set this visible to true. And then we can just add it to the scene. So this dot scene dot add helper. Now let's see, let's go to back to our browser. So now we should be able to see our octree. And indeed we do. So one thing I'm going to do just to save some time is going to go into my camera on the update function. I'm just going to console.log the this dot perspective camera dot position. Now you don't have to, it's not affecting you, but I don't like how my camera is always starting here. So I'm just going to move my camera until I get to like a position that I like this position. So I'm just going to copy and paste this. And now let's go into camera.js. This is going to be my default position. This dot perspective camera dot position dot set. And let's just copy and paste that in there. Whoops. Yeah, we don't need this. I don't think that should work. Yeah, now my camera always starts here. So at this point, I should probably explain a very high level overview of what an octree is. So imagine you have this massive scene and like you have a bunch of bounding boxes around each one. So let's just say this we have like this and this is you, this green triangle. And in order to detect for collisions, these orange things are going to be overlapping. So it's going to be like this and then it's going to say, hey, it's been collided with. So in order for you to know if you've collided with something or not, you'd have to check if this collided with this and this collided with this and this collided with this. And if you do this for hundreds of objects, it's going to take, you know, a lot of performance, a lot of performances, and we're not even near those objects. So the idea behind an octree is squared up pretty much. And once you're only in like a certain area, it will only detect collisions of the objects in that area. And then as you move the oct tree, it's going to, you know, check only those collisions and those collisions. So you don't have to calculate, you know, all the object collisions and so on and so forth. Now, that's a very, very high level overview of it. Also, since we're on the topic of the landscape, I should mention that it does look a little bit blurry when you get close to it. So obviously the easiest solution is just to increase to an 8k texture so what coastal world actually did was use this technique called texture splatting so this might be more up your alley if you're familiar with shaders if not you don't really have to worry about it you can just increase the resolution of blender and yeah like even if you do 8k oh, so let me do Control shift r if we just take a look right now like it's not that bad like it's 3.4 megabytes and the Getty, the realistic Getty Persepolis release site, this realistic Getty Persepolis release site has like 160 megabytes of resources. So like there's no real set amount that a user will wait to load, but obviously the smaller, the better. 
Yeah, so if you wanted to fix those blurry textures, that's probably what I would do. I would increase the resolution or maybe the number of samples in Blender and rebake it and re-export it. Or I would use the texture splatting technique. Okay, let's start creating our breeze home. So I'm going to do breeze home equals new breeze home. And let's do the same thing. We just shift alt down arrow, double click, control D, breeze home. Whoops, I don't want this to be... I don't want this like that. Okay, let's go into components and call Breeze Home. Breeze Home.js. And let's just copy and paste landscape into Breeze Home. And let's just change this. You actually don't have to change the class name, but anyway, let's just do it. I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to keep everything. Yeah, we don't need this function. And I should get rid of it here. And let's call it init in it actually just to save time i'm just going to leave all of it as init so we don't have to keep typing it out like it's kind of already implied that you're initting the class there just by the class name so we don't have to keep typing out like init breeze home and i think we have all of them the same so i think we can just hold landscape control shift l and just type in breeze home instead. And hopefully this works. So let's just go and check. And I misspelled this. So let's go to white run. And yeah, I misspelled this. Set properties of undefined flip Y, which means this doesn't exist. And yeah, that's because I misspelled it. So control shift L again, and let me just paste breeze home and lowercase fb. All right. Oh, I see the issue. I misspelled it here. So let me just save that with Breeze Home. All right. Can we see our house? Yeah. Next up, next up are the items. So I'm going to go into components again, and I'm just going to call it items.js. And let's just copy and paste a Breeze Home one in here. Let's call it mm, items and yeah landscape items so i'm just going to control shift l landscape items we actually don't have any texture for this so i'm gonna get rid of this now if you do have a texture for your landscape items you can do the same thing but i actually don't so i'm actually just going to give it a color actually let me just comment this out i'll just give it a color f zero zero f zero zero so it should be um red green blue so this is going to be red and yeah let me just save that and of course we also need to import it here so let's import items and let's do this to items items equals new items let's control shift s make sure to save everything and yeah so we got red and you can see our items here, our monkey head, and our interactive stuff that we can interact with. Now we want to do the same thing for the interior. So I'm going to go into world, and I'm just going to shift all down arrow and call this dot interior equals new interior, interior. And of course, we also want to change this, control shift D, D, interior.js. And you can just set it up like we did before or however you want interior.js and components so just repeat the process for as many scenes as you have and i'm actually in the next chapter going to be using a different set of assets but everything we've already done will be identical to that new file only the assets will be different now before i conclude this chapter i want to talk about instancing and if you don't care about that, you know, feel free to go and skip to the next chapter. It's not going to affect anything. So if you don't know what, so if you don't know what instancing is, you can just um, look it up. But here's a really nice definition if you want to read that. And I just want to talk about how to instance with some custom geometry. So let me create a new function in here. Uh, this dot set instances. And yeah, I'm going, and I'm just going to put it here. And we need a like a dummy object, essentially, to manipulate so we can instance at those locations. 
So I would just call it const dummy equals new three, whoops, three dot object 3D. And the object 3Ds are just objects like these and like cameras and so on and so forth. So all of them inherent from object.3D. We need the number of instances we want. So I'm just gonna call, call this const instances and I'll just set it to two. Then we need to generate our instant mesh. So we can just do const instance house equals new three, whoops, three dot instanced, instanced mesh. Let's make sure I spelled that correctly. Instanced mesh, yeah, that looks right. And then we need to pass into geometry here. So it'll be this dot breeze home geometry. And we also want to grab its material, which is right here. So what we can do is this dot breeze home dot material. And then we want the number of instances. So I'm just going to put instances here and save that here. Then we have to tell it to update its instance matrix. Or in other words, you know, just update the positions. So this, uh, whoops, instance house dot instance matrix, instance matrix. It's kind of fancy, but it's just like something that tells something to move. So, you know, if you don't know what a matrix is, it doesn't really matter. Needs update, and we have to set that to true. And once we update this dummy position, we can update its matrix, and then we can set the instance bush, bush's matrix to the dummy object's matrix. So let's just make a for loop for let i, for let i equals zero, i less than instances, i plus plus, set whoops dummy dot position dot x equals zero. You know, just put some random random values here. That you actually, since we're doing two, let's actually create a counter variable. So I'll just do plus i so we can i plus i so we can like see the two instances plus i. And then all we have to do is instance house i, which is the index, and then we just set it to the dummy matrix or the dummy position in other words. So in other words, you can just think, oh, matrix is just position matrix. So in other words, just think of the matrix as the position. We just have to use this to when working with instanced. All right, and let's just add it. This dot scene dot add instanced house. So yeah, right here. And let's save and let's restart our server and take a look. And we have an error because I forgot to comment that out. So let me just comment this out. Back arrow, save everything. S cannot read cannot read properties of undefined reading material. And yeah, that's because I misspelled it again. So let's go to Breeze Home and fix that spelling. And let's take a look at our instance meshes. So it's likely it's just somewhere in oblivion that we can't see. So let's actually set it like right here so we can just see see it and let's go into our camera to get the position here and let's go back alt back arrow and i'm just going to put three cursors here and like so and let's just let's just get rid of this and i think that was xyz whoops i don't want the comma here now this will set both our instances on top of each other but that's fine and we still can't see it, so it's probably an issue with one of these. Let me just console.log, stop breeze home, stop breeze home, dot geometry. Yeah, it's undefined. Yeah, and it's a group, so we need to grab the children, like the actual mesh. And this will have the geometry for us right here. So, yeah, this should be dot children. And I think we also need zero as well to get the first one in the index of the array. And yeah, there we have our, our house there. Yeah, now you can see we have our instance house there. And if I go into the network tab, it's still 5.8 megabytes of resources, but we have an identical house here. So here I'm going back to virtual Dubai. You can see they have all these trees here. And 
If you go into their full bake, you can actually see all the tree shadows that you see right here, right? However, it's highly unlikely that they're actually exporting all these trees and all of them are actually just instances of each other. They just saved it into the position and they probably changed the rotation a little bit as well. So here you can see all their shadows here. So in Blender, you have all the trees scattered everywhere. You bake the texture with those shadows and you log all those positions, maybe with a Python script or just manually doing it. And then you can distribute it with 3GS instancing mesh. And if you look really closely, which you can't actually get really closely, it looks like all of them are actually identical. There might be some like two different variations just for variety, but it seems like most of them are pretty identical. So yeah. Okay, and since this is the end of this chapter, let's do one more commit, git add, git commit dash m, end of chapter six, of course, next. put whatever you want, git push dash u origin master. That's the end of chapter six. We generate an arc tree and we set up our colliders and our assets. Now, like I said, if you want to follow my set of assets, you can come here and click on the link. There is no link currently, but there will be when I post this video. So you can just come here and take a look if you want that. Welcome to chapter seven. In this chapter, we're going to create a player that can walk and look around the scene. Before we move on to this chapter, I just want to talk about some common errors you might see when you're loading your models. And the first one, as you can see, there's some glitching effect here. And this is called Z index fighting. And it kind of depends on your camera angle and like your distance from there. Essentially, the issue is that the computer doesn't know which face is in front. So the easiest way to replicate this is to have one thing right on top of another. And you can see I get that Z index fighting right in Blender as well. And that's what's happening here. So, you know, again, it kind of depends on your angle, your distance and so on and so forth. But if you have that Z index fighting, all you have to do is just slightly move it out. So here I have that Z index fighting. I can just slightly move it out like so. And now you can see I don't get that Z index fighting. Now, of course, it might depend on your angle. Here I am getting it. So maybe I have to go up a little bit more. And yeah, as you can tell, you barely can tell that they're separate apart, but it does fix that issue there. Of course, the other alternative to do is just to go around your object and not through your object. So if I go to GX, you know, and Shift D GX and go around my object instead of through my object, then I can also solve it this way as well. So they can be on the same plane. Those are two ways to fix that. Additionally, if it's in a convenient spot, you could technically just hide it like here. If I had like maybe like a lamp or something or like a deck a porch i could just put it over here and you know nobody would see that anyway but if i wanted to fix this in blender i would just select this entire face and just pull it out on the x-axis so they're not intersecting directly on the same plane and so i'm in blender and just to show you i just pit pull this face gxx and just move it outside a little bit and now it won't be z index fighting anymore now the other problem you might be seeing are black artifacts on your baked textures so here's like a really good example of that you can see there's like black marks on here that's just the result of poor unwrapping so i just use smart uv project because it saves a lot of time but you know of course the result is going to be poor as well and you know we baked on a black image so that black is kind of like leaking in onto those smaller unwrapped areas the good thing though is if you're from very far away like even from here no one's going to notice those black artifacts. So, you know, if you're just viewing from here, you don't have to fix those. Of course, when you're getting up close, you know, you should fix those. And another error you might see, I'm back in Blender, but I'm using the baked texture as well, is some materials that are in wrong places. For example, here you can see some wood here when it's supposed to be stone. And that's because of overlapping UVs. So if I select these faces, and I hit period key on my numpad to focus them here. You'll see that I'm up. I am overlapping with these, which are below it. And if I click on this and hit my period key over here, you can see, oh, well, I guess it's not stone. It's a different kind of stone. So, you know, this is, this is below this UV. So it, it's the one that's going to get baked here. And 
remember UVs are just maps. So we're mapping to that baked texture, which is going to be this one, which is why we see that uh, that stone appearing here as well. I don't know if you remember when we took a look at unconventional galleries, 3D models in Blender and their UVs, but I'll just tell you that they had a ton of overlapping UVs. And, you know, they can get away with it because their entire scene is pretty much just the same exact white texture. So instead of baking their entire scene, they can just bake, you know, like certain certain lighting on certain areas and then just reuse those UVs everywhere so they don't need to load more textures. For most cases, though, you don't want overlapping UVs. Like for our case, we don't want overlapping UVs because it's going to cause those errors. And that's kind of the entire point of when you unwrap, there is a margin. And this just puts a margin between your unwraps. So I left it at zero just to compress everything down. But as you can see, we get those overlapping UVs. Now, of course, you know, depending on your website, you might be able to get away with overlapping UVs. But for me, that's obviously not the case, but I'm not going to worry about that. But again, here I'm on the side of the day called Iconic Mints, and you can see they have noticeable seams here. You can see when the texture changes, where they mark the seam to unwrap it, and their texture is actually really low quality as well. So, you know, it doesn't really matter too much that our texture, our landscape is low resolution. It's about the overall experience. I did not make these assets myself. I wanted to save some time, so I bought them from Fred on ArtStation. And this is the title if you want to look it up. It's well worth the price. You get 89 elements for only $10.40. However, if you have a lot of money to spend, you know, like $200 or $300, you can take a look at some of the other assets that are going to be much, much better quality and have a lot more variety. Let's create our player. I'm going to set it equal to null. So this dot player equals null. And if this dot player is null, we can create a new player. So if this dot player equals 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 null, then we can create that from here. So I'm gonna create player.js inside of our folder that we made earlier. And I'm gonna import that from here. So I'm just gonna let's just do yeah, let's put it here. Of course you can put it wherever you want. Import player from dot slash player slash player dot js these so maybe this one in here i'm just going to call it player let's exit this out let's get rid of this stuff so we're going to be using a capsule as our physics body to detect collisions now why a capsule well it's like a game dev thing but essentially it's just closely it's you know it's closer to the actual human body here you can see if we used a sphere for detection, it would be kind of weird. Um, same with a box, but for a capsule, it's going to be, you know, closer to a human figure. Now, maybe, now you might be saying, okay, why don't we just, you know, use the actual human figure instead of one of these primitive objects? Well, of course, if you do use one of these complex meshes, you know, that's going to take a performance hit. You're going to need, you know, higher resources to handle those issues. And in your use case, you might want to, you know, just stick to a box or a sphere, you know, it kind of just depends on your use case. Of course, these are going to be, you know, better performing than a capsule as well. Luckily for us, 3GS in 3.js slash example slash JSM slash math has this thing called capsule.js that will create, you know, a capsule for us without us actually having to, you know, create the math. And as you can see in this class, it takes a start vector and an end vector and a radius. So if we go to that diagram that we saw here, essentially what it means is we're going to put in a start vector that labels this point in space, you know, the X, Y, and Z coordinates of this point. It's going to be right here. So this is going to be our start vector. And then we have an end vector, which is up here somewhere. And this is going to be the X, Y, Z of that point instead. And then the radius just determines this part right here. Right, so the radius in all three dimensions at that point, and this will create our capsule, right? So you can imagine this creates our capsule here. All right, so 
So let's go into player.js and import capsule from that path. So it's going to be import capsule. And I think it was from three. We can just alt tab to take a look. Let me, we can just alt tab to take a look. It's going to be three examples JSON math. Of course, you can always check your node modules folder as well. Now, of course, now we also need to import all that other stuff that we always have. So I'm just going to copy and paste this into player.js as well. Our player is just going to be the camera. So that's pretty much all we need. We just need this dot experience, of course, equals new experience. And this is going to give us an error because we have to go back some directories. So let's do dot dot slash dot dot slash. And yeah, okay, that should be fine then. And all we need from our experience class this time is just the camera because the camera is going to be our player. And let's just create an init function. And of course, there are a lot of ways, you know, to structure your own code. I'm going to create a player object. So I'll call it this dot player and I'll set it equal to an empty object. Now the body of this player, this player dot body equals the camera. And we want to grab the perspective camera of the camera class. So if we go to your camera, it's going to be this camera right here that we create right here. Remember this dot camera is the entire class. And then this dot camera dot perspective camera is this one right here. So I'm going to hit alt left arrow to get back to where I was. By the way, you can call this whatever you want. You know, it's your object. Do whatever you want to call it. Now I want some booleans. So I want to know if the player is on the floor. And for this reason, you know, if you're on the floor, you can move faster. If you're in the air, you can you go a little bit slower and so on and so forth. There are a lot of reasons why you might want a on the floor Boolean value. Set the gravity. So I'm going to set the player gravity to, you know, some arbitrary value. Currently, you can always tweak these later. Then we want a default spawn. So I'm going to call it spawn and I'm going to create vectors. I'm going to set that and this spawn default is going to have a position to it. And I'll be in new three vector three. And I'm just going to leave it empty for now. We can determine that later. And then we can have a rotation and I'll just leave it mm, empty as well. And we also have the velocity. Of course, we can also leave that empty as well. And whoops, rotation should be a Euler instead. All right, let's also create a ray caster for this player. And if you don't know what a ray caster is, don't worry about it. We'll get to this once we get to this. But essentially, this will shoot a ray from our camera to see what is in front of it. You know, imagine you're in a dark room and you turn on a flashlight, you know, it shoots a ray at the first object that you're intersecting. And 3GS Raycaster goes through objects, but you know, you can imagine the same logic there as well. We can set a player height. So this is going to be how high they are from, you know, the ground or wherever they are. And I'm just going to put it arbitrary at 1.7 from experience. Of course, we need the player position that we're going to be updating new three vector three. We also need rotation that will also be here. So let me just copy and paste that and I'll call it rotation. And then let's also change the rotation order. So I'm going to call it rotation dot order. And I'm going to set it to Y, X, Z. By this order, well, it just makes things a little bit easier. So we need the player's speed or most commonly known as velocity. And I'll call it new three vector three. And we also need the direction the player is going. And you'll see why in a little bit. Then we can have some other stuff that we can tweak. So like a speed multiplier. So I'm going to call it speed multiplier. Speed multiplier. I'm going to set it to 0 0.8. Now you can have several different speed multipliers. You know, for maybe speed multiplier for running, for jumping or so on and so forth. Or you can just manually set it later. All right, let's also create a collider for our player. So I'm gonna call this dot player and I'm just gonna call it collider. And of course it'll just be a new capsule that we 
you know, that we imported here. So we're just going to create a new capsule and it'll just take, you know, the two vectors that we talked about. Oops, don't want those semicolons there. And then we can just give it a radius. Now, if you want to split these up in their own functions, you know, go feel free ahead, you know, to change whatever you want to change. I might as well explain this now before we move on. So why we are changing it to YXZ. If you go to the documentation, you can see XYZ is the rotation default. And essentially, it's the order in which your rotations are applied. And they always use the local coordinate system. So this is the same concept in Blender as well. So by default, let's say this is your head and this green thing is your face. And you want to look at this object right here. So if we go for this default order XYZ, then how do we look at this? Well, that's XX for the local X axis, but it also shares the world axis, right? So our XX is just going to be the world X axis. And you would have to turn your head like this first if you wanted to look at that object. Of course, you could also also do this where you go up and here. However, that's not natural for humans. When you want to look something behind you, you don't, you know, flip your head like that or or, you know, flip your head like this to look at something behind you. If you do YXZ first, in Blender, the Z axis is the Y axis in 3GS. So I'm just going to hit the Z axis, but I'm going to be saying Y axis. So we do the Y axis first, R, Z, and Blender, Z axis. And then we turn our head to look at that object, right? And then the next thing that comes up is the X, which is the local X axis, and then R, X, X. And then we can pitch our head like that. And now you can see it's a lot more natural. So every time I want to move, I can just do R, Z, rotate it, and then R, X, X, and take a look. And that's a lot more easier to work with, and it's a lot more natural than what we saw previously if we do the order with X, Y, Z first. So you could put the controls in another file if you wanted to, but for this video, I'm just going to keep it in the same uh, player class. All right, so let's give our player the ability to move their camera around with their mouse. So First, what we need to do is disable our orbit orbit controls in camera.js. So we can come in here and we can just have a cursor here and also make sure to put cancel the update as well because we're not going to be creating it. So I commented out set orbit controls. I also commented out the update function. Now, the, now we also need to set a default position so it makes us our lives easier. And the easiest way to do that is just go into Blender and kind of just add any random mesh just forward to see their position. So I'm just going to add a cube here and grab their location right here. So the x-axis for me, it's going to be 13.64 meters. So we can just copy and paste that. Now the Z is going to be the Y axis. So we can just put it at 1.7 because this is what I had originally, 1.7 meters or like 66 inches. And that's my height. So that's why I chose 1.7. Um, wait, let me just go control P player.js. So remember we set the player height to 1.7 meters. So we can just set the height to 1.7. We can just ignore the Z axis here. But then for the Y position, remember that's gonna be the Z in 3JS, the Z axis here. And we also need to flip this as well. So now when I save this, it should start, my camera should start here. And let me just go in here and take a look. And yeah, you can see my camera is starting exactly like here. Now you, your camera might be rotated or whatever. So you can set a default rotation as well. But for me, it's looking good. So I don't have to change anything here. All right, let's control P and go back to player.js. And let's add our event listeners. So this dot add event listeners. And I'm just going to create a new function for that. Let's copy and paste it and let's just put it down here. So I want two, and the first one is going to be when I click down, we're going to lock our cursor with the, you know, the pointer lock API that comes built in with browsers. So we're going to add an event listener to the document. And what we want to do is do pointer down, pointer down. Whoops. Let's make sure I spell that correctly. And I'll add this dot on pointer down. And I don't want that. My auto sense is adding that. So let's create this on pointer down function. And equals 
grab the event object that comes with this event. So if you don't know what pointer events is, you can check out the documentation, but basically they handle both, you know, like touch screens and mouse as well. So it's more common to use pointer events instead of using um, touch events and mouse events separately when you can just handle it in pointer events. And if you want to take a look at what it does, you know, you can always just console log E or event or whatever you want to call it in order to see the stuff that it gives you, or you can look at it in the documentation. So what we want to do is we want to check if the pointer type is a mouse. And we can just, it's a string, so we can just say equals 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 mouse. And if it is, then we want to request pointer lock. So I'm going to do document.body.requestPointerLock, and this is just built in with browsers. And then we can just return early because we're going to have code down here for the mobile version in a little bit. So if I go back into my browser now and I click, you can see I get that, that um, ESC to show your cursor because it's locking my mouse every time I click. So I'm going to add another one. So let me just copy and paste this. Shift Alt Up Arrow. And this one's going to be pointer move. So, you know, in other words, when I move my mouse, I'm going to call it on desktop pointer move. And my AI keeps giving that. And let's just create this one as well. Right here. And we want to check if our, you know, if we have a requested pointer lock, because, you know, once we want to, you know, click something like a UI or something, it would be kind of weird if this was still triggering while we are clicking stuff. Now you might want that depending on, you know, your use case, but for me, I don't want that. So only when their mouse is locked with the pointer lock, do I want it to rotate the camera? So we can do check that as well. So document pointer lock element does not equals equals document body. Then we can just return. Remember the player body is just the camera perspective camera. So technically you could just target this, but I'm just going to use the player dot body for consistency. So this dot player dot body. And remember, that's just the camera. So dot rotation, and then we can set its order. And we're going to set it to this dot player dot rotation dot order. Now, you could, you know, just do YXZ here instead, but you know, I'm just going to keep it here. Now you could set the default as YXZ as well. But sometimes it bugs out and it resets it to the default, which is why we're explicitly setting it before every single move. All right, so let's set the rotation X. So this dot player dot body dot rotation or the camera rotation dot X minus equals E dot movement Y. So the event object, the movement of the Y. And let's do the same thing for the rotation Y. And this is going to be E movement X instead. Let's see what this actually does. And of course, we also can console log this dot player dot body dot rotation, rotation dot X. And let's just copy that and do it for the Y as well. When I'm moving my mouse, nothing has happened. But when I click down, now you can see I'm starting to get that console log. And the reason is because, you know, it's not, if I uncomment this, you can see that even when I move my mouse, it's going to start, um, it's going to start console logging. But if I leave that in, it won't until I click down. So let's take a look at what this actually gives us. If you're familiar, you know, in JavaScript, the axis starts from zero, zero here. So when you go up, when you, I'm moving my mouse up right now, you can see we're getting a negative one here for the Y axis. Uh, the movement of the Y for this here and I move my mouse left you can see I'm getting negative one for the X because I'm going backwards I'm going to zero zero and if I go here it would be like 500 or whatever the width of my screen here and you can see the rotation and uh, and you can see the rotations are just consistently adding or subtracting from each other and that doesn't really matter you can kind of visualize what's happening here imagine we have a web page and we're moving our mouse up and down on the Y. And what that's doing is it's subtracting and adding to our X pitch, right? So that's all that's happening there. 
And similarly for the Y, so, and of course in Blender it's going to be the Z axis. But as I move my mouse from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen, it's going to be, you know, changing the rotation along the Y axis. However, it's going a little bit too fast because it's going to be using radians. So I think one in radian is like 50 some degrees. So every time I move my mouse and it says one or negative one, I'm actually rotating like 50 degrees or something. And that's why it's kind of blazing, blazingly fast like this. So what we can do is divide it by like some arbitrary factor. And this is like your sensitivity. So if you like higher sensitivity, you can like increase this and you can actually give the player the option to control this factor if you want to, but I'm not going to be doing it. I'm just going to leave it at 500. And now you can see it's a lot easier and I can move everywhere. How cool is that? Now there is one issue. If I keep moving my mouse and I lift up my mouse and I keep going, I can keep on doing these circles forever and ever. And that's unnatural for a human unless you, you know, you're doing like flips or something. In the previous video, I, let me get rid of this, used GSAP's clamp, but I didn't know that 3GS actually also has their own built-in clamp. So all we have to do is clamp it. Now for the Y, we don't have to clamp it because, you know, a human can naturally do this. But for this, no, you have to have a special use case for, you know, you flipping or something. So of course you can leave that if you want it. So all we have to do is clamp the rotation. So this dot player dot body dot rotation dot x equals three dot math utils, which is that area that has the clamp function. And what do we want to clamp? Well, we want to clamp this dot player dot body rotation dot x. Well, I should just copy and paste this. We want to clamp it to. And if you remember from middle school, uh, the unit circle. You can see why we're clamping it to negative math pi divided by two, which is here, and pi divided by two, which is up here. So we can only turn our head to look directly up or directly down. And so let me just save and refresh the page. And now you can see when I look up and even when I'm moving my mouse, I'm lifting up my mouse and keep on going, it's clamped there. And I can't look any, you know, I can't look beyond, I can't go in the 360 circles. So here we have our camera movement, and yeah, that's pretty much it for it. Now let's start moving our camera on key down. So we're going to need two event listeners, one for key down and one for key up. So the idea here is when you press down a key, you start moving, but when you lift up the key, it's going to listen to that, and then it's going to trigger a Boolean value to switch, and then you'll stop moving. So I'll do this dot on key down, and this dot on key up. And let's do the same thing. I'm just gonna I'm gonna copy this template here and just paste it. Shift Alt down, Alt double click, copy, Alt double click, Control V, and just do like that. And I like to keep it in the same order that I have here. So I'm actually gonna make move these up here. Before we do these methods though, let's create some control defaults. So I'm gonna change this init to say init player and I'm going to make another one and I'm going to call it init controls instead init controls and I'm just going to paste it down here and we'll add a lot of stuff here later but for now all we need is an object this dot actions equals an object and this is merely for organizational purposes, you know, handle how you want to check for the codes or the inputs, however you want. Let's do the same thing as we did here. Of course, we only want it to move if our document.body is down. So let's put it in here. And we can simply check for the code. So eve.code equals key w, which is the forward key. Then we want to set this.actions dot forward equal to true that means okay we're moving forward and then we want to do the same thing for s a and d so w a s d so key s and then key a and then key d so a of course is going to be left if you're a gamer d is going to be right and s is going to be backward 
Now we also want some other actions like running. So we're going to come here and we are going to call this run, you know, sprint, whatever you want to call it. And I'm going to put that on the shift left key. By the way, if you don't know the codes, you can simply just console log E code and just click on your key to take a look at what the code is. And whoops, all of these should be triple equals. I thought I was typing them, but I guess I wasn't. And we also want a player to jump. So we're going to have another one. And the key for this one is going to be space. So if they hit the space bar, then they are jumping. So I'm going to do this dot actions. And on key up, we want to set all of these to true. I mean, sorry, to false. So let's just do the same thing. And let's put it in here. And let's set all of this to false. So I'm just going to hit control D to select the next instances and then just type false. Each frame, if this Boolean value is true, we're going to be updating something like the player position or the player velocity. And if it's false, we are going to not do anything to that player. So we can actually just test it right now. If I come into my update function, show you if I check if the actions forward is true, then I want to update my camera position by 0.5 on each frame. So let's also go back into world.js and make sure I'm updating my player. So yeah, I need to come in here. If this dot player, then we want this dot player dot update. And remember the experience is calling the world's update. So it's updating on each frame. And so if the player exists, we also want to update the player as well. And you can see when I hit W key, well, the X axis is apparently going in that direction. You can see I'm adding 0.5 to my position. So that's pretty much it for basic controls, but we want those advanced controls that, you know, can detect collisions with our collider mesh that we created earlier. So I'm going to get rid of this and create a new function called player collisions. So I'm just going to come here and I'm going to call it player collisions. Now remember the awk tree does it for us that 3GS came with. So we just need to grab that awk tree that we created in the world. So let me go into world.js. And remember we created this dot awk tree here. And of course it depends on where you put it, but in my landscape here, I am grabbing that awk tree from the world, generating that awk tree from that collider in this landscape here. And that's going to go through here. And then we can just access it through here. So let's just do this dot tree equals this dot experience dot world dot tree. Let's do const result equals this dot tree. And because we're using a capsule, we do capsule intersect. And we provide that capsule that I created. So remember, we called it a player collider. So if I do control F and collider, you can see it's a capsule. So we want to do capsule intersect. And this is just built in. So, you know, the generated awk tree that we created will determine if it's intersecting with our capsule that we created for the player. And since player collisions, you are technically also going to be, you know, colliding with the floor. So we want to reset this on every frame. So this dot player dot on floor, which is that Boolean that we created, and we want to set it to false. And we'll let this result check for us if our player is on the floor or not. So this will return null if we aren't intersecting. So all we can do is just check, okay, if the result has something, if it's not null, then do something. So we can check if the player is on the floor by doing this dot player and setting it on floor equal to result dot normal dot y is greater than zero. And the other thing we need to do is translate the collider, the depth that we would have gone if we didn't detect this collision. So we can just use the built in method, this dot player dot collider dot translate. Whoops, let's make sure I spelled that correctly, translate. And we'll take that that vector, and we're going to multiply it by the depth of the result. So I'm going to do multiply more. So I'm going to do multiply scalar. And we want to get the result that depth. So if you're familiar with vectors, uh, you probably already stand what's happening. Or you can go to octree.js and actually trace the math, like search up capsule intersect. 
and just look at um, you know the formula that they're going through or you you can read this article which actually explains it pretty well but I don't want to make this technical so I just want to give a high level overview though like a really really high level overview if I go into wireframe mode and remember I was moving my camera like 0 0.5 each frame well you can imagine that is the player's velocity so if I'm moving my camera 0 0.5 every time I press down the W key, you know, I'm going to hit something. I'm going to overlap something. And this is called the depth. And you can imagine, you know, the depth vector. The normal vector kind of just points into where you would be, you know, had you not, you know, overlapped with this one. So in this case, it, it doesn't have to be directly opposite, but for this visualization, I'm just going to make it directly opposite of the resulting depth vector. So this is the depth of your intersection. And I'll just call it D for depth. And this is the direction of your vector that you came from pretty much, or where you would be had you not gone inside of the other mesh. So essentially all we're doing is we're just taking this depth, multiplying it by this normal vector, which, you know, just gives us this, right? And we're just translating our collider to go here instead. So, you know, our collider will now be here. And of course, when you move around with the collisions, the vectors are gonna update and the calculations are gonna update too. And that's kind of the same thing here, you know, if we're, right, so if we're intersecting with the ground, you can imagine our normal's gonna be pointing up in the y direction and each vector can be, you know, split up into its x and y vectors. So, you know, it's gonna be positive in the y direction. And of course, if we're jumping, we're not even going to be on the ground. Imagine the ground is here. So it's not even going to evaluate that. And that's from here, right? So it's not even colliding with the floor. So we're not going to be executing anything in here. Now, I should say that's a really high level explanation of it. So, you know, don't take it too seriously. Okay, now we actually want to make our player able to walk around this scene. So I'm going to create a variable that will hold our speed, obviously. And I'm going to set it equal to a ternary operator. And essentially, if we are on the floor, we're going to be going faster than when we're jumping, right? Now, you know, depending on your game mechanics, you might want it to go, you know, faster or the same speed on when you're in air. So it really just depends. So if I'm on the floor, I'm going to set my speed multiplier to 1.75. Otherwise, I'm going to set it to 0 0.2 when I'm in the air. Multiply it by my gravity that we created earlier. And I'm also gonna multiply it by my speed multiplier as well, which we also created earlier back up uh, over here. Then we need to multiply this speed by the time in between each frame. So let's speed delta equals this dot time dot delta times speed. So this will throw an error because we don't have time yet. So let's go back up to the top and import time. So I'm just gonna shift alt up arrow to put it up here. Double click, double control D, and then this dot time here. And then now we can access, if we go to time.js, you can see we can access this delta time here, the time between frames. And this will just keep it consistent on everyone's computer. And we wanna check if this dot actions dot run if it's true then we want to multiply the speed delta by a factor so you know of course it kind of all depends on how fast you want them to run you know if you want them to run twice as fast maybe you want to do two instead and remember actions dot run we put it up here remember shift left so when we're holding shift left it's going to check on each frame and if we're running we're going to speed up when we're running and of course, we also have a bunch of those other actions. So I'm going to shift all down arrow um, quite a few times. I don't know how many actions we actually have. Let's see. Okay, so I'm going to hit alt on my keyboard, double click. Whoops, I'm going to cancel that. I'm going to click here and double click with alt and double click here. Forward, left, right, and jump. And I'm just going to control C that. And now I'm just going to replace them here. So I'm going to hit control D, control D. And I forgot how many I had. Remember, it has to be the same number of cursors as up here. So I'm just going to check one, two, three, four, five. So we should have five cursors here. Yeah, and then we can just hit Control V and I'll just copy over there. 
And then of course, we also want to get rid of this inside thing here. So I'm just going to hit Control D and hit Control X to get rid of that. Okay, so let's target that velocity vector that we created earlier. So right here. So what I'm going to do is this dot player dot velocity. I'm going to add the directional vector, this dot get forward vector, which we haven't created yet, but don't worry, I'll explain all of this later. You can just copy for now. Whoops, get forward vector. But we also need to know, you know, how far we're traveling. And remember, that's the speed delta here. So this is the amount, the amount of distance we travel between each frame. So since we have the direction, we can also just multiply it by the amount of distance. So we can just do multiply scalar and put speed delta here. All right, so let's make a get forward vector and I'm just gonna copy paste that and you can put it you know, wherever you want. I'm just gonna put it here for the time being. I might reorganize it later. So this method is really simple because 3GS actually provides a built-in function called get world direction. So I'm gonna do this dot camera dot perspective camera dot get world direction and we're going to copy that into this dot player dot direction so you know you can look at the documentation for this but i think it's pretty self-explanatory and we're just copying it into the direction vector that we made up here so right here as well now we don't care about the direction in the y so what i'm going to do is set the direction dot y equals zero and we also want to normalize this vector just for convenience purposes so i'm going to do direction dot normalize and this will just give it a vector of one so yeah pretty much we just return the return this dot player dot direction so backward is going to be exactly the same except we're going to go into the opposite direction so we can simply just subtract the speed delta and I also want them to go slower when they're going backwards. You don't have to, but I'm going to multiply it by a factor of 50%. So they go 50% slower when they're going back. If you want to do more math, you can do a get backward vector, or you can do a subtract or whatever. It's just a matter of preference, but I'm just going to keep it like this. It does the same exact thing here as well. All right, now we also want to do the left and right. So I'm just going to copy this here. And instead of getting the forward vector, we want to get the side vector. So I'm going to create another function called get side vector, like here. And I'm just going to put it here as well. So I'm going to call it get side vector. And it's pretty much the same thing, except we need to take the cross product this time. So I'm going to copy and paste this. And this time we're going to do this dot player dot direction and cross for the cross product of this dot camera dot perspective camera dot up. So imagine we're like a sphere and we're moving like this. So this is our world direction vector. We're pointing that way, we're going that way. And this is our up vector. So if we take the cross product of our up vector and our side vector, we're going to get another vector, right? So it's gonna be perpendicular to both of these. So um, it's a little sloppy here, but you know, S, Y, Y, let's see. So we're going to get a side vector. So essentially, this is what we're getting. We're getting a side vector here. So when we move left, you know, we're always going to be moving left and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay, so left should be negative. Yeah, that's great. And I don't want them to go that slow, but maybe something like 7.5. So 25% slower than going forward. And... The same thing again for the right, except we want to keep it positive. All right, now let's let the user jump. So first, if this dot player dot on floor, we want to make sure that the player is actually on the floor. Otherwise, they can permanently jump. So we're just going to put that in there. And if they are, we'll just set this dot player dot velocity dot y equals 15. Before we start translating our player or moving our player, based on the velocity, I want to create a damping factor. And damping just means like easing in or easing out. You know, imagine you're going 100 MPH and then you just suddenly, on the next frame you had zero. That just feels unnatural and bad. 
But if you have a damping factor, let's say, you know, just one here on each frame that you release your forward key, you're going to be su subtracting one and like so. Now, depending on your math function, it's going to feel differently for, you know, how it feels. Right. So instead of let's say this is time here and this is your velocity and, you know, instead of just stopping like this on one frame, let's just say this is frame one, you have like a thousand frames and you eventually slow down over time. And this feels a lot more natural here. So let's create a damping. So I'm going to do damping equals math.exp, which is minus 15 times this dot time dot delta and minus one. Okay, so let's check if the player is not on the floor. So I'm just going to put it down here. And if they're not on the floor, that means they're jumping. So we want to subtract the velocity of their y direction in here. So I'm going to do this dot player dot velocity dot y. And I'm going to subtract it. Whoops, minus equals this dot player dot gravity. So this is the variable that we created up there, which is 60. And of course, we also want to multiply it by the delta time. All right, let's actually start moving our player. So I'm going to do this dot player dot velocity dot add scaled vector, add scaled vector. And I'm going to scale the player velocity by the damping. So I'm going to do this velocity and I'm going to pass in the damping here. Then let's create a delta position. So I'm going to call it delta position equals this dot player dot velocity velocity. And we're going to clone it. And we are going to multiply the scalar by the time delta, this dot time dot delta. Then we can use 3GS's built in translate function. So all we have to do is this dot player dot collider, which is our capsule. And we're going to just going to translate it to our delta position. Now remember, we want to check for our collisions on each frame. So we created that here earlier. So let's do this dot player collisions. And remember, if we are intersecting, we are going to be translating our stuff outside of what we're intersecting. So now we can actually make the camera copy our collider. So I'll do this dot player dot body dot position, position dot copy. And we want to copy the end. So this dot player dot collider dot end. So remember the collider is a capsule right and it takes a start vector and an end vector and we want our camera to be up here because that has our height of 1.6 right or I forgot what I put it I think it was 1.6 meters if we put it at the start you know we're going to be at the feet of our capsule instead and let's also update our camera's world matrix or in other words its world position so 3GS can calculate accurate values so this dot player dot body which is just a camera and we're just going to do update matrix world update matrix and we need to put world here all right let's go to the browser and take a look so it seems to not be working properly now depending on your scene you might not even actually see your meshes and let me show you how to debug that so first thing i want to do is to check the camera position so I'm just going to console.log the camera position, this dot player dot body dot position. My camera position, you can see on each frame we're subtracting from the gravity here because we are not on the floor. Remember, so we are not on the floor right here. So we're subtracting our velocity y on each frame. So my issue here is the y value. It's not really this x or z because Remember, if you go to camera.js, you can see here that we set our default position over here. Now, if your X is at like negative 100, well, remember, you want to, you know, make sure it's at your default position here. So we can temporarily create a spawn player out of bounds function that we will probably change later. But for now, we need it so we can actually see what we're doing. So I'm going to go back into player.js. And since my only issue is this Y value that's always going down, I'm going to check for that. So if this dot player dot body 
dot position dot y is less than I don't know let's just say like negative 20 or something it doesn't really matter we're gonna create we're gonna call a function called spawn player player out of bounds and we can just put it anywhere so I'm just gonna temporarily put it right here and I'll just reorganize it later and in here I'm gonna do const spawn pause spawn pause or spawn position and I'm going to go into camera.js where we set this regular one and I'm just gonna copy these values here I'm gonna set it to a new three vector remember position is just a three vector three and I'm just gonna copy and paste those values here and once we respawn we don't want the player to be moving right so we want this dot player dot velocity equals this dot player dot spawn dot velocity and remember if we go back up here to this dot player dot spawn we created a velocity which is a new vector three so in other words this is just zero 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 so our velocity is completely zero we won't be moving once we spawn then our body we want to copy the spawn position that we created right here of course you can do this dynamically by adjusting the spawn object that we created and we might be doing that later but for now we're just going to copy this single one that we set in camera.js so i'm going to do this dot player dot body which is the camera position dot copy and we're just going to copy the spawn position of course we also need to update our collider as well so this dot player dot collider dot start vector we're going to copy the spawn position and we also want to do that for our end vector but for our end vector we also want to add the player height so i'm going to copy that and we're going to target the y vector and we're going to plus equal that to the player height i think was 1.7 all right, so let's take a look in the browser. So I'm falling kind of slowly, but you can see once I hit negative 20, I'm spawned now onto my island. And take a look, if you click and use WASD, you can actually move around your stuff. How cool is that? And I can hold shift to run a little bit faster, WASD, and everything works as planned. However, take a look when I'm jumping. I'm going extremely slow. So this is an issue with damping. So what we can do is just turn it down once we're jumping. So what I can do here is just do damping and I'll do minus, e uh, sorry, multiply it equals and 0 0.1. And now take a look at that. It feels a lot more natural and we're moving around in our scene. How cool is that? So let's get, so let's get rid of our console.log that we don't need anymore. And, you know, maybe if you want it to, like, jump down, you can also, you know, let's go into spawn player out of position. Maybe you want to add here. So maybe, like, I don't know, like 10 here or something. So we drop from the sky onto the ground, which is pretty cool as well. So, of course, if you want to visualize your collider, you can always go back into wherever you set it up and give the collider a material so you can see it. But I'm just back here in Blender because... You know why not i can just see it here you can see my colliders that i set up for my scene uh, all those square boxes and everything as well and i also added as part of my collider a little easter egg right here you can see a staircase here and it's only part of my collider but there's nothing actually there visible so if i actually want to travel there i can oh, here i am and of course you can't see anything but my collider is still going to be checking there so if i jump I made it on there but it's gonna be a little bit it's gonna be a little bit difficult because it's invisible but it's a nice Easter egg and you can see I just jumped right on top of there and now I'm climbing up and take a look at that I just hopped over my wall that that area outside of here is also part of my collider which is why I can walk over there but yeah essentially what I did is I just jumped over here jumped on here and then walked up here so essentially you know if you have a bunch of cubes as part of your collider like here you know you can already make a jumping game you can jump from here to here here to here and you know make a really cool easter egg so that was just part of my easter egg here 
So let's test if a spawn out of bounds is working. And if I jump off, hit negative 20, and you can see I spawn right back to that plus 10 over there. And we can, you know, move around our collider. Before I end this chapter, I want to talk about the customization with damping. So if you remember when I hit W or ASD or whatever, notice that I don't come to a complete stop. That's thanks to damping, of course. But maybe you don't like this behavior. So of course you can always change the function. But if you want to use mine, you can simply, you know, change this value right here. So here we're subtracting a little bit less on each frame, right? So you can see how much faster I'm going and how much more smooth it is when I'm moving around. It feels a lot smoother. You might not be able to tell, but it is. I'm just tapping W and I'm going a lot more and I come to a much smoother end here. Definitely experiment with stuff, you know, have fun. This is a really fun thing to do. Maybe we want a user to jump 100 units. And now if I test it out and hit spacebar, you can see I'm jumping 100 units. And it's actually really funny um, and really fun. You know, you can change the gravity, you can change Maybe you want to add, you know, double jump so you can check if they hit the key space bar once or something like that. Yeah, so, you know, really awesome stuff. I'm going to change that back back to what I had 15 originally. Yeah, that's the end of chapter seven. Not much else to say except, you know, play around with the settings and you can get my commit right here. Hey, welcome to chapter eight. Now this chapter is unfinished, so it'll end abruptly, but you still can do some cool stuff like converting an HGII with Blender or an online tool to a skybox slash cube map you can use in 3GS. And we'll cover, you know, the early stages of interacting with objects. I'm gonna create a new Blender file. I'm gonna show you the hard method first. You can just watch, you don't have to follow along. But this way, the hard method, as long as Blender exists, you can always convert HDRIs to uh, cube map textures or skybox textures, because as long as Blender still exists. So I'm going to add a cube. I'm in a new Blender file, but you can also do it in your original Blender file as well. So I'm going to add a new cube and I'm going to draw. Actually, I'm going to go into the UV editing tab and I'm going to make this a little bit bigger and drag up a new panel here. Like so, and I'm going to go into the shader editor here and then I'm going to give this cube a new material and I'm going to shift a search for an environment texture. Then I'm going to open to the HDRI that I used in my original Blender file. I have it here. You can see I have my HDRI file right in here, and I'm just going to hook it up right in here. Now to see it, we need to go into rendered mode and make sure you are in cycles and GPU compute if you have a good GPU. And you can see it looks really nice and it's mapped into this cube now. Now the next thing I want to do is split up each of the faces. It's optional, but I think it's easier this way. So I'm going to split up the top. I'm going to go into edit mode, select the top. And yeah, Blender's going to automatically put it here, but it doesn't really matter. And we're going to hit P, separate by selection, separate by selection, separate by selection. And just repeat for the cube. So now we can just bake this onto a, a square plane, right? So let's create an image texture that we can bake to. And I'm just going to make it 4K, 4096. Of course, the smaller, the better. If you can get away with lower resolution, you should definitely go for it. And I'm going to call this mm, front. And I'll do 32 bit float for some more color. Let's open front here. And of course, it's just a cube. And let's go into edit mode for this face and hit A to select everything UV. And let's do pack islands here. So now when we bake, it's going to take up this entire thing here. So let's go into our render properties. Make sure this is also 40K, uh, sorry, 4K, 4096. And then we can just bake it. Now baking here is a little bit different. If you only want to bake the original color without the influence of our environment, you would come up here and go to diffuse. Remember, that's just another word for color. And you'd check off direct and indirect and only bake the color. So if I do that, so let me just do that real quick. You can see it looks a little bit different from what we see on the screen here. And it's a lot more blown out. And actually, this is also a wrong rotation. So I also have to R90 
to rotate at 90 degrees so the landscape is down on the bottom here. Now let me bake with direct and indirect. You can see we get a result like this which is mm, exactly what we see here. Of course you can also do combined which is what we did before. Yeah so if you want to maybe hook up some changes to your HDRI here you could. You could add some lights so I'm going to go back into object mode shift a add some light. Let's just add a sunlight. I'm just going to put it up here. And you can see that when I adjust my sunlight, it's also updating my HDRI. And that looks a little bit better. And if I do combine this time, I think I could leave it as diffuse as well. Actually, let's just try diffuse and rebake it. Now you can see it looks like this. So you can imagine how your sky will look in up there. And now, of course, all you have to do is control shift alt s to save it or image here and save as. And of course, you want to do WebP because it's going to be the smallest. And then you can adjust the quality here as well. Now, you can call it whatever you want. There's actually a naming convention for skyboxes, but I'm just going to call it front WebP. Now, it actually might be the left or the right, but I'm, I'm just going to take a guess and call it front. And if it's actually the right or left, you can just adjust it later, as I'll show you. So I'm just going to save it as my image here. And yeah, all you have to do is just repeat the process for other faces. Just make sure your lighting is exactly the same when you bake for all of them. So, you know, don't accidentally get rid of the lighting and then bake that one. And then once you use it, of course, this one is going to be different from the one that we just saved. So I'm going to undo that. And you just repeat the process. So remember, I'll do one more. Go into edit mode, hit A to select everything, and UV, and whoops, A, UV, and pack islands. And then now with the front image selected, you can just hit bake again. Of course, if you want to be more organized, you can create a new image and call it top. But I'm just going to bake over front. Now, just be careful when you bake over a pre-existing image. If you accidentally hit save, it will overwrite the previous front WebP that we just um, that we just saved. So make sure to do save as, and you can see my front is still going strong there, and call it the top. If you accidentally hit Alt S, it's going to replace that front WebP with your new baked one, which is why you might want to you know actually create new images each time. But I'm just going to be lazy, and I'm just going to bake it. So I just wanted to show you that I already have my web piece. I did the same process over and over here. Now let me show you the super easy way. If you go to convert HDRI to cube map, you can click on this first tool here by Matthew IS. Um, shout out to him. Thanks very much for this awesome tool. And all you have to do is just upload your HDRI that you downloaded from Polyhaven. And he has this tweaker thing here that you can actually adjust your exposure right here which is super helpful. Like you don't have to adjust the lighting in Blender and stuff. So, you know, just look at the sky that you like or the scenery that you like. And then when you're done, hit save. And you can adjust your resolution here. I'm gonna go for 2048 and we want this one. So it's gonna split into each single one. If you're using other engines, you can get away with these like mm, Unity, I think takes this format, but we need this format where each image is separate. Fortunately, he only has PNG, but that's fine. So select this one and hit process. You can open it up when you download the zip file and you can see we have the same exact thing that I was doing in Blender. Now, of course, we want to convert to WebP. So I just want to some random online one called Cloud Convert. Of course, you can also go into Blender and add those as image textures into Blender and then just save as WebP that way as well. You could definitely do that. And you can, if you hover over this, notice how few kilobytes they are. They used to be five megabytes and now they are only kilobytes. And again, that's why we use WebP. So I'm gonna download each of them back in here. Okay, now that we have our skybox, which are all WebPs, you can hover over to see it. Only 853 kilobytes. You can put it wherever you want. I'm going to put it in a textures and I'm going to create a new folder called skybox, name it whatever you want. And I'm just going to drag in my WebP images here. Whoops. So I'm going to box select them and just drag them into here. 
Then I'm going to hit control P and go to assets.js. I'm going to shift all down arrow here. And if you remember, if we go to loaders.js, we already have a cube texture loader right here. And if we go to resources.js, remember, we also already check for the cube texture. And of course, if you don't ever remember the syntax, you can always go to the documentation to take a look right here. And of course, they also have really nice examples that you can take a look at. And here you can see it says texture by hummus. And I guess they have a bunch of free cube maps here for you as well. All right, let's go back into here. Let's go back into assets.js. And let's call this a skybox, but you know, call it whatever you want. And because we're checking for a cube texture, I'm going to call this cube texture. And we want to go into the skybox folder. So we're going to do slash skybox. Our first one's going to be NX. So cube texture loader takes a path, several paths in an array. So we need to create an array here like so. So I'm just going to highlight this and copy it a bunch of times. So let's see five times, one, two, three, four, five, save. And my Predator does the formatting for me. And then I can just change these. So I'm going to do NX and Y and Z PX py and pz so let's go into our server and yes we don't get any errors this is from my extension which means it loaded successfully you can always console.log the items object if you aren't sure where it is you can always you know console.log the you know the loaded stuff but it seems to be working so i can come into white run here go into components and create a new thing called environment.js and let's just copy from something else like walls. Yeah, sure. Let's just copy from walls and let's get rid of set materials. Whoops. Let's get rid of set materials. Let's call this environment. And of course, we need to get this rid of this or we'll get errors. And let's call this um, skybox texture. And I think we just called it skybox. We can always go into assets.js to check. Yeah, we called it skybox. So alt back arrow. Let's just make sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. So let's call it skybox texture. Let's go back into assets and let's put that here. Okay. And then we need to set the encoding. So it's similar. So I'm going to do this dot skybox dot texture and dot encoding encoding set it to three dot S R G B E encoding. Of course, you can play around with encoding to see what you like. Then I'm going to select the scene and set its background equal to the skybox texture. So this.scene.background, and I'm going to set it equal to this.skybox texture. And of course, we need to import it. So I'm going to go into white run. I'm going to hold alt, shift alt down arrow here. I'm going to do walls, and I'll call it environment. And whoops, let's undercase that. And let's copy this here and here alt and paste it there and now it should be working so i'm in the browser now and you can see that well it's not exactly working so and that's because of the order 3gs takes a specific order so i'm going to go back into their documentation to see so px nx py ny pz nz so let's just go into assets.js oops let's do control p assets.js and let's do their order. So I'm going to do PX, PX, NX, PY, PY, and then NY, and then PZ, NZ. So hopefully this works now. And voila, you can see that we have a world here. I temporarily made the jump 100 again, just so we can see. Now it's not the end of the chapter, but we did do a lot of changes with assets. So I'm just going to commit right now. Okay, commit shem updated environment get push dash u origin master now i also just want to talk about one error you might get if you're doing it the blunder way and if you have this error here so only the top image is not fitting with the rest of the sky you can see that sky there is kind of just blending in when it should be over there. That means all you have to do is just rotate the UVs and rebake it and export it. You can see all the other ones are working properly. So I'm going to go back in Blender. I'm going to select that top one that I had here, and then I'm just going to rotate it 180. 
and then I'm going to bake it again. Now you can see that it all works. Now there are lots of other ways to do skies. You know, for example, when we downloaded a bunch of that, a bunch of those GLB files from awards sites, a lot of them had domes like a sphere here and, you know, map the texture to that. Um, of course, if you don't need the bottom, you should also delete that as well. By the way, if you're wondering, this does not add extra lighting to our scene, so we don't have to do all those real-time lighting calculations. This just sets the background. You can easily set this background to a color like white or black. I did use real-time lighting in my previous tutorial, which you could also put here if you wanted real-time lighting, but we're not going to be doing real-time lighting. Now let's actually start interacting with our objects, you know, so we can, you know, change scenes and read more information. So to do that, we're going to be using our Raycaster that we created earlier. If you don't have it, you can create it. Remember, it belongs to our player object here. Of course, organize it however you want. So if you don't know what a Raycaster is, you can definitely read the documentation. It's not a thing exclusive to 3GS, as you can see here. But they have already created a class for us. You know, they've done the math for us. So all we have to do is just use the Raycaster. But essentially, it's just a ray. So, you know, here is your camera and it just shoots a ray from your camera to a point that you want. And if we go into constructor here, we can see the origin of the vector, the direction of the vector, and how close and how far we want it to you know, be. And this is a really common method to interact with meshes. So if I go into over here, like their first example, you can see when I hover over one of these cubes, they turn a, into a red color. And sometimes you can also get away by not even using Raycaster if you can use a 2D um, invisible div instead. So imagine your scene is like static, but you create an HTML div and that you can just hover and click on to trigger animations instead of having to use a, you know, a 3D Raycaster. So that can also be an optimization there as well. All right, so let's go to our update function. And... Actually, I want to change all of this here into its own function, just so our stuff isn't crowded. I'm just going to control X to get rid of that. And I'm going to call this update movement, but you can call it whatever you want. I might even change these later. And I'm just going to call it here, this dot update movement. I also want this dot update raycaster. So this dot update raycaster, which we're going to be creating raycaster. So let's update Raycaster here. So on each frame that we are updating the Raycaster, we need to set the ray's origin. So, you know, where it, where it starts. So we're just going to select this dot player dot Raycaster. And we're going to select the ray of that Raycaster class. And then we're going to select the origin of that. And then we're just going to copy it from our this dot camera, this dot camera dot perspective camera dot position and remember that's a vector three and the origin is also a vector three of course if you need to reference it you can also see it takes vector three for the origin there and we need to know where to point so we need to get where the camera looks at let's set the direction we'll do this dot player dot raycaster dot ray dot direction then we're going to copy a function that we create and i'm going to call it this dot get camera look at directional vector so essentially wherever the camera looks at we want that directional vector now this is pretty long you know up to you how you want to name it create this now a const i'll call it direction and it will be a new three dot vector three vector three and i want zero zero and negative one here i'll explain why negative one in a little bit and then we can just return the direction vector and we want to apply the quaternion or in other words the rotation and we want to get that from the camera so we'll do this dot camera dot perspective camera dot quaternion so let's actually try and make sense of what's happening here so i'm going to go back into blender and just ignore the axis here because it's different in 3gs so you can imagine this is the Z axis in 3GS and this is the X. And then of course the Y goes up and down if you want me to draw that as well. So by default, when you add a camera into 3GS, it's already looking in the negative Z axis direction, right? 
or in other words, you know, negative one, which is what we put there. So, so how does that help us? Well, if you remember when we created a mesh, so something like a cube, and we take a look at the scale, if I scale it up, you can see, okay, well, now it's 1.69 times bigger than what it used to be. So, you know, it's scale makes sense, right? But remember when we applied the scale, it reset it back to one. So this becomes the new scale of that cube and as if it's never changed. So the same thing can be happened when you apply rotation or in this case, a quaternion, which is, which is just another mathematical way to represent rotations. But in other words, you can also say apply rotation here as well. I rotate my camera and I apply my rotation. Well, that means my, my Z axis thing, my negative one in the Z axis is now here. Like that is, you know, it's negative one Z axis because I applied my quaternion. So that is why I use negative one. Now we actually need to tell the Raycaster what objects that we want to intersect with because we don't want it to intersect with all of them, right? That to do that, we need to set intersect objects. And I think you can just um, search for it here. Yeah, and it takes an array of objects. Well, let's go into world.js and pass in those objects that we created. So I'm going to come here and actually let's create a new function here called set interaction objects. And then in here, I'll do this dot player dot interaction objects, interaction objects equals these interaction objects. And then we can just call it in here. So we create the player here, right? So we can just use it here and we'll do this dot player dot set interaction objects. And if you go into white run and components, we set those interactions here. So all we have to do is do this dot white run, which is this, right? Which is this. And then we want this dot interactions. So alt back arrow. So dot interactions. And then we want the actual meshes of those. So we're going to go to items and it's also called interactions. So we're just going to copy and paste that here as well. This dot white run dot interactions dot interactions. Let's console dot log this just to make sure we have it console dot log. This dot player dot interaction objects. So let's go to our browser and take a look. And indeed we do have something here and you can see we have our two meshes, which is all those two red things right here. Of course, if you don't remember what you're doing, you can always check on GLTF report and upload your interaction objects. And you can see here, those are my two meshes here. And of course, you can always go back into Blender and just take a look and you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, this is a separate object. This is a separate object, but I exported them in a same GLB file. Awesome. So we have that. And all we have to do is just set those objects there. All right, so let's check for intersections. I'll do const intersects equals this dot player dot raycaster in that raycaster class. And then we want to do that intersect objects, which checks for our objects. And then we need to pass in those objects. So we'll do this dot player dot intersect objects. And remember when we console to log, log this, it was in the children. So we need dot children. So let's test if this works. I'll just do console.log intersects. And it doesn't work because I have a typo here. It's not interaction objects. It's called intersect objects. So let's go to our browser and take a look. And indeed, it does work. When I point my recaster to one of this mesh, it shows up over here. We can see our intersects. So let's just open one of these and see we get a bunch of information like the distance for it and what actual object it is. And you can see the name that we give it in Blender. So I called it door. And that's the one that I'm pointing at right now. So if we get to one of the later ones, you'll probably see door as well. So let me just open it and object. And you can see it says door, which is now there is one issue you can see when I'm really far away, as as long as I can point to it. So let me try and get a point to it, you can see I'm pointing at it right now. I'm still able to intersect with it. And that's not what we want. We only want it when it's close. So if you remember from, you know, Raycaster, we can determine 
how far it goes with the far here. So the far factor of the raycaster. So all we have to do is go back up to our raycaster and set the far property. Of course, you can dynamically update it as well, but I'm going to keep it consistent. And I'll do this.player.raycaster. And I'll set its far value to 5, and I'll never be changing that. So notice I have no intersections, even though I'm looking directly at it. But once I get within 5 meters, now I'm getting my objects again. Right? Same thing for this one as well. Now, when we interact with objects to say, hey, press E to interact with this object, we don't want to fire that event several, several times each time. So we need to check for that and make sure it only fires once when it changes. So let's do if intersects. So remember, if the intersect length equals 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 zero, it means that we're not intersecting with anything. So we're going to set the this dot current intersect object intersect object equals to just empty string. Otherwise, I'll set it equal to the name of the object. So if you want to console log, you can find it. But I'll do this dot current intersect object equals intersects zero. So we get the first one in the array that it returns here. And we get the object and then we want to get the name of that object we need to update the previous and the current one in each frame so if this dot current previous whoops current intersect object does not equal equal does not equal equal this dot previous intersect object then we'll update the previous intersect object so this dot previous intersect object equals this dot current intersect object now let's just console.log this dot previous intersect object and take a look at our results so you can see i get empty and then i get sign and then i get door sign door sign door 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 sign sign and so on and so forth